Chapter 1 of The Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Evans, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J.D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 1 The Revenge of the Moors. For more than three centuries, the trading nations of Europe were suffered to pursue their commerce or forced to abandon their gains at the bidding of pirates. From the days when Barbarossa defied the whole strength of the Emperor Charles V to the early part of the present century, when prizes were taken by Algerine rovers under the guns, so to say, of all the fleets of Europe, the corsairs were masters of the narrow seas and dictated their own terms to all comers. Nothing but the creation of the large standing navies of the present age crippled them. Nothing less than the conquest of their two convenient coasts could have thoroughly suppressed them. During those three centuries, they levied blackmail upon all who had any trading interest in the Mediterranean. The Venetians, Genoese, Pisans in older days, the English, French, Dutch, Danish, Swedish, and American governments in modern times purchased security by the payment of a regular tribute, or by the periodical presentation of costly gifts. The penalty of resistance was too well known to need exemplification. Thousands of Christian slaves in the Banos at Algiers bore witness to the consequences of an independent policy. So long as the nations of Europe continued to quarrel among themselves, instead of presenting a united line of battle to the enemy, such humiliations had to be endured. So long as a corsair raid upon Spain suited the policy of France, so long as the Dutch, in their jealousy of other states, could declare that Algiers was necessary to them, there was no chance of the plague subsiding. And it was not till the close of the great Napoleonic Wars that the powers agreed, at the Congress of Aix la Chapelle in 1818, to act together and do away with the scourge of Christendom. And even then little was accomplished till France combined territorial aggrandizement with the role of a civilizing influence. There had been pirates in the Mediterranean long before the Turks took up the trade. Indeed, ever since boats were built, their capabilities for plunder must have been realized. The filibustering expedition of Jason and the loot of the Golden Fleece is an early instance, and the Greeks at all times have distinguished themselves by acting up to Jason's example by sea and land. The Moslems, however, were some time in accustoming themselves to the perils of the deep. At first they marveled greatly at those that go down to the sea in ships and have their business in great waters. But they did not hasten to follow them. In the early days of the conquest of Egypt, the Caliph Omar wrote to his general and asked him what the sea was like, to which Amr made answer, The sea is a huge beast which silly folk ride like worms on logs. Whereupon, much distressed, the prudent Caliph gave orders that no Moslem should voyage on so unruly an element without his leave. But it soon became clear that if the Moslems were to hold their own with their neighbors, still more if they meant to hold their neighbors' own, they must learn how to navigate, and accordingly in the first century of the Hijra, we find the Caliph Abdel el Melek instructing his lieutenant in Africa to use Tunis as an arsenal and dockyard, and there to collect a fleet. From that time forward, the Mohammedan rulers of the Barbary coast were never long without ships of some sort. The Aglabi princes sailed forth from Tunis and took Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. The Fatimi caliphs waged war with the navies of Abder er Rahman, the great caliph of Cordova, at a strength of two hundred vessels aside. The Al Mohades possessed a large and capacious fleet, in which they transported their armies to Spain, and their successors in North Africa, though less powerful, were generally able to keep up a number of vessels for offensive as well as commercial purposes. During the later Middle Ages, the relations between the rulers of the Barbary coast, the kings of Tunis, Tlemcen, Fez, etc., and the trading nations of Christendom were amicable and just. Treaties show that both parties agreed in denouncing, and, so far as they could, suppressing piracy and encouraging mutual commerce. It was not till the beginning of the 16th century that a change came over these peaceful conditions, and the way it happened was this. When the united wisdom of Ferdinand and Isabella resolved on the expatriation of the Spanish Moors, they forgot the risk of an exile's vengeance. 
No sooner was Granada fallen than thousands of desperate Moors left the land for which 700 years had been their home, and, disdaining to live under a Spanish yoke, crossed the strait to Africa, where they established themselves at various strong points, such as Shershel, Oran, and notably at Algiers, which till then had hardly been heard of. No sooner were the banished Moors fairly settled in their new seats than they did what anybody in their place would have done. They carried the war into their oppressor's country. To meet the Spaniards in the open field was impossible in their reduced numbers, but at sea their fleetness and knowledge of the coasts gave them the opportunity of reprisal for which they longed. Science, tradition, and observation inform us that primitive man had certain affinities to the beast of prey. By superior strength or ingenuity, he slew or snared the means of subsistence. Civilized man leaves the coarsest form of slaughter to a professional class and, if he kills at all, elevates his pastime to the rank of sport by the refining element of skill and the excitement of uncertainty and personal risk. But civilized man is still only too prone to prey upon his fellows, though hardly in the brutal manner of his ancestors. He preys upon inferior intelligence, upon weakness of character, upon the greed, and upon the gambling instinct of mankind. In the grandest scale, he is called a financier, in the meanest, a pickpocket. This predatory spirit is at once so ancient and so general that the reader, who is, of course, wholly innocent of such reprehensible tendencies, must nevertheless make an effort to understand the delights of robbery considered as a fine art. Some cynics there are who will tell us that the only reason we are not all thieves is because we have not pluck enough, and there must certainly be some fascination apart from natural depravity or original sin, to make a man prefer to run countless risks in an unlawful pursuit sooner than do an honest day's work. And in this sentence we have the answer. It is precisely the risk, the uncertainty, the danger, the sense of superior skill and ingenuity that attract the adventurous spirit, the passion for sport, which is implanted in the vast majority of mankind. Our Moorish robbers had all this and more to attract them. Brave and daring men, they had shown themselves often before in their tussles with the Spaniards, or in their wild sea courses and herrings of Christian shores, in Sardinia, perhaps, or Provence. But now they pursued a quest alluring beyond any that had gone before, a righteous vengeance upon those who had banished them from house and home, and cast them adrift to find what new anchorage they might in the world. A holy war against the slaughterers of their kith and kin, and the blasphemers of their sacred faith. What joy more fierce and jubilant than to run the light brigantine down the beach of Algiers and man her for a cruise in Spanish waters? The little ship will hold but ten oars aside, each pulled by a man who knows how to fight as well as to row, as indeed he must, for there is no room for mere landsmen on board a, a Ferkta. But if there be a fair wind off the land, there will be little rowing. The big latine sail on her one mast will span the narrow waters between the African coast and the Balearic Isles, where a convenient lookout may be kept for Spanish galleons, or perhaps an Italian palaca. Drawing little water, a small squadron of brigantines could be pushed up almost any creek, or lie hidden behind a rock, till the enemy hove in sight. Then oars out, and a quick stroke for a few minutes, and they are alongside their unsuspecting prey, and pouring in their first volley. Then a scramble on board, a hand-to-hand -hand scuffle, a last desperate resistance on the poop, under the captain's canopy, and the prize is taken, the prisoners ironed, a jury crew sent on board, and all return in triumph to Algiers, where they are received with acclamations. Or it might be a descent on the shores of their own beloved Andalusia. Then the little vessels are run into the crevices between the rocks, or even buried in the sand, and the pirates steal inland to one of the villages they know so well, and the loss of which they will never cease to mourn. They have still friends of many in Spain who are willing enough to help them against the oppressor and to hide them when surprised. The sleeping Spaniards are roused and then grimly silenced by the points of swords. Their wives and daughters are borne away on the shoulders of the invaders. Everything valuable is cleared, and the rovers are soon sailing merrily into the roads at Algiers, laden with spoil and captives, and often with some of the persecuted remnant of their race, who thankfully rejoin their kinsmen in the new country. To wreak such vengeance on the Spaniard added a real zest to life. With all their skill and speed, their knowledge of the coasts, and the help of their compatriots ashore, there was still the risk of capture. 
Sometimes their brigantines caught a tartar when they expected an easy victim, and then the Moors found the tables turned and had to grace their captors' triumph, and for years, perhaps forever, to sit on the banks of a Venetian or a Genoese galley, heavily chained, pulling the infidel's oar even in the chase of the true believers, and gazing to satiety upon the wheels which the lash kept raw on the bare back of the man in front. But the risk added a zest to the corsair's life, and the captive could often look forward to the hope of recapture, or sometimes of ransom by his friends. The career of the pirate, with all its chances, was a prosperous one. The adventurers grew rich, and their strong places on the Barbary coast became populous and well garrisoned, and by the time the Spaniards began to awake to the danger of letting such troublesome neighbors alone, the evil was past a cure. For twenty years the exiled Moors had enjoyed immunity, while the big Spanish galleys were obstinately held in port, contemptuous of so small a foe. At last, Don Pedro Navarro was dispatched by Cardinal Ximenez to bring the pirates to book. He had little difficulty in taking possession of Oran and Buyea, and Algiers was so imperfectly fortified that he imposed his own terms. He made the Algerians vow to renounce piracy, and, to see that they kept their word, he built and garrisoned a strong fort, the Peñon de Alger, to stop their boats from sallying forth. But the Moors had still more than one strong post on the rocky promontories of Barbary, and, having tasted the delights of chasing Spaniards, they were not likely to reform, especially as the choice lay between piracy and starvation. Dig they would not, and they preferred to beg by force, like the gentlemen of the road. So they bided their time till Ferdinand the Catholic passed away to his account, and then, in defiance of the Pignon, and reckless of all the pains and penalties of Spanish retribution, they threw up their allegiance and looked about for allies. Help was not far off, though. In this case, it meant mastery. The day of the Moorish pirates was over. Henceforth, they might, and did, triumphantly assault and batter Spanish and Venetian ships, but they would do this under the captaincy of the allies they had called in, under the leadership of the Turkish corsairs. The Moors had shown the way, and the corsairs needed little bidding to follow it. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 2 The Land of the Corsairs. It is time to ask how it was that a spacious land seemed to lie vacant for the corsairs to occupy, and a land, too, that offered almost every feature that a pirate could desire for the safe and successful prosecution of his trade. Geographers tell us that in climate and formation the island of Barbary, for such it is geologically, is really part of Europe, towards which, in history, it has played so unfriendly a part. Once the countries which we now know as Tunis, Algiers, and Morocco stood up abruptly as an island, with a comparatively small lake washing its northern shore and a huge ocean on the south. That ocean is now the Sahara or Sahara, which engineers dream of again flooding with salt water and so forming an inland African sea. The lake is now the Mediterranean, or rather its western basin, for we know that the Barbary island was once nearly a peninsula, joined at its two ends to Spain and Sicily, and that its atlas ranges formed the connection between the Sierra Nevada and Mount Atna. By degrees the isthmus between Cambona and Sicily sank out of sight, and the ocean flowed between Spain and Africa, while the great sea to the south dried up into the immense, stony waste, which is known preeminently as the Sahara the desert, a track of land bare as the back of a beast without trees or mountains. Through one or both of these narrow straits, Gibraltar or Malta, all vessels from the outer ocean bound for the ports of France and Italy and the Levant were obliged to pass, and it must be remembered that just about the time when the corsairs made their appearance in Barbary, the riches of the new-found western world were beginning to pour through the straits to meet those of the east, 
which were brought to France and Spain, England and Holland, from Alexandria and Smyrna. An immense proportion of the trade of Europe had to cross the western basin of the Mediterranean, of which Barbary formed the southern boundary. Any bold man who could hold Tunis at the eastern corner, or Algiers in the middle, or Coita or Tangiers at the western point, might reckon upon numerous opportunities of stopping argosies of untold wealth as they passed by his lair. The situation seemed purposely contrived for corsairs. More than this, the coast was just what a pirate wants. The map shows a series of natural harbors, often backed by lagoons which offer every facility for the escape of the rower from his pursuers. And while in the sixteenth century there were no deep ports for vessels of heavy draught, there were endless creeks, shallow harbors, and lagoons, where the corsairs' galleys, which never drew more than six feet of water, could take refuge. Behind Jerba, the fabled island of the lotus eaters, was an immense inland sea commanded in the Middle Ages by castles and affording a refuge for which the rowers had often had cause to be grateful. Merchant vessels were shy of sailing in the dangerous gulf of the greater Syrtis, with its heavy tides and spreading sandbanks, and even the war galleys of Venice and Spain were at a disadvantage when manoeuvring in its treacherous eddies against the corsair, who knew every inch of the coast. Passing westward, a famous medieval fortress, with the remains of a harbour, is seen at Mahdiya, the Africa of the chroniclers. Next, Tunis presents the finest harbour on all the Barbary coast, with its goleta, or throat. A vessel is safe from all the winds that blow, and if a canal were cut to join it with the inland lake of Bizerta, a deep harbour would be formed big enough to hold all the shipping of the Mediterranean. The ancient ports of Carthage and Porto Farina offered more protection in the Corsair's time than now, when the sand has choked the coast, and in the autumn months a vessel needed all the shelter she could get when the Cyprian wind was blowing off Cape Bona. Close to the present Algerine frontier is Tabarca, which the Lamellini family of Genoa found a thriving situation for their trading establishments. La Calle, once a famous nest of pirates, had then a fine harbour, as the merchants of Marcellus discovered when they superintended the coral fisheries from the neighbouring Bastion de France. Bona, just beyond, has its roads, and formerly possessed a deep harbour. Gigil, an impregnable post, held successively by Phoenicians, Normans, Romans, Pisans, and Genoese, till Barbarossa got possession of it and made it a fortress of refuge for his corsairs, stands on a rocky peninsula, joined by a sandy isthmus to the mainland, with a port well sheltered by a natural breakwater. Further on were Bujoya, Bugi, its harbour well protected from the worst winds. Algiers, not then a port, but soon to become one. Cherchel, with a harbour to be shunned in a heavy swell from the north, but otherwise a valuable nook for sea rowers. Tinis, not always accessible but safe when you were inside. And Oran, with the important harbour of Marcel Kebir, the portus divinus of the Romans. While beyond, the Jamiel el Khazavot, or Pirate's Mosque, shows where a favourite creek offered an asylum between the brothers' rocks for distressed corsairs. Passing Tangiers and Coita, Septa, and turning beyond the straits, various shelters are found, among, amongst others the celebrated ports of Salais, which in spite of its bar of sand, managed to send out many mischievous craft to harass the Argosies on their return from the New World. Not only were there ports in abundance for the shelter of galleys, but the land behind was all that could be desired. River, indeed, there was none capable of navigation, but the very shortness of the watershed, which precluded the possibility of great streams, brought with it a counterbalancing advantage. For the mountains rise so steep and high near the coast, that the Carcer's lookout could sight the vessels to be attacked a long way out to sea, and thus give notice of a prize or warning of an enemy. 
Moreover, the land produced all that was needed to content the heart of man. Below the mountains where the Berbers dwelt, and the steppes where Arab shepherds roamed, fertile valleys spread to the seashore. Jerba was a perfect garden of corn and fruit, vines, olives, almonds, apricots, and figs. Tunis stood in the midst of green fields, and deserved the title of the white, the odoriferous, the flowery bride of the West. Though indeed the second epithet, according to its inhabitants, was derived from the odor of the lake, which received the drainage of the city, to which they ascribed its peculiar salubrity. What more could be required in a land which was, now to become a nest of pirates? Yet as though this were not sufficient, one more virtue was added. The coast was visited by terrible gales, which, while avoidable by those who had experience and knew where to run, were fatal to the unwary, and foiled many an attack of an avenging enemy. It remains to explain how it was that the corsairs were able to possess themselves of this convenient territory, which was neither devoid of inhabitants, nor without settled governments. North Africa, the only Africa known to the ancients, had seen many rulers come and go since the Arabs under Okba first overran its plains and valleys. Dynasty had succeeded dynasty. The Arab governors under the caliphs of Damascus and Baghdad had made room for the houses of Idris, A.D. 788, and Aglad, 800. These in turn had given way to the Fatimi caliphs, 909, and when these schismatics removed their seat of power, from their newly founded capital of Mahdiya to their final metropolis of Cairo, 968, their western empire speedily split up into the several princedoms of the Zairis of Tunis, the Beni Hamad of Timilisan, and other minor governments. At the close of the 11th century, the Murabids or Almoravides, a Berber dynasty, imposed their authority over the greater part of North Africa and Spain, but gave place in the middle of the twelfth to the Muwahids or Almohades, whose rule extended from the Atlantic to Tunis, and endured for over a hundred years. On the ruins of their vast empire, three separate and long-lived dynasties sprang up, the Beni Hafs in Tunis, 1228-1534, the Beni Ziyan in central Maghrib, 1235-1400, to and the Beni Merin in Morocco, 1200-1550. to To complete the chronology, it may be added that these were succeeded in the 16th century by the Corsair Pashas, afterwards Deis, of Algiers, the Turkish Pashas, or Beis, of Tunis, and the Sharifs, or Emperors, of Morocco. The last still continue to reign, but the Deis of Algiers have given place to the French, and the Bay of Tunis is under French tutelage. Except during the temporary excitement of a change of dynasty, the rule of these African princes was generally mild and enlightened. They came, for the most part, of the indigenous Berber population, and were not naturally disposed to intolerance or unneighborliness. The Christians kept their churches and were suffered to worship unmolested. We read of a bishop of Fez as late as the 13th century, and the kings of Morocco and Tunis were usually on friendly terms with the Pope. Christians were largely enrolled in the African armies and were even appointed to civil employments. The relations of the rulers of Barbary with the European states throughout the greater part of this period, from the 11th century, when the fighting Fatimis left Tunis and went eastward to Egypt, to the 16th, when the fighting Turks came westward to molest the peace of Mediterranean, were eminently wise and statesmanlike. The Africans wanted many of the industries of Europe. Europe required the skins and raw products of Africa, and a series of treaties involving a principle of reciprocity was the result. No doubt the naval inferiority of the African states to the trading republics of the Mediterranean was a potent factor in bringing about this satisfactory arrangement, but it is only right to admit the remarkable fairness 
moderation, and probity of the African princes in the settlement and maintenance of these treaties. As a general rule, Sicily and the commercial republics were allied to the rulers of Tunis and Tilimsan and Fez by bonds of amity and mutual advantage. One after the other, Pisa, Genoa, Provence, Aragon, and Venice concluded commercial treaties with the African sovereigns and renewed them from time to time. Some of these states had special quarters reserved from them at Tunis, Coita, and other towns, and all had their consuls in the 13th century, who were protected in a manner that the English agent at Algiers would have envied 70 years ago. The African trade was especially valuable to the Pisans and Genoese, and there was a regular African company trading at the ports of Tripoli, Tunis, Bugea, Coita, and Saleh. Indeed, the Genoese went so far as to defend Coita against Christian crusaders, so much did commerce avail against religion. And on the other hand, the Christian residents at Tunis, the western metropolis of Islam, had their own place of worship, where they were free to pray undisturbed as late as 1530. This tolerance was largely due to the mild and judicious government of the Beni Hafs, whose three-century sway at Tunis was an unmixed benefit to their subjects, and to all who had relations with them. Not that the years passed by without war and retaliation, or that treaties made piracy impossible. In the early and more pugnacious days of the Saracen domination, conflicts were frequent. The Fatimi Caliphs conquered and held all the larger islands of the western Mediterranean, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, and the Balearic Isles. In 1002, the Saracens pillaged Pisa, and the Pisans retaliated by burning an African fleet. Three years later, El Mujahid, Majat, the lord of Majorca, and conqueror of Sardinia, burned part of Pisa, and another incursion is recorded in 1011. From his stronghold at Luni in Etruria, this terrible scourge ravaged the country round until the Pope drove him out of the Italy, and the Pisans and others turned him out of Sardinia, 1017. We read of African fleets cruising with hostile intent of the Calabrian coast, and of the Pisans taking Bona, which was then a nest of corsairs, 1034. Mahdia was burnt in 1087, and Sicily conquered by the Normans about the same time, 1072. But these were in the early days, and even then were as exceptions. In succeeding centuries, under more settled governments, War became very rare, and mutual amity was the prevailing policy. Piracy was always distinctly prohibited in the commercial treaties of the African states. Nevertheless, piracy went on, and most pertinaciously on the part of the Christians. The Greeks, Sardinians, Maltese, and Genoese were by far the worst members of the fraternity of rovers, as the treaties themselves prove. The increase of commerce under the stimulus of the Crusades tempted the adventurers, and the absence of the organized state navies gave them immunity. And there was generally a war afoot between some nation or other, Christian or Muslim, and piracy, in the then state of international law, at once became legitimate privateering. Our buccaneers of the Spanish main had the same apology to offer. But it is important to observe that all this was private piracy. The African and the Italian governments distinctly repudiated the practice and bowed themselves to execute any corsair of their own country whom they might arrest and to deliver all his goods over to the state which he had robbed. These early corsairs were private freebooters, totally distinct from the authorized pirates of later days. In 1200, in time of peace, two Pisan vessels attacked three Mohammedan ships in Tunis roads, captured the crews, outraged the women, and made off, vainly pursued by the Tunisian fleet. But they received no countenance from Pisa, the merchants of which might have suffered severely had the Tunisians exacted reprisals. Sicily was full of corsairs, and the king of Tunis paid a sort of tribute to the Normans, partly to induce them 
to restrain these excesses. Aragonese and Genoese preyed upon each other and upon the Moslems, but their doings were entirely private and unsupported by the state. Up to the 14th century, the Christians were the chief pirates of the Mediterranean, and dealt largely in stolen goods and slaves. Then, the growth of large commercial fleets discouraged the profession, and very soon we begin to hear much less of European brigandage, and much more of Moorish corsairs. The inhabitants of the coast about the Gulf of Gaibis had always shown a bent towards piracy, and the port of Mahdiya, or Africa, now became a regular resort of sea rovers. El Bekri, in the 12th century, had noticed the practice of sending galleys on the cruise for prey, perhaps during war, from the harbours of Bona, and Ibn Khaldun, in the 14th, describes an organized company of pirates at Bujeya, who made a handsome profit from goods and the ransom of captives. The evil grew with the increase of the Turkish power in the Levant, and received a violent impetus upon the fall of Constantinople, while on the west, the gradual expulsion of the Moors from Spain, which followed upon the Christian advance, filled Africa with disaffected, ruined, and vengeful Moriscos, whose one dominant passion was to wipe out their old scores with the Spaniards. Against such influences, the mild governors of North Africa were powerless. They had so long enjoyed peace and friendship with the Mediterranean states that they were in no condition to enforce order with a strong hand. Their armies and fleets were insignificant, and their coasts were long to protect, and abounded with almost impregnable strongholds, which they could not afford to garrison. Hence, when the Moors flocked over from Spain, the shores of Africa offered them a sure and accessible refuge, and the hospitable character of the Moslem's religion forbade all thought of repelling the refugees. Still more, when the armed galliots of the Levant came crowding to Barbary, fired with the hope of rich gain, the ports were open, and the creeks afforded them shelter. A foothold once gained, the rest was easy. It was to this land, lying ready to his use, that Captain Urui Barbarossa came in the beginning of the 16th century. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole Chapter 3 – Urui Barbarossa, 1504-1515 the island of Lesbos has given many gifts to the world, lesbian wine and lesbian verse, the seven-stringed lyre and the poems of Sappho, but of all its products the latest was assuredly the most questionable, for the last great lesbians were the brothers Barbarossa. When Sultan Mohammed II conquered the island in 1462, he left there a certain Sipahi soldier named Yakub, so say the Turkish analysts, but the Spanish writers claim him as a native Christian, who became the father of Urui Barbarossa and his brother Kair ed Din. Various stories are told of their early career and the causes which led to their taking to the sea, but as Lesbos had long been famous for its buccaneers, whether indigenous or importations from Catalonia and Aragon, there was nothing unusual in the brothers adopting a profession, which was alike congenial to both hearts, and sanctioned by time-honored precedent. Urui the elder soon became the reis, or captain, of a galliot, and finding his operations hampered in the archipelago by the predominance of the sultan's fleet, he determined to seek a wider and less interrupted field for his depredations. Rumors had reached the Levant, of the successes of the Moorish pirates. Prodigious tales were abroad as to great argosies, laden with the treasures of the New World, passing and repassing the narrow seas between Europe and Africa, and seeming to invite capture, 
and it was not long, 1504, before Captain Urui found himself cruising with two galleots off the Barbary coast, and spying out the land in search of a good harbour and safe refuge from pursuit. The port of Tunis offered all that a corsair could wish. The Galoeta in those days was but slightly fortified, and the principal building, besides the castle, was the custom house, where the wealth of many nations was taxed by the sultan of the House of Halfs. The very sight of such an institution was stimulating to a pirate. Urui paid his court to the king of Tunis, and speedily came to an understanding with him on the subject of royalties on stolen goods. The ports of Tunis were made free to the corsair, and the king would protect him from pursuit, for the consideration of a fixed share, a fifth of the booty. The policy of the enlightened rulers of Tunis evidently no longer suited their latest representative. The base of operations thus secured, Urui did not keep his new ally long waiting for a proof of his prowess. One day he lay off the island of Elba, when two galleys royal, belonging to His Holiness Pope Julius II, richly laden with goods from Ginoa, and bound for Civita Vecchia, ho in sight. They were rowing in an easy, leisurely manner, little dreaming of Turkish corsairs, for none such had ever been seen in those waters, nor anything bigger than a Moorish brigantine, of which the papal marines were prepared to give a good account. So the two galleys paddled on, some ten leagues asunder, and Uru Reis marked his prey down. It was no light adventure for a galliot of eighteen banks of oars, to board a royal galley of perhaps twice her size, and with no one could tell how many armed men inside her. The Turkish crew remonstrated at such foolhardiness, and begged their captain to look for a foe of their own size. But for reply, Urui only cast most of the oars overboard, and thus made escape impossible. Then he lay to and awaited the foremost galley. She came on, proudly, unconscious of danger. Suddenly her lookout spied Turkish turbans, a strange sight on the Italian coast, and in a panic of confusion her company beat to arms. The vessels were now alongside, and a smart volley of shot and bolts completed the consternation of the Christians. Urui and his men were quickly on the poop, and his holiness servants were soon safe under hatches. Never before had a galley royal struck her colors to a mere galliot, but worse was to follow. Urui declared he must and would have her consort. In vain his officers showed him how temerarious was the venture, and how much more prudent it would be to make off with one rich prize than to court capture by over-greediness. The corsair's will was of iron, and his crew, inflated with triumph, caught his audacious spirit. They closed themselves in the dresses of the Christian prisoners, and manned the subdued galley as though they were her own seamen. On came the consort, utterly ignorant of what had happened, till a shower of arrows and small shot aroused her, just in time to be carried by assault, before her men had collected their senses. Urui brought his prizes into the goleta. Never was such a sight seen there before. The wonder and astonishment, says Hido, that this noble exploit caused in Tunis, and even in Christendom, is not to be expressed, nor how celebrated the name of Urui Reis was become from that very moment, he being held and accounted by all the world as the most valiant and enterprising commander, and by reason his beard was extremely red or carroty, from thenceforwards he was generally called Barbarossa, which in Italian signifies red beard. The capture of the papal galleys gave Urui what he wanted, rowers. He kept his Turks for fighting, and made the Christian prisoners work the oars. Such was the custom of every corsair down to the present century, and the Christian navies were similarly propelled by Mohammedan slaves. The practice must have lent a strange excitement to the battle, for then assuredly a man's foes were of his own household. 
a Venetian admiral knew well that his two or three hundred galley slaves were panting to break their irons and join the enemy, and the Turkish corsair had also his unwilling subjects, who would take the first chance to mutiny in favor of the Christian adversary. Thus it often happened that a victory was secured by the strong arms of the enemy's chained partisans, who would have given half their lives to promote a defeat. But the sharp lash of the boatswain, who walked the bridge between the banks of rowers, was a present and acute argument, which few bags could withstand. Urui had made his first coup, and he did not hesitate to follow it up. Next year he captured a Spanish ship with five hundred soldiers on board, who were all so seasick, or spent with pumping out the leaky vessel, that they fell an easy prey to his galliots. Before five years were out, what was cruising and building with the timber of his many prizes, he had eight good vessels at his back, with two of his brothers to help. The port of Tunis now hardly sufficed his wants, so he established himself temporarily on the fertile island of Jerba, and from its ample anchorage his ships issued forth to harry the coast of Italy. To be king of Jerba was all too small a title for his ambition. He aimed at sovereignty on a large scale, and corsair as he was by nature, he wished for settled power almost as much as he delighted in adventure. In 1512 the opportunity he sought arrived. Three years before, the Mohammedan king of Bujaya had been driven out of his city by the Spaniards, and the exiled potentate appealed to the corsair to come and restore him, coupling the petition with promises of the free use of Bujaya port, whence the command of the Spanish sea was easily to be held. Urui was pleased with the prospect, and as he had now twelve galliots with cannon, and one thousand Turkish men-at-arms, to say nothing of the renegades and moors, he felt strong enough for the attempt. The renown of his exploits had spread far and wide, and there was no lack of a following from all parts of the Levant, when it was known that Urui Reis was on the warpath. His extraordinary energy and impetuosity called forth a corresponding zeal in his men, and like other dashing commanders he was very popular. Well supported and provided with such a siege train as the times permitted, he landed before Bujaya in August 1512, and found the dethroned king expecting him at the head of three thousand mountain Berbers. The Spanish garrison was collected in the strong bastion which the Count Don Pedro Navarro had fortified when he took the city, and for eight days the fortress withstood the battering of the corsair's ordnance. Just when a breach began to be opened, Urui was disabled. A shot took his left arm away above the elbow. In the absence of their leader's heroic example, the Turks felt little confidence in their superiority to Spanish steel. They preferred carrying the wounded captain to the surgeons at Tunis. Bujaya for the moment escaped, but the corsairs enjoyed some little consolation in the capture of a rich Genoese galliot, which they met on its voyage to the Lomellini Smart at Tabarca. With this spoil, Urui returned to recover from his wound, while his brother, Keir ed Din, kept guard over the castle of the Goleta, and began to bring the galleots and prizes through the canal into the lake of Tunis, where they would be safe from pursuit. He was too late, however. The Senate of Genoa was highly incensed at the loss of the galliot, and Andrea Doria, soon to be known as the greatest Christian admiral of his time, was dispatched with twelve galleys to exact reparation. He landed before the Goleta, and drove Keir ed before him into Tunis. The fortress was sacked, and half Barbarossa's ships were brought in triumph to Genoa. Thus ended the first meeting between Doria and Keir ed The next was less happy for the noble Genoese. Keir ed well aware of his brother's fierce humor, did not dare to face him after this humiliation, but left him to fume impotently in his sick room, while he stole away to Jerba, there to work night and day at shipbuilding. 
Urui joined him in the following spring. The king of Tunis had probably had enough of him, and they soon had the means of wiping out their disgrace. The attempt was at first a failure. A second assault of the ominous forts of Bujea, 1514, was on the point of success when reinforcements arrived from Spain. The Berber allies evinced more interest in getting in their crops after the rain than in forcing the bastion, and Barbarossa compelled to raise the siege in a frantic rage, tearing his red beard like a madman, set fire to his ships that they might not fall into the hands of the Spaniards. He would not show himself now in Tunis or Jerba. Some new spot must shelter him after this fresh reverse. On his way to and from Bujea, he had noticed the very place for his purpose, a spot easy to defend, perched on inaccessible rocks, yet furnished with a good harbor, where the losses of recent years might be repaired. This was Gijil, some sixty miles to the east of Bujoya, whose sturdy inhabitants owed allegiance to no sultan, but were proud to welcome so renowned, although now so unfortunate, a warrior as Barbarossa. So at Gijil Urui dwelt, and cultivated the goodwill of the people with spoils of corn and goods from his cruisers, till those indomitable African mountaineers, who had never owed a superior, choose him by acclamation their king. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 4 The Taking of Algiers, 1516 to 1518. The new sultan of Jijil was now called to a much more serious enterprise than heading his Trusulant Highlanders against a neighboring tribe, though it must be admitted that he was always in his element when fisticuffs were in request. An appeal had come from Algiers. The Moors there had endured for seven years the embargo of the Spaniards. They had seen their fregatas rotting before their eyes and never dared to mend them. They had viewed many a rich prize sail by, and never so much as ventured a mile out to sea to look her over, for there were keen eyes and straight shots in the pignon which commanded the bay, and King Ferdinand the Catholic held a firm hand over the tribute which his banished subjects had to pay him for his condescension in ruining them. Their occupation was gone, they had not dragged a prize ashore for years, they must rebel or starve. At this juncture Ferdinand opportunely died, 1516, and the Algerine Moors seized their chance. They stopped this tribute, and claimed in the aid of Salim, a neighboring Arab sheikh, whose clansmen would make the city safe on the land side. But what are they to do with the two hundred petulant and vexatious Spaniards in the fort, who incessantly pepper the town with their cannon, and make the houses too hot to hold them, especially when they are hungry. Little would the gallant Arab cavalry, with their fine Libyan mares and horses, rich coats of mail, tough targets, well-tempered sabres, and long supple lances, avail them against the Spanish volleys. And who so proper to redress this grievance as the invincible Barbarossa, who was master of a naval force, and wanted not artillery? Had he not been twice to reinstate the unfortunate king of Bujea, and lost a limb in his service? Without the least deliberation, Prince Salim dispatched a solemn embassy to Jijil, entreating Barbarossa, in whom he and his people reposed their entire confidence, to hasten to their assistance. No message whatever could have been more welcome to the ambitious Barbarossa than one of this nature. His new acquired realm brought him in but a very scanty revenue, nor was he absolute. He had been wretchedly baffled at Bujea, but hoped for better success at Algiers, which likewise is a place of much greater consequence, 
and much more convenient for his purpose, which, as has been said, was to erect a great monarchy of his own in Barbary. With some six thousand men and sixteen galliots, Urui set forth by sea and land to the rescue of Algiers. First he surprised Cherchel, a strong position fifteen leagues to the west of Algiers, which had been occupied by Moors from Granada, and was now commanded by a bold Turkish corsair, Kara Hassan, who, emulating his old comrade's success with the people of Chigil, had induced the Cherchel rowers to accept him as their leader. Urui had no liking for two kings of Brentford, and took off Black Hassan's head as a friendly precaution, before exposing himself to the perils of another contest with the Spaniards. Soon he was at Algiers, hospitably lodged and entertained, he and all his men, Turks and Jijilis alike, by Sheikh Salim and the people of the town. There, at the distance of a crossbow shot, stood the fortress he had come to reduce, and thither he sent a message offering a safe conduct to the garrison if they would surrender. The Spanish captain made reply that neither threats nor proffered courtesies availed aught with men of his kidney, and told him to remember Bujea, upon which Urui, more to please his unsuspicious hosts than with much prospect of success, battered the pignon for twenty days with his light field pieces, without making any sensible breach in the defences. Meanwhile, the Arabs and Moors, who had called him to their aid, were becoming aware of their mistake. Instead of getting rid of their old enemy the Spaniard, they had imported a second, worse than the first, and Urui soon showed them who was to be the master. He and his Turks treated the ancient Moorish families, who had welcomed them within their gates, with an insolence that was hard to be borne by descendants of the Aben carriages and other noble houses of Granada. Salim, the Arab sheikh, was the first to feel the despot's power. He was murdered in his bath, it was said by the corsair himself. In their alarm, the Algerines secretly made common cause with the soldiers of the Peñon, and a general rising was planned. But one day, at Friday prayers, Barbarossa let the crowded congregation know that their designs were not unsuspected. Shutting the gates, the Turks bound their entertainers with the turbans off their heads, and the immediate decapitation of the ringleaders at the mosque door quelled the spirit of revolt. Nor was a great armada sent by Cardinal Ximenes, and commanded by Don Diego de Vera, more successful than the Algerine rebellion. Seven thousand Spaniards were utterly routed by the Turks and Arabs, and to complete the discomfiture, of the Christians, a violent tempest drove their ships ashore, insomuch that this mighty expedition was all but annihilate. An adventurer who, with a motley following of untrained bandits and nomads, could overthrow a Spanish army was a phenomenon which the Christian states now began to eye with considerable anxiety. From the possessor of a strong place or two on the coast, he had become nothing less than the Sultan of Middle Barbary, Maghrib el Afsat. When the Prince of Tinis raised the whole country's side against him, and a mighty host was rolling down upon Algiers, Urui marched out with one thousand Turks and five hundred Moors, and never a cannon amongst them, and smote the enemy hip and thigh, and pursued them into their own city. The Prince of Tinis took to the mountains, and Urui Barbarossa reigned in his stead. 1517. Then Tilimson fell into his possession, and save that the Spaniards held Oran and two or three fortresses, such as the Peñon de Alger and Bujea, his dominions coincided with modern Algeria, and marched with the kingdoms of Tunis and Fez. He was in a position to form alliances with Fez and Morocco. His galliots were punctilious, moreover, in returning the call of Don Diego de Vera, and many an expectant merchant in Genoa or Naples or Venice strained his eyes in vain for the Argosy that, thanks to the corsair's vigilance, would never again sail proudly into the harbour. 
When all this came to the ears of the new king of Spain, afterwards the Emperor Charles V, he yielded to the prayer of the Marquise de Commerce, governor of Oran, and dispatched ten thousand veterans to make an end of the corsairs once and forever. Urui Barbarossa was then stationed at Tilimsan with only 1,500 men, and when the hosts of the enemy drew near, he made a bolt by night for Algiers, taking his Turks and his treasure with him. The news soon reached the enemy's scouts, and the Marquise gave hot pursuit. A river with steep banks lay in the fugitive's path. Could they pass it, they would have the chances in their favor. Urui scattered his jewels and gold behind him, vainly hoping to delay the greedy Spaniards. But Comares trampled over everything, and came up with the Turkish rear, when but half their force had crossed the river. Their leader was already safe on the other side, but the cries of his rear guard brought him back. The corsair was not the man to desert his followers, and without an instant's hesitation he recrossed the fatal stream and threw himself into the fray. Hardly a Turk or a Moor escaped from that bloody field. Facing round, they fought till they dropped, and among them the vigorous figure of Barbarossa was ever to be seen, laying about him with his one arm like a lion to the last. Urui Barbarossa, according to the testimony of those who remember him, was, when he died, about forty-four years of age. He was not very tall of stature, but extremely well set and robust. His hair and beard were perfectly red, his eyes quick, sparkling and lively, his nose aquiline or Roman, and his complexion between brown and fair. He was a man excessively bold, resolute, daring, magnanimous, enterprising, profusely liberal, and in no wise bloodthirsty, except in the heat of battle nor rigorously cruel but when disobeyed he was highly beloved feared and respected by his soldiers and domestics and when dead was by them all in general most bitterly regretted and lamented he left neither son nor daughter he resided in barbary fourteen years during which the harms he did to the christians are inexpressible End of chapter four Chapter 5 of The Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J.D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 5 Cair et Dean Barbarossa, 1518 to 1530. Urui Barbarossa, the gallant, impulsive, reckless, lovable soldier of fortune, was dead, and it seemed as if all the power he had built up by his indomitable energy must inevitably vanish with its founder. The Marquise de Commerce and the Spanish army held the fate of Algiers in their hands, one steady march, and surely the Corsairs must be swept out of Africa. But with what would seem incredible folly, if it had not been often repeated, the troops were shipped back to Spain, the Marquis returned to his post at Oran, and the opportunity was lost for three hundred years. The Algerines drew breath again, and their leader began to prepare fresh schemes of conquest. The mantle of Orui had fallen upon worthy shoulders. The elder brother possessed, indeed, matchless qualities for deeds of daring doe, to lead a storming party, board a galleon, cut and thrust, and have a two, he had no equal. But Cair ed Dean, with like courage and determination, was gifted with prudent and statesmanlike intelligence, which led him to greater enterprises, though not to more daring exploits. He measured the risk by the end, and never exposed himself needlessly to the hazard of defeat. But when he saw his way clear, none struck harder or more effectual blows. His first proceeding was typical of his sagacious mind. He sent an ambassador to Constantinople to lay his homage at the feet of the Grand Signor, 
and to beg his majesty's favor and protection for the new province of algiers which was now by his humble servant added to the ottoman empire the reply was gracious selim had just conquered egypt and algiers formed an important western extension of his african dominion the sage corsair was immediately appointed beglerbeg or governor-general of algiers fifteen nineteen and invested with the insignia of office the horse and scimitar and horsetail banner not only this but the sultan sent a guard of two thousand janissaries to his viceroy's aid and offered special inducements to such of his subjects as would pass westward to algiers and help to strengthen the corsair's authority the begler bag lost no time in repairing the damage of the spaniards he reinforced his garrisons along the coast at Meliana, Shershel, Tinis, and Mustakhanim, and struck up alliances with the great Arab tribes of the interior. An armada of some fifty men of war and transports, including eight galleys royal, under the command of Admiral Don Hugo de Moncada, in vain landed an army of veterans on the Algerine strand. They were driven back in confusion, and one of those storms, for which the coast bears so evil a name, finished the work of turkish steel 1519 one after the other the ports and strongholds of middle barbary fell into the corsair's hands col bona constantine owned the sway of keir et din barbarossa who was now free to resume his favorite occupation of scouring the seas in search of christian quarry once or twice in every year he would lead out his own eighteen stout galleons and called to his side other daring spirits, whom the renown of his name had drawn from the Levant, each with his own swift cruiser manned by stout arms, and the pick of Turkish desperadoes. There you might see him surrounded by captains, who were soon to be famous wherever ships were to be seized or coasts harried, by Dragut, Salih Reis, Sinan, the Jew of Smyrna, who was suspected of black arts because he could take a declination with the crossbow, and that redoubtable rower Aydin Reis, whom the Spaniards dubbed Caccia Diablo, or Drab Devil, though he had better been named Drab Spaniard. The season of cruising began in May, and lasted till the autumn storms warned vessels to keep the harbors, or at least to attempt no distant expeditions. During the summer month, the Algerine galliots infested every part of the western Mediterranean, levied contributions of slaves and treasure upon the Balearic Isles and the coasts of Spain, and even passed beyond the straits to Waylay, the Argosies which were returning to Cadiz, laden with the gold and jewels of the Indies. Nothing was safe from their attacks, not a vessel ran the gauntlet of the Barbary coast in her passage from Spain to Italy, without many a heart quaking within her the scourge of christendom had begun which was to keep all the nations of europe in perpetual alarm for three centuries the algerine corsairs were masters of the sea and they made their mastery felt by all who dared to cross their path and not merchantmen only but galleys royal of his catholic majesty learned to dread the creak of the turkish rowlock one day in 1529, Keir el-Din dispatched his trusty lieutenant Drabdevel with fourteen galliots to make a descent upon Majorca and the neighboring islands. No job could be more suited to the corsair's taste, and Salih Reis, who was with him, fully shared his enjoyment of the task. The pair began in the usual way by taking several prizes on the high seas, dropping down upon the islands and the Spanish coasts, and carrying off abundance of Christians to serve at the oar, or to purchase their liberty with those pieces of eight which never came amiss to the rowers' pockets. Tidings reaching them of a party of Moriscos, who were eager to make their escape from their Spanish masters, and were ready to pay handsomely for a passage to Barbary. Drabdevil and his comrades, landed by night near Oliva, embarked two hundred families and much treasure, and lay to under the island of Formentara. Unfortunately, General Portundo, with eight Spanish galleys, was just then 
on his way back from Genoa, whither he had conveyed Charles V to be crowned emperor by the Pope at Bologna, and being straightway informed of the piratical exploit which had taken place, bore away for the Balearic Isles in hot pursuit. Drabdevil hastily landed his Morisco friends to be the better prepared to fight or run, for the sight of eight big galleys was more than he had bargained for. But to his surprise the enemy came on, well within gunshot, without firing a single round. Portundo was anxious not to sink the Turks, for fear of drowning the fugitive Moriscos, whom he supposed to be on board, and for whose recapture he was to have ten thousand ducats. But the cursors imputed his conduct to cowardice, and suddenly changing their part from attacked to attackers, they swooped like eagles upon the galleys, and after a brisk hand-to-hand -hand combat, in which Portundo was slain, there carried seven of them by assault, and sent the other flying at topmost speed to Ivica. This bold stroke brought to Algiers, besides the Moriscos, who had watched the battle anxiously from the island, many valuable captives of rank, and released hundreds of Moslem galley slaves from irons and the lash. Drabdevil had a splendid reception, we may be sure, when the people of Algiers saw seven royal galleys, including the Capitana, or flagship of Spain, moored in the roads, and it is no wonder that with such triumph the new Barbary state flourished exceedingly. Fortified by a series of unbroken successes, Keir ed Din at last ventured to attack the Spanish garrison, which had all this time affronted him at the Peñon de Alger. It was provoking to be obliged to beach his galleots a mile to the west, and to drag them painfully up the strand, and the merchantmen, moored east of the city, were exposed to the weather to such a degree as to imperil their commerce. Keir ed Din resolved to have a port of his own at Algiers, with no Spanish bridle to curb him. He summoned Don Martin de Vargas to surrender, and, on his refusal, bombarded the Pignon day and night for fifteen days with heavy cannon, partly founded in Algiers, partly seized from a French galleon, till an assault was practicable, when the feeble remnant of the garrison was quickly overpowered and sent to the Bagnews. The stones of the fortress were used to build the great mole which protects Algiers harbour on the west, and for two whole years the Christian slaves were laboriously employed upon the work. To aggravate this disaster, a curious sight was seen a fortnight after the fall of the Peñon. Nine transports, full of men and ammunition, for the reinforcement of the garrison hove in sight, and long they searched to and fro for the well-known fortress they had come to succor. And whilst they marvelled that they could not discover it, out dashed the corsairs in their galliots and light shabaks, and seized the whole convoy, together with two thousand seven hundred captives, and a fine store of arms and provisions. Everything that Keir ed Din took in hand seemed to prosper. His fleet increased month by month, till he had thirty-six of his own galliots perpetually on the cruise in the summer season. His prizes were innumerable, and his forces were increased by the fighting men of the seventy thousand Moriscos whom he rescued, in a series of voyages from servitude in Spain. The vast places of Africa were peopled with the industrious agriculturists and artisans whom the Spanish government knew not how to employ. The foundries and dockyards of Algiers teemed with busy workmen. Seven thousand Christian slaves labored at the defensive works in the harbor, and every attempt of the emperor to rescue them and destroy the pirates was repelled with disastrous loss. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 6 The Ottoman Navy from 1470 to 1522. 
No one appreciated better the triumphs of the Beglerberg of Algiers than the Sultan Suleiman. The Ottomans, as yet inexperienced in naval affairs, were eager to take lessons. The Turkish navy had been of slow growth, chiefly because in early days there were always people ready to act as sailors for pay. When Murad I wished to cross from Asia to Europe to meet the invading army of the Vladislaus and Hunedi, the Genoese skippers were happy to carry over his men for a ducat ahead, just to spite their immemorial foes, the Venetians, who were enlisted on the other side. It was not till the fall of Constantinople gave the Turks the command of the Bosphorus that Mohammed II resolved to create for himself a naval power. That fatal jealousy between the Christian states, which so often aided the progress of the Turks, helped them now. The great commercial republics, Genoa and Venice, had long been struggling for supremacy on the sea. Venice held many important posts along the islands of the archipelago and on the Syrian coast, where the Crusaders had rewarded her naval assistance with the gift of the Fortress of Acre. Genoa was stronger in the Black Sea and Marmara, where, until the coming of the Turks, her colony at Galatia was little less than an oriental Genoa. The Genoese Tower is still seen atop the steep slope of Pera, and Genoese forts are common objects in the Bosphorus and in the Crimea, where they dominate the little harbor of Balaclava. The Sea of Marmara was the scene of many a deadly contest between the rival fleets. In 1352, under the walls of Constantinople, the Genoese defeated the combined squadrons of the Venetians, the Caletonians, and the Greeks. But the next year, the Bride of the Sea humbled the prize of Genoa in a disastrous engagement off El Garo. And, in 1380, when the Genoese had laid possession of Chioja and all but occupied Venice itself, the citizens rose like one man to meet the desperate emergency, and not only repulsed, but surrounded the invaders and forced them to capitulate. From this time, Genoa declined in power, while Venice waxed stronger and more haughty. The conquest of Constantinople by the Turks followed rapidly by the expulsion of the Genoese from the Trebizond, Sinope, Caffa, and Azov, was the end of the commercial prosperity of the Ligurian Republic in the east. The Black Sea and Marmara were now Turkish lakes. The castles of the Dardanelles, mounted with heavy guns, protected any Ottoman fleet from pursuit. And though Giacomo Venero defiantly carried his own ship under fire through the strait and back again with only the loss of eleven men, no one cared to follow his example. When Mohammed II issued forth with a fleet of 100 galleys and 200 transports carrying 70,000 troops and ravished the Negro Point away from Venice in 1470, he had only to repass the Hellespont to be absolutely safe. All that the Venetian admirals, the famous Loredani, could do was to retaliate upon such islands of the archipelago as were under Turkish sway and ravage the coasts of Asia Minor. Superior as they were to the Turks in the building and management of galleys, they had not the military resources of their foe. Their troops were mercenaries, not to be compared with the Janissaries and the Sipathis, though the hardy Stratiotes from Epirus, dressed like Turks, but without the turban, of whom Othello is a familiar specimen, came near to rivaling them. On land, the Republic could not meet the troops of the Grand Signor, and after her very existence had been menaced by the near approach of a Turkish army on the banks of the Pieve in 1477, Venice made peace, and even, it is said, incited the Turks to the capture of Otranto. The Ottoman galleys were now free of the Adriatic, and carried fire and sword along the Italian coast, insomuch that whenever the crescent was seen at a vessel's peak, the terrified villagers fled inland and left their homes at the mercy of the pirates. The period of the Turkish corsairs had already begun. There was another naval power to be reckoned with besides discredited Genoa and tributary Venice. The Knights Hospitallers of Jerusalem, driven from Smyrna in 1403 by Timur, had settled at Rhodes, which they hastened to render impregnable. Apparently they succeeded, for attack after attack from the Malamuk sultans of Egypt failed to shake them from their stronghold, whence they commanded the line of commerce between Alexandria and Constantinople, and did a brisk trade in piracy upon passing vessels. The Knights of Rhodes were the Christian corsairs of the Levant, the forests of Caramania furnished them with ships, and the populations of Asia Minor supplied them with slaves. So long as they roved the seas, the sultan's galleys were ill at ease. Even Christian ships suffered from their high-handed proceedings, and Venice looked on with open satisfaction when, in 1480, Mohammed II dispatched 160 ships and a large army to humble the pride of the knights. The siege failed, however. Diabuson, the Grand Master, repulsed the general assault with furious heroism, and the Turks retired with heavy loss. Finding that the Ottomans were not quite invincible, Venice plucked up heart, and began to prepare for hostilities with her temporary ally. The interval of friendliness had been turned to good accounts by the Turks. Yanni, the Christian shipbuilder of the Sultan, had studied the improvements of the Venetians, and he now constructed two immense caucus, 
70 cubits long and 30 in the beam, with masts of several trees spliced together, measuring 4 cubits round. 40 men in armor might stand in the main top and fire down upon the enemy. There were many decks, one like a galleon's deck, and the other like a galley, each with a big gun on either side. Four and twenty oars aside on the upper deck were propelled each by nine men. Boats hung from the stern, and the ship's complement consisted, so says Hajj Khalifa, of two thousand soldiers and sailors. Kemal Reyes and Borak Reyes commanded these two prodigies, and the whole fleet, numbering some three hundred other vessels, was dispatched to the Adriatic under the command of the Daud Pasha. The object of attack was Lepanto. Toward the end of July, 1499, they sighted the Venetian fleet, which was on the lookout for them off Modon. They counted 44 galleys, 16 galleasses, and 28 ordinary sail, neither courted in action, which each knew to be fraught with momentous consequences. Grimani, the Venetian admiral, retired to Navarino. The Turks anchored off Sapienza. On August the 12th, Daud Pasha, who knew the sultan was awaiting him with the land forces at Lepanto, resolved to push on at all costs. In those days, Turkish navigators had little confidence in the open sea. They preferred to hug the shore, where they might run into port in case of bad weather. Dowd, accordingly, endeavored to pass between the island of Prodano and the Morea, just north of the Navarino. Perfectly aware of his course, the Venetians had drawn out their fleet at the upper end of the narrow passage, where they had the best possible chance of catching the enemy in confused order. The Provveditore of Corfu, Andrea Loredano, had reinforced the Christian fleet that very day with ten ships, the position was well chosen, the wind was fair, and drove full down upon the Turks as they emerged from the strait, but the Venetian admiral placed his chief reliance in the galleasses. As yet the art of maneuvering sailing vessels in battle array was in its youth, bad steering here, a wrong tack there, and then ship ran against ship. The great galleasses became entangled and helpless, carried by the wind over the midst of the enemy, or borne away where they were useless, and the Turkish galleys had it all their own way. Loredano's flagship burnt down to the water, and other vessels were destroyed by fire. Yanni's big ships played an important part in the action. Two galleasses, each containing a thousand men, and two other vessels surrounded Borak Reis, but the smaller ships could not fire over the Koka's lofty sides, and were speedily sunk. Borak Reis threw burning pitch into the galleasses and burnt up crews and ships, till his own vessel catching fire, he and other notable captains, after performing prodigies of valor, perished in the flames. Wherefore, the island of Prodrano is still called by the Turks, Borak Isle, to this day. To the Christians, the action was known as the Deplorable Battle of Zonchio, from the name of the old castle of Navarino, beneath which it was fought. In spite of his success at Zonchino, Daud Pasha still had to fight his way up to Lepanto. The Venetians had collected their scattered fleet, and had been reinforced by their allies of France in Rhodes. It was clear they were bent on revenge. The Turks hugged the land, dropped anchor at night, and kept a sharp lookout. It was a perpetual skirmish all the way. The Venetians tried to surprise the enemy at their moorings, but they were already at sea, and squally weather upset Grimani's strategy, and he had the mortification of seeing his six fire ships burning innocuously with never a Turk the worse. Again and again it seemed impossible that Daud could escape, but Grimani's Fabian policy delivered the enemy out of his hands, and when finally the Turkish fleet sailed triumphantly into the Gulf of Patras, where it was protected by the Sultan's artillery at Lepanto, the Grand Prior of Auvergne, who commanded the French squadron, sailed away in disgust at the pusillanimity of his colleague. Lepanto fell, August 28th, and Grimani was imprisoned, nominally for life for his blundering. Nevertheless, after 21 years, he was made dogue. Venice never recovered from her defeat. The loss of Lepanto and the consequent closing of the gulfs of Patras and Corinth were followed by the capture of Modon, commanding the Strait of Sapienza, the east coast of the Adriatic and Ionian seas were no longer open to Christian vessels. The oriental trade of the Republic was further seriously impaired by the Turkish conquest of Egypt in 1517, which deprived her of her most important mart, and the discovery of the New World brought Spanish traders into successful competition with her own. Venice, indeed, was practically an oriental city. Her skilled workmen learned their arts in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Her bazaars were filled with products of the East, with the dimity and other cloths and silks and brocades of Damietta, Alexandria, Tinnis, and Cairo, cotton from Baalbek, silk from Baghdad, atlas satin from Madin in Armenia, and she introduced to Europe not only the products of the East, but their very names. Sarsanet is Sacrean stuff, Tabby is named after a street in Baghdad where watered silk was made, Baldacini are simply Baldac, i.e. Baghdad canopies, Samite is Shami, Syrian fabric, and the very coat of the Egyptian, the Juba, is preserved in Jupa, Jupe. 
With the loss of her oriental commerce, which the hostility of the Turks involved, Venice could no longer hold her own. She bowed to her fate and acknowledged the Turkish supremacy by sea as well as by land. She even paid the sultan tribute for the island of Cyprus. When Suleiman the Magnificent succeeded Selim and took Belgrade in 1521, Venice hastily increased her payment and did homage for Zante as well. So meek now had become the bride of the sea. Turkey still suffered the annoyance of the Rhodian corsairs. Until they were removed, her naval supremacy was not complete. Genoa and Venice had been humbled. The turn of the Knights of St. John was come. Selim had left his son, the great Suleiman, the legacy of a splendid fleet, prepared for this very enterprise. One hundred and three swift galleys, thirty-five galleasses, besides smaller craft, and a hundred and seven transports, knaves, fusts, mahones, taforis, galleons, and equessers, formed a noble navy, and Rhodes fell, after a heroic defense at the close of 1522. For six months the knights held out, against a fleet which had swollen to 400 sail and an army of over a 100,000 men, commanded by the sultan in person. It was a crisis in the history of Europe. The outpost of Christendom was at bay. The knights surrounded the city with his works, and made regular approaches for his advancing batteries and mines. Yet at the end of a month not a wall was down, and the eight bastions of the eight tongues of the order, the English, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, German, Provençal, and Auvergnat, were so far unmoved. Gabriel Martinigo of Candia superintended the countermines with marked success. At last the English bastion was blown up, the Turks swarmed the breach, and were beaten back with a loss of 2,000 men. A second assault failed, but on September 24th they succeeded in getting a foothold, and the destruction of the Spanish, Italian, and Provençal bastions by the Turkish mines, and the consequent exposure of the exhausted garrison, rendered her defense more and more perilous. The Ottoman army, too, was suffering severely from disease, as well as from the deadly weapons of the knights, and in hope of sparing his men, Suleiman offered the garrison life and liberty if they would surrender the city. At first they proudly rejected his offer, but, within a fortnight, finding their ammunition exhausted and their numbers sadly thinned, on December 21st they begged the sultan to repeat his conditions, and, with an honorable clemency, Suleiman let them all depart unmolested in his own ships to such ports in Europe as seemed best to them. The fall of Rhodes removed the last obstacle to the complete domination of the Ottoman fleet in the eastern basin of the Mediterranean. Henceforward, no Christian ship was safe in those waters unless by the pleasure of the Sultan. The old maritime republics were for the time reduced to impotence, and no power existed to challenge the Ottoman supremacy in the Aegean, Ionian, and Adriatic seas. Almost at the same time, the brothers Barbarossa had effected a similar triumph in the west. The capture of Algiers and the firm establishment of various strong garrisons on the Barbary coast had given the Turkish corsairs the command of the western basin of the Mediterranean. Suleiman the Magnificent saw the necessity of combination. He knew that Kair ed Din could teach the Stambul navigators and shipbuilders much that they ought to learn. His grand vizier, Ibrahim, strenuously argued a closer relation between the Turkish powers of the east and west, and Kair ed Din received the imperial command to present himself at Constantinople. End of chapter 6《Chapter 7 of The Story of the Barbary Corsairs》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole Chapter 7 — Doria and Barbarossa 1533 Kerr ed Din was in no hurry to visit the Sublime Port. He had to provide for the safety and government of Algiers during his absence. When exposed to the dangers both of foreign attack and internal intrigue, he had to reckon with the galleys of the Knights of St. John, who after wandering homeless for a longer time than was at all creditable to that Christendom to which they so heroically defended at Rhodes, had finally settled in no less convenient a spot than Malta. Whence, they had every opportunity of harassing the operations of the Corsairs. Moreover, Andrea Doria was cruising about, and he was not the sort of opponent Barbarossa cared to meet by hazard. The great Genoese admiral considered it a personal duel with Kerr ed Din, each held the supreme position on his own side of the water. Both were old men and had grown old in arms. Born in 1468 of a noble Genoese family, Doria was 65 years of age, of which nearly 50 had been spent in warfare. He had been in the Pope's guard, and had seen service under the Duke of Urbino and Alfonso of Naples. And when he was over forty, he had taken to the sea and found himself suddenly High Admiral of Genoa. His appointment to the command of his country's galleys was due to his zealous service on shore, 
and not to any special experience of naval affairs. Indeed, the commander of the galleys was as much a military as a naval officer. Doria, however, late as he adopted his profession, possessed undoubted gifts as a seaman, and his leadership decided which of the rival Christian powers should rule the Mediterranean waves. He devoted his sword to France in 1522, when a revolution overthrew his party and his own republic, and so long as he was on the French side of the command of the sea, so far it did not belong to the Barbary Corsairs, belonged to France. When in 1528 he judged himself and his country ill-used by Francis I, he carried over his own twelve galleys to the side of Charles V, and then the imperial navies once more triumphed. Doria was the arbiter of fortune between the contending states. Doria was the liberator of Genoa, and, refusing to be her king, remained her idol and her despot. No name struck such terror into the hearts of the Turks. Many a ship had fallen a prey to his devouring galleys, and many a Muslim slave pulled at his oars or languished in Genoese prisons. Officially an admiral, he was at the same time personally a corsair, and used his private galleys to increase his wealth. Kair Din's fame among Christians and Turks alike was at least as great and glorious as his rivals. He had driven the Spaniards out of Algiers and had inflicted incalculable injuries upon the ships and shores of the empire. Though the two had roved the same sea for twenty years, they had never met in naval combat. Perhaps each had respected the other too much to risk an encounter. Long ago, when Kair Din was unknown to fame, Doria had driven him from the Goleta in 1513, and in 1531 the Genoese admiral made a descent upon Cherchelle, which Kair Din had been strengthening, to the great detriment and anxiety of the opposite coast of Spain. The imperialists landed in force, surprised by the fort, and liberated 700 Christian slaves. Then, contrary to the orders and heedless of the signal gun which summoned them on board, the soldiery dispersed about the town in search of pillage, and, being taken at a disadvantage by the Turks and Moriscos of the place, were driven in confusion down to the beach, only to perceive Doria's galleys rapidly pulling away. 900 were slaughtered on the seashore and 600 made prisoners. Some say that the admiral intended to punish his men for their disobedience. Others said that he sighted Kair Din's fleet coming to the rescue. At all events, he drew off, and the two great rivals did not meet. The Genoese picked up some Barbary vessels on his way home to console him for his failure. In the following year, he retrieved his fame by a brilliant expedition to the coasts of Greece, where 35 sail and 48 galleys he attacked at Coron, by the way of making a diversion while Sultan Suleiman was invading Hungary and, after a heavy bombardment, succeeded in landing his men on the curtain of the fort. The Turkish garrison was spared and marched out, and Mendoza was left in command, while Doria bore up to Patras and took it, occupied the castles which guard the Gulf of Corinth, and returned in triumph to Genoa before the Turkish fleet could come up with him. This was in September, 1532. In the following spring, a yet more daring feat was accomplished. Caron was running short of supplies, and a Turkish fleet blockaded the port, Nevertheless, Cristofero Pallavicini carried his ship in, under cover of the castle guns, and encouraged the garrison to hold out, and Doria, following in splendid style, fought his way in, notwithstanding that half his fleet, being sailing galleons, became becalmed in the midst of the Turkish galleys, and had to be rescued in the teeth of the enemy. Lufti Pasha was outmaneuvered and defeated. This revictualing of Caron, says Admiral Hurian de la Gravere, was one of the skillfulest naval operations of the 16th century. It was clear that, while Doria had effected almost nothing against the Barbary Corsairs, he always mastered the Turks. The Sultan was eager to discover Kair Din's secret of success, and counted the days till he should arrive in the Golden Horn. The Corsair, for his part, had heard enough of Doria's recent exploits to use more than his habitual caution, and he was not disposed to cheapen his value in the Sultan's eyes by a too precipitate compliance with His Majesty's command. At last, in August 1533, Having appointed Hassan Aga, a Sardinian Inuk, in whom he greatly confided, to be viceroy during his absence, Kair Din set sail from Algiers with a few galleys, and after doing a little business on his own account, looting Elba and picking up some Genoese corn ships, pursued his way, passing Malta at a respectful distance, and coasting the Morea, till he dropped anchor in the Bay of Salonica. By his route, which touched Santa Mara and Navarino, he appears to have been looking for Doria, in spite of the smallness of his own force, which had, however, been increased by prizes, but, fortunately, perhaps, for the Corsair, the Genoese admiral had returned to Sicily, and the two had missed each other on the way. Soon the eyes of the Sultan were rejoiced with the sight of a Barbary fleet, gaily dressed with flags and pennants, rounding Surigalo Point, and, in perfect order, entering the deep water of the Golden Horn, and, presently, Kair Din and his eighteen captains were bowing before the Grand Seigneur, and reaping the rewards due to their fame and services. 
It was a strange sight that day at Eski Sarai, and the divan was crowded. The tried generals and statesmen of the greatest of Ottoman emperors assembled to gaze upon the rough sea dogs whose exploits were on the lips of all of Europe, and most of all they scrutinized the vigorous, well-knit, yet burly figure of the old man with the bushy eyebrows and thick beard, once a bright auburn, but now hoary with years and exposure to the freaks of fortune and rough weather. In his full and searching eye that could blaze with ready and unappeasable fury, comparable even to those which their victorious sultan had won before strong walls and on the battle plain, the Grand Vizier Ibrahim recognized Kair ad-Din as the man he needed, and the Algerine Corsair was preferred before all the admirals of Turkey, and appointed to construct the Ottoman navy. He spent the winters in the dockyards where his quick eye instantly detected the faults of the builders. The Turks of Constantinople, he found, knew neither how to build nor how to work their galleys, Theirs were not so swift as the Christians, and instead of turning sailors themselves and navigating them properly, they used to kidnap shepherds from Arcadia and Adenolia, who had never handled a sail nor a tiller in their lives and entrust the navigation of their galleys to these inexperienced hands. Kair Din soon changed all this. Fortunately, there were workmen and timber in abundance, and, inspiring his men with his own marvelous energy, he laid out 61 galleys during the winter and was able to take the sea with a fleet of 84 vessels in the spring. This period of Turkish supremacy on the sea dates from Kair Din's winter in the dockyards. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole Chapter 8 Tunis Taken and Lost The dwellers on the coast of Italy soon discovered the new spirit in the Turkish fleet. They had now to dread corsairs on both hands, east as well as west. In the summer of 1534, Kair Din led his new fleet of 84 galleys forth from the Golden Horn to flush their appetite on a grand quest of prey. Entering the Straits of Messina, he surprised Reggio and carried off ships and slaves, stormed and burnt the castle of St. Lucidia the next day, and took 800 prisoners, seized 18 galleys at Citraro, put Sperlonga at the sword and brand, and loaded his ships with wives and maidens. A stealthy inland march brought the corsairs to Fondi, where lay Giulia Gonzaga, the young and beautiful widow of Vespio Colonna, Duchess of Tregetto and Countess of Fondi. She was sister to the heavenly Joanna of Aragon, on whose loveliness 280 Italian poets and rhymesters in vain exhausted their resources of several languages, a loveliness shared by the sister whose device was the flower of love. Amaranth blazoned on her shield, this beauty cared din destined for the sultan's harem, and so secret were the corsair's movements that he almost surprised the fair Julia in her bed. She had barely time to mount a horse in her shift and fly with a single attendant, whom she afterwards condemned to death, perhaps because the beauty revealed that night had made him overbold. Enraged at her escape, the pirates made short work of Fondi. The church was wrecked, and the plundering went on for four terrible hours, never to be forgotten by the inhabitants. Refreshed and excited by their successful raid, the Turks needed little encouragement to enter with hardiness upon the real object of their expedition, which was nothing less than the annexation of the kingdom of Tunis. Three centuries had passed since the sultan of the race of Hafs had established their authority on the old Carthaginian site. Upon the breaking up of the African empire of the Almohades, their rule had been mild and just. They had maintained on the whole friendly relations with the European powers, and many treaties record their fair terms upon which the merchants of Pisa, Venice, and Genoa were admitted to the ports of Tunis. St. Louis had been so struck with the piety and justice of the king that he had even come to convert him, and had died in the attempt. Twenty-one rulers of their line had succeeded one another, till the vigor of the Beni Hafs was sapped, their fraternal jealousies added bloodshed to the weakness. Hassan, the twenty-second, stepped to the throne over the bodies of forty-four slaughtered brothers, and when he had thus secured his place, he set a pattern of vicious feebleness for all sovereigns to avoid. A rival claimant served as the corsair's pretext for invasion, and Kair Din had hardly landed when this miserable wretch fled the city. And though supported by some of the Arab tribes, he could make no head against the Turkish guns. Tunis, like Algiers, had been added to the Ottoman Empire, against its will, and by some masterful hands. It may be doubted whether the Sultan's writ could have run in either of his new provinces, had their conqueror gainsaid it. Tunis did not long remain in the possession of Barbarossa. The banished king appealed to Charles V, 
And, whatever the Emperor may have thought of Hassan's wrongs, he plainly perceived that Barbarossa's presence in Tunis Harbor was a standing menace to his own kingdom of Sicily. It was bad enough to see nests of pirates perched upon the rocks of the Algerine coast, but Tunis was the key of the passage from the west to the eastern basin of the Mediterranean, and to leave it in the Corsair's hands was to the last degree hazardous. Accordingly, he espoused the cause of Hassan, and at the end of May 1535 he set sail from Barcelona with 600 ships commanded by Doria, who had his own grudge to settle, and carrying the flower of the imperial troops, Spaniards, Italians, and Germans. In June he laid siege to the Goleta, or Halk el Wed, throat of the torrent, as the Arabs called it, those twin towers a mile asunder which guarded the channel of Tunis. The great Carrick St. Anne sent, with four galleys by, quote, the religion, so the Knights of Malta styled their order, was moored close in, and her heavy cannons soon made a breach, through which the Chevalier Cossier led the Knights of St. John, who always claimed the post of danger, into the fortress, and planted the banner of the religion on the battlements. Three desperate sailors had the besieged made under the leadership of Sinan the Jew. Three Italian generals of rank had fallen in the melee, before they were driven in confusion back upon the city of Tunis, leaving the Goleta with all of its stores of weapons and ammunition and its forty guns, some of them famous for their practice at the siege of Rhodes, and more than a hundred vessels in the hands of the enemy. Barbarossa came out to meet the emperor at the head of nearly ten thousand troops, but his Berbers refused to fight, and thousands of Christian slaves in the Cassaba or citadel aided by treachery, broke their chains and shut the gates behind him. And, after defending his rampart as long as he could, the corsair chief with Sinyan and Aden, Drub Devil, made his way to Bona, where he had fortunately left fifteen of his ships. The lines of Caer Din's triple wall may still be stacked across the neck of land which separates the Lake of Tunis from the Mediterranean. Fifteen years ago, this rampart was cut through, when nearly two hundred skeletons, some Spanish money, cannonballs, and broken weapons were found outside it. For three days, Charles gave up the city of Tunis to the brutality of his soldiers. They were days of horrible license and bloodshed. Men, women, and children were massacred, and worse than massacred, in the thousands. The infuriated troops fought one with the other for the possession of the spoil, and the luckless Christians of the Cassaba were cut down by their deliverers in the struggle for Kayer Din's treasures. The streets became shambles, the houses dens of murder and shame. The very Catholic chroniclers admit these admonable outrages committed by the licentious and furious adultery of the great emperor. It is hard to remember that almost at the very time when German and Spanish and Italian men-at-arms were outraging and slaughtering helpless innocent people in Tunis, who had taken little or no hand in Kayer Din's wars and had accepted his authority with reluctance, the Grand Vizier Ibrahim was entering Baghdad and Tabriz as a conqueror at the head of the wild Asiatic troops, and not a house nor human being was molested. Fas est et ab hoste doseri. So far as Tunis was concerned by the expedition of Charles V was fruitless. Before he sailed in August, he made a treaty with Hassan, which stipulated for tribute to Spain, the possession of the Goleta by the crown of the Castile, the freeing of Christian slaves, the cessation of privacy, and the payment of homage by an annual tribute of six Moorish barbs and twelve falcons. And he and the Moor duly swore it on the cross and sword. But the treaty was so much parchment wasted. No Muslim priest who had procured his restoration by such means as Hassan had used who had spilt Muslim blood with Christian weapons and ruined Muslim houses by the sacrilegious atrocities of, quote, infidel soldiers, and had bound himself to the vassal of idolatrous Spain, could hope to keep his throne long. He was an object of horror and repression to the people upon which he had brought this awful calamity, and so fierce was their scorn of the traitor to Islam that the story is told of a Moorish girl in the clutch of the soldiers who, when the restored king of Tunis sought to save her, spat in his face. Anything was better than the dishonor of his protection. Hassan pretended to reign for five years, but the country was in arms. Holy Kairouan would have nothing to say to a governor who owed his throne to infidel ravishers. Imperial troops in vain sought to keep him there. Doria himself succeeded only for a brief while in reducing the coast towns to the wretched pirate's authority. And in 1540, Hassan was imprisoned and blinded by his son Hamid, and none can pity him. The coast was in the possession of the Corsairs, and, as we shall see, even the Spaniards were forced ere long to abandon the Goleta. Nevertheless, the expedition to Tunis was a feat of which Europe was proud. Charles V seldom suffered from depreciation of his exploits, and, as Morgan quaintly says, I have never met with that a Spaniard in my whole life who, I am persuaded, would not have bestowed on me at least forty Botoe Cristos, had I pretended to assert Charles V not to have held this whole universal globe in a string for four and twenty hours, and then it broke. Though none had ever the good nature or manners to inform or correct my ignorance in genuine history by letting me into the secret when that critical and slippery period of time was. 
naturally admirers so thoroughgoing made the most of the conquest of Tunis. The reduction of the formidable Goleta, the release of thousands of Christian captives, and, above all, the discomfiture of that scourge of Christendom, Barbarossa himself. Poets sang of it, a painter in ordinary depicted the siege, a potter at Urbino burnt the scene into his vase. All Europe was agog with enthusiasm at the feat. Charles posed as a crusader and a knight-errant, and commemorated his gallant deeds and those of his gentlemen by creating a new order of chivalry, the Cross of Tunis, with the motto Barbaria, of which, however, we hear no more. Altogether, it was a famous victory. The joy of triumph was sadly marred by the doings of Caer Din, that incorrigible pirate, aware that no one would suspect that he could be roving while Charles was besieging his new kingdom, took occasion to slip on over to Minorica with his twenty-seven remaining galleots. There, flying Spanish and other false colors, deceived the islanders into the belief that his vessels were part of the Armada, upon which he rode boldly into Port Mahon, seized a rich Portuguese galleon, sacked the town, and laden with six thousand captives and much booty and ammunition, led his prize back in triumph to Algiers. In the meanwhile, Doria was assiduously hunting for him with thirty galleys, under the Emperor's express orders to catch him dead or alive. The great Genoese had to wait yet three years for his long-sought duel. Having accomplished its object, the Armada, as usual, broke up without making a decisive end to the Corsairs. Kair Din, awaiting at Algiers in expectation of attack, heard the news gladly, and, when the coast was clear, sailed back to Constantinople for reinforcements. He never saw Algiers again. End of chapter 8、Chapter 9 The sea fight off Prevesa. When Barbarossa returned to Constantinople, Tunis was forgotten and Minornica alone called to mind. Instead of the title Beglerberg of Algiers, the Sultan saluted him as Captain Pausha, or High Admiral of the Ottoman fleets. There was work to be done in the Adriatic, and none was fitter to do it than the great Corsair. Kair Din had acquired an added influence at Stambul since the execution of the Grand Vizier Ibrahim, and he used it in exactly the opposite direction. Ibrahim, a Dalmatian by birth, had always striven to maintain friendly relations with Venice, his native state, and for more than thirty years there had been peace between the Republic and the Port. Barbarossa, on the contrary, longed to pit his galleys against the most famous of the maritime nations of the Middle Ages, and to make the Crescent as supreme in the waters of the Adriatic as it was in the Aegean. Francis I was careful to support this policy out of his jealousy of the Empire. The Venetians, anxious to keep on good terms with the Sultan and to hold a neutral position between Francis and Charles V, found themselves gradually committed to a war, and by their own fault. Their commanders in the Adriatic and at Candia were unable to resist the temptation of chasing Ottoman merchantmen. Canal, the provider of Candia, caught a noted corsair, the young Moor of Alexander, as his victims called him, sunk or captured his galleys, and killed his janissaries, and severely wounded the young Moor himself. And all this in Turkish waters, on Turkish subjects, and in time of peace. Of course, when the two gallant provveditore came to his senses and perceived his folly, he patched the young Moor's wounds and sent him tenderly back to Algiers. But the Sultan's ire was already roused, and when the Venetian galleys actually gave chase to a ship that carried a Turkish ambassador, no apologies that the Signora offered could wipe out the affront. War was inevitable, and Venice hastily made common cause with the Pope and the Emperor against the formidable host which now advanced upon the Adriatic. Before this, some stirring actions had been fought off the coasts of Greece. Doria, sallying forth from Messina, had met the governor of Gallipoli off Paxos and had fought him before daybreak. Standing erect on the poop, conspicuous in his cremoisy doublet, the tall figure of the old admiral was seen for an hour and a half directing the conflict, sword in hand, an easy mark for sharpshooters, as a wound in the knee reminded him. After a severe struggle, the twelve galleys of the enemy were captured and carried in triumph to Messina. Barbarossa was sorely wanted now, and in May 1537 he sailed with 135 galleys to avenge the insult. For a whole month he laid waste to the Apulian coast like a pestilence, and carried off 10,000 slaves, while Doria lay helpless with a far interior force in Messina roads. The Turks were boasting that they could soon set up a pope of their own when the war with Venice broke out, and they were called off from their devastation of Italy by the Sultan's command to besiege Corfu. 
the Ionian Islands were always a bone of contention between the Turks and their neighbors, and a war with Venice naturally began with an attack upon Corfu. The Senate had shut its eyes as long as possible to the destination of the huge armaments which left Constantinople in the spring. Tunis, or perhaps Naples, was said to be their object. But now they were undeceived. And on the 25th of August, Captain Pasha Barbarossa landed 25,000 men and 30 cannon under the Lufti Pasha, three miles from the castle of Corfu. Four days after the Grand Vizier Ayas, with 25,000 more and a brilliant staff, joined the first comers, and the Akinji, or light troops, spread fire and sword around. A 50-pounder fired 19 shots in three days, but only five struck the fortress. The Turks fired too high, and many of their missiles fell harmlessly into the sea beyond. In spite of storm and rain, the Grand Vizier would not desist from making the round of the trenches by night. Suleiman offered liberal terms of capitulation, but the besieged sent back his messenger with never an answer. Alexandro Tron worked the big gun of the castle with terrible precision. Two galleys were quickly sunk, four men were killed in the trenches by a single shot, a new and alarming experience in those days of gunnery. Four times the fort of St. Angelo was attacked in vain. Winter was approaching, and the Sultan determined to raise the siege. In vain, Barbarossa remonstrated. A thousand such castles were not worth the life of one of his brave men, said the Sultan. And on the 17th of September, the troops began to re-embark. Then began a scene of devastation, as such the Isles of Greece have too often witnessed, not from Turks only, but from Genoese and Venetians, who also came to the archipelago for their oarsmen, but never perhaps on so vast a scale. Petrino was burnt, Paxos conquered, and then Barbarossa carried fire and sword throughout the Adriatic and the archipelago. With seventy galleys and thirty galleots, he raged among the islands, most of which belonged to noble families of Venice. The Veneri, Grispi, Pisanti, Chierni, Scaia, Skyros, Aegina, Paros, Naxos, Tenos, and other Venetian possessions were overwhelmed, and thousands of their people carried off to pull a Turkish oar. Naxos contributed $5,000 as her first year's tribute. Aegina furnished 6,000 slaves, Many trophies did Barbarossa bring home to Stambul, whose riches certainly did his own and the Sultan's. If not, the general coffer fill. 400,000 pieces of gold, 1,000 girls, and 1,500 boys were useful resources when he returned to rub his countenance against the royal stirrup. 200 boys in scarlet bearing gold and silver bowls, 30 more laden with purses, 200 with fine rolls of cloth, such was the present with which the High Admiral approached the Sultan's presence. Suleiman's genius was at that time bent upon three distinct efforts. He was carrying on a campaign in Moldova. His Suez fleet, a novelty in Ottoman history, was invading the Indian Ocean. With no very tangible result, it is true, unless a trophy of Indian ears and noses may count, save the conquest of Aden on the return voyage. And disturbing the Portuguese in Gujarat, and his high admiral was planning the destruction of the maritime power of Venice. In the summer of 1538, Barbarossa put off to sea, and soon had 150 sail under his command. He began by collecting rowers and tribute from the islands, 25 of which had now been transferred from the Venetian to the Turkish allegiance, and then laid waste 80 villages in Candia. Here news was brought that the united fleet of the Emperor, Venice, and the Pope was cruising in the Adriatic, and the Captain Pasha hastened to meet it. The pick of the Corsairs was with him. Round his flagship were ranged the galleys of Dragut, Murad Reis, Sinan, Salah Reis, with twenty Egyptian vessels, and others, to the number of 122 ships of war. The advance guard sighted part of the enemy off Prevesa, a Turkish fortress opposite the promontory of Arda or Actium, where Antony suffered his memorable defeat. The Christian strength was really overwhelming. Eighty Venetian, thirty-six papal, and thirty Spanish galleys, together with fifty sailing galleons, made up a formidable total of nearly two hundred ships of war, and they carried scarcely less than sixty thousand men, and 2,500 guns. Doria was in chief command, and Capello and Grimani led the Venetian and Roman contingents. Barbarossa had fortunately received but an imperfect report of the enemy's strength, and so boldly pursued his northerly course up the Adriatic. When he reached Prevesa, the combined fleets had gone off to Corfu, and he was able to enter unopposed the spacious Gulf of Arda, where all the navies of the world might safely anchor and defy pursuit. On September 25th, the Allied fleets appeared off an entrance to the Gulf, and then for the first time Barbarossa realized his immense good fortune in being the first in the bay. Outnumbered as he was, a fight in the open sea might have ended in the total destruction of his navy, but secure in an ample harbor on a friendly coast, behind a bar which the heavier vessels of the enemy could not cross, 
he could wait his opportunity to take the foe at a disadvantage. The danger was that Doria might disembark his guns and attack from the shores of the Gulf, and to meet this risk, some of the Turkish captains insisted on landing their men and trying to erect earthworks for their protection, but the fire from the Christian ships soon stopped this maneuver. Barbarossa had never expected Doria to hazard a landing, and he was right. The old admiral of Charles V was not likely to expose his ships to the risk of a sally from the Turks just when he had deprived them of men and guns that could alone defend them. The two fleets watched each other warily. Doria and Barbarossa had at last come face to face for a great battle, but, strange as it may seem, neither cared to begin. Barbarossa was conscious of serious numerical inferiority. Doria was anxious for the safety of his fifty big sailing vessels on the heavy artillery on which he most relied, but which a contrary wind might drive to destruction on the hostile coast. As it was, his guide ship on the extreme left had but a fathom of water under her keel. Each felt keenly the weighty responsibility of his position and even the sense that now, at last, the decisive day of their long rivalry had come could not stir them from their policy of prudence. Moreover, it was no longer a question of the prowess of hot-blooded youth. Doria and Barbarossa and Capello were all men of nearly seventy years, and Doria was certainly not the man he once was. Politics had spoiled him. So the two great admirals waited and eyed each other's strength. Will Barbarossa come out, or must Doria risk passage of the bar and force his way into the encounter? Neither event happened, but on the morning of the 27th, the Corsairs rubbed their eyes to feel as if they were asleep. As they saw the whole magnificent navy of Christendom, anchor at peak, sailing slowly and majestically, away. Were the Christians afraid? Anyhow, no one, not even Barbarossa, could hold the Turks back now. Out they rushed in hot pursuit, not thinking or caring, save their shrewd captain, whether this were not a feint of Doria's to catch them in the open. Get into line, said Barbarossa to his captains and do as you see me do. Dragut took the right wing, Sally raised the left. Early on the 28th, the Christian fleet was discovered at anchor in foul wind. Off Santa Mara, 30 miles to the south, Doria was not at all prepared for such a prompt pursuit, and eyed with anxiety the long battle line of 140 galleys, galleots, and brigantines, bearing down upon him before the wind. His ships were scattered, for the sails could not keep up with the oars. And Condolerimo's huge Venetian carrack was becalmed off Zara, a long way behind, and others were in no better plight. Three hours Doria hesitated, then gave the order to sail north and meet the enemy. Condomero was already fiercely engaged, and soon his carrack was a mere, unrigged, helmless water log, only saved from instant destruction by her immense size and terrific guns, which, well aimed, low on the water, to gain the ricochet, did fearful mischief among the attacking galleys. Two galleons were burnt to the water's edge, and their crews took to the boats. A third, Bacanegras lost her mainmast and staggered away crippled. What was Doria about? The wind was now in his favor, the enemy was in front, but Doria continued to tack and maneuver at a distance. What he aimed at is uncertain. His colleagues Grimani and Capello went on board his flagship, and vehemently remonstrated with him, and even implored him to depart and let them fight the battle with their own ships, but in vain. He was bent on tactics, when what was needed was pluck, and tactics lost the day. The Corsairs took, it is true, only seventy galleys and sailing vessels, but they held the sea. Doria sailed away in the evening for Corfu, and the whole allied fleet followed in a gale of wind. So, after all, the great duel was never fairly fought between the great rivals. Barbarossa was willing, but Doria held back. Barbarossa was willing, but Doria held back. He preferred to show his seamanship instead of his courage. The result was, in effect, a victory. A signal victory for the Turks. Two hundred splendid vessels of these great Christian states had fled before an inferior force of Ottomans, and it is no wonder that Sultan Suleiman, when he learned of the news at Yambali, illuminated the town and added one hundred thousand espers a year to the revenues of the conqueror. Barbarossa had once more proved to the world that the Turkish fleet was invincible. The flag of Suleiman floated supreme in all the waters of the Mediterranean Sea. End of section 9《Chapter X of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Story of the Barbary Corsairs》by J.D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole — Chapter X — Barbarossa in France Barbarossa's life was drawing to a close but in the eight years that remained, he enhanced his already unrivaled renown. His first exploit after Prevesa was the recapture of Castelnuvo, 
which the Allied fleets had seized in October, as some compensation on land for their humiliation at sea. The Turkish armies had failed to recover the fortress in January of 1539, but in July Barbarossa went to the front as usual, with a fleet of 200 galleys, large and small, and all his best captains, and after some very pretty fighting in the Gulf of Catero, landed 84 of his heaviest guns and bombarded Castle Nouveau, from three well-placed batteries. On August 7th, a sanguinary assault secured the first line of the defenses. Three days later, the governor, Don Francisco Sarmiento, and his handful of Spaniards surrendered to a final assault, and were surprised to find themselves chivalrously respected as honorable foes. 3,000 Spaniards had fallen, and 8,000 Turks in the course of the siege. One more campaign and Barbarossa's feats are over. Great events were happening on the Algerine coasts, where he must return after too long an absence in the Levant and Adriatic. But first, the order of years must be neglected that we may see the last of the most famous of all the corsairs. To make amends for the coldness of Henry VIII, Francis I was allied with the other great maritime power, Turkey, against the emperor. In 1543, the old sea rover actually brought his fleet of 150 ships to Marseille. The French captain saluted the corsairs capitana, and the banner of Our Lady was lowered to be replaced by the crescent. Well may a French admiral call this the impious alliance. On his way, Barbarossa enjoyed a raid in quite his old style, burnt Reggio and carried off the governor's daughter, appeared off the Tiber and terrified the people of Civitavesha, and in July entered the Gulf of Lyons in triumph. Here he found the young Duke of Engahain, Francois de Bourbon, commander of the French galleys, who received him with all honor and ceremony. Barbarossa had hardly arrived when he discovered that his great expedition was but a fool's errand, the king of France was afraid of attempting a serious campaign against the emperor, and he was already ashamed of his alliance with the Muslims. His own subjects, nay, all Europe were crying shame. Barbarossa grew crimson with fury and tore his white beard. He had not come with a vast fleet all the way from Stambul to be made a laughing stock. Something must evidently be done to satisfy his honor, and Francis I unwillingly gave orders for the bombardment of Nice. Accompanied by a feeble and ill-prepared French contingent, which soon ran short of ammunition, Fine soldiers, cried the corsair, to fill their ships with wine casks and leave the powder barrels behind. Barbarossa descended upon the gate of Italy. The city soon surrendered, but the fort held out, defended by one of those invincible folks of the Turk, a knight of Malta. Paolo Simeone, who had himself experienced captivity at the hands of Barbarossa, and as the French protested against sacking the town after capitulation on terms, and as Charles's relieving army was advancing, the camps were broken up in confusion and the fleets retired from Nice. The people of Toulon beheld a strange spectacle that winter. The beautiful harbor of Provence was allotted to the Turkish admiral for his winter quarters. There, at anchor, lay the immense fleet of the Grand Seigneur, and who knew how long it might dominate the fairest province of France? There, turbaned Muslims paced the decks and bridge, below and beside which hundreds of Christian slaves sat chained to the bench and victims to the lash of the boatswain. Frenchmen were forced to look on, helplessly. While Frenchmen groaned in the infidel's galleys, within the security of a French port, the captives died by hundreds of fever during that winter, but no Christian burial was allowed them. Even the bells that summoned the pious to the mass were silenced, for they are not the devil's musical instrument, and the gaps in the benches were filled by nightly raids among the neighboring villages. It was ill sleeping around Toulon when the corsair press gangs were abroad, and to feed and pay these rapacious allies was a task that went near to ruining the finances of France. The French were not satisfied with the Corsair's fidelity, and it must be added that the Emperor might have had some reason to doubt the honesty of Doria. The two greatest admirals of the age were both in the Midwestern Mediterranean, but nothing could tempt them to come to blows. The truth was that each had a great reputation to lose, and each preferred to go to his grave with all his fame undimmed. Francis I had a suspicion that Barbarossa was meditating the surrender of Toulon to the Emperor, and, improbable as it was, some color was given to the king's anxiety by the amicable relations which seemed to subsist between the Genoese corsair and his Barbary rival. Doria gave up on the captive Draga to his old captain for a ransom of 3,000 gold crowns, a transaction on which he afterward looked back with unqualified regret. The situation was growing daily more unpleasant for France. From his easy position on Toulon, Barbarossa sent forth squadrons under Saleh Reyes and other commanders to lay waste to the coast of Spain while he remained lazily engaged in emptying the coffers of the French king. At last they got rid of him. Francis was compelled to furnish the pay and rations of the whole crews and troops of the Ottoman fleet up to the re-entry into the Bosphorus. He had to free 400 Mohammedan galley slaves and deliver them to Barbarossa. He loaded them with jewelry, silks, and other presents. The corsair departed in a corsair style, weighted down with spoil. His homeward voyage was one long harrying of the Italian coasts. 
his galleys sailed low with human freight, and his arrival at Constantinople was the signal for the filling of all the harems of the great pashas with beautiful captives. Barbarossa, laden with such gifts, was sure of his welcome. Two years later, he died, in July 1546. An old man of perhaps near ninety, yet without surviving his great fame. Valorous yet prudent, furious in attack, foreseeing in preparation. He ranks as the first sea captain of his time. The chief of the sea is dead, expressed in three Arabic words, gives the numerical value 953. The year of the Hydra in which Kair din Barbarossa died. Long afterwards, no Turkish fleet left the Golden Horn without her crew repeating a prayer and firing a salute over the tomb of Besiktas, where lie the bones of the first great Turkish admiral. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Bennett. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J.D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. When Barbarossa left Algiers forever in 1535 to become the High Admiral of the Ottoman Empire, the Corsairs lost indeed their chief. But so many of his captains remained behind that the game of sea roving went on as merrily as ever. Indeed, so fierce and ruthless were the depredations that the people of Italy and Spain and the islands began to regret the attentions of so gentlemanly a robber as Barbarossa. His successor or viceroy at Algiers was a Sardinian renegade, Hassan the Eunuch, but the chief commanders at sea were Dragut, Salares, Sanan, and the rest, who, when not called to join the Captain Pasha's fleet, pursued the art of piracy from the Barbary coast. Dragut worked measureless mischief in the archipelago and Adriatic, seized Venetian galleys, and laid waste to the shores of Italy till he was caught by Giannettino Doria, nephew of the great admiral, while unsuspectingly engaged in dividing his spoils on the Sardinian coast. And since to find his vast empire perpetually harassed by foes so lawless and in numbers so puny, Charles the Emperor resolved to put down the Corsair's trade once and forever. He had subdued Tunis in 1535, but piracy still went on. Now he would grapple the head and front of the offense and conquer Algiers. He had no fears of the result. The Corsair city would fall at the mere sight of his immense flotilla, and in this vainglorious assurance he set out in October 1541. He even took Spanish ladies on board to view his triumph. The season for a descent on the African coast was over, and everyone knew that the chance of effecting anything before the winter storm should guard the coast from any floating enemy was more than doubtful, but the Spaniards commonly move with gravity, and besides, Charles had been delayed during a busy summer by his troubles in Germany and Flanders and could not get away before. Now at last he was free, and in spite of the earnest remonstrances of Doria and the entreaties of the Pope, to Algiers he would go. Everything had long been prepared. A month, he believed, at the outset would finish the matter. In short, go he would. At Spazia, he embarked on Doria's flagship, the Duke of Elva of sanguinary memory, commanded the troops, many of whom had been brought by the emperor himself from the German highlands. Ill luck attended them from the outset. A storm, no unusual phenomenon with November coming on, drove the ships back into shelter at Corsica. At length, the sea subsided, and the fleet, picking up allies as it went along, cautiously hugged the land as far as Menorca, where the mistral, the terror of seamen, rushed down upon the huge armada. Masts strained, yards cracked, sails were torn to rags, and there was nothing for it but to row, row for their lives and for Charles. They were but seven miles from Port Mahan, yet it took half the night to win there, an endless night which the panting crews never forgot. In the Bay of Palma at Majorca, the fleet was assembled. There were the Emperor's hundred sailing vessels carrying the German and Italian troops, commanded by such historic names as Colonna and Spinoza. There were Fernando Gonzago's Sicilian galleys and 150 transports from Naples and Palermo. There were the 50 galleys of Bernardino de Mendoza, conveying 200 transports with the arms and artillery, 
in carrying the corps of gentlemen adventurers mustered from the chivalry of spain and including one only who had climbed up from the ranks but that one was cortez the conqueror of mexico over five hundred sail manned by twelve thousand men and carrying a land force of twenty four thousand soldiers entered the roads of algiers on october nineteenth fifteen forty one at last the great emperor set eyes upon the metropolis of piracy on the rocky promontory which forms the western crest of the crescent bay high up the amphitheater of hills tier upon tier in their narrow overshadowed lanes the houses of the corsairs basked in the autumn sun crowned by the fortress which had known the imperious rule of two barbarossas on the right was the mole which spanish slaves had built out of the ruins of the spanish fort two gates fronted the south and north the bebezun and the bebwed avoiding the promontory of cashina the galleys with furled sails drew up before the low strand backed by stretches of luxuriant verdure south of the city and out of range at the spot which is still called the jardin de Issa. a heavy swell prevented their landing for three days but on the twenty-third in beautiful weather the troops disembarked the berbers and arabs who had lined the shore and defied the invaders hastily retired before the guns of the galleys and the spaniards landed unopposed the next day they began the march to the city some few miles off the spaniards formed the left wing on the hillside the emperor and the duke of alva with the german troops composed the centre the italians and one hundred and fifty knights of malta marched on the right by the seashore driving back the straggling bands of mounted arabs who ambushed among the rocks and ravines and picked off many of the christians the invaders pushed steadily on till algiers was invested on all sides save the north its fate appeared sealed a brief bombardment by charles's heavy cannon and the spaniards would rush the breach and storm the citadel hassanaga within with only eight hundred turks and perhaps five thousand arabs and moors must almost have regretted the proud reply he had just made to the emperor's summons to surrender then when the end seemed close at hand the forces of nature came to the rescue the stars in their courses fought for algiers the rains descended and the winds blew and beat upon the army till the wretched soldiers with neither tents nor cloaks with barely food for the landing of the stores had hardly begun standing all night knee-deep in slush in that pinguid soil soaked to the skin frozen by driving rain and bitter wind were ready to drop with exhaustion and misery when morning dawned they could scarcely bear up against the blustering gale their powder was wet and a sudden sally of the turks spread a panic in the sodden ranks which needed all the courage and coolness of the knights of malta to compose at last the enemy was driven out of the trenches and pursued skirmishing all the way to the babazoon it looked as though pursuers and pursued would enter together but the gate was instantly shut and a daring knight of malta had barely struck his dagger in the gate to defy the garrison when the christians found themselves under so heavy a fire from the battlements that they were forced to beat a retreat the knights of malta last of all their scarlet doublets shining like a fresh wound and their faces to the foe covered the retreat hassan then let out his best horsemen from the gate and driving their heels into their horses flanks the cloud of moslems poured down the hill the knights of malta bore the shock of their iron firmness though they lost heavily the italians ran for their lives the germans whom charles hurriedly dispatched to the rescue came back at the double without drawing a sword the emperor himself put on his armor spurred his charger into the midst of the fugitives sword in hand and with vehement reproaches succeeded in shaming them into fight come gentlemen then said he to the nobles around forwards and thus he led his dispirited troops once more to the field this time the panic alarm of the rank and file was controlled and banished by the cool courage of the cavaliers and the turks were driven back into the town the skirmish had cost him three hundred men and a dozen knights of malta all that day the emperor and his officers great signors all stood at arms in the pouring rain with water oozing from their boots vigilantly alert 
Had Charles now run his ships ashore at all hazard and dragged up his heavy siege train and stores and tents and ammunition, all might yet have been won. But several precious days were wasted, and on the morning of the 25th, such a storm sprang up as mortal mariner rarely encountered even off such a coast, a violent northeasterly hurricane, still known in Algiers as Charles's Gale, such as few vessels cared to ride off a lee shore. The immense flotilla in the bay was within an ace of total destruction. Anchors and cables were powerless to hold the crowded, jostling ships. One after the other they broke loose and keeled over to the tempest till their decks were drowned in the seas. Planks gaped, broadside to broadside, the helpless hulks crashed together. Many of the crews threw themselves madly on shore. In six hours, 150 ships sank. The rowers of the galleys, worn out with toiling at the oar, at last succumbed, and 15 of the vessels ran on shore, only to be received by the Berbers of the hills, who ran their spears through the miserable shipwrecked sailors as soon as they gained the land. The worst day must come to an end. On the morrow, the storm was over and Doria, who had succeeded in taking the greater part of the fleet out to sea, came back to see what new folly was in hand. He was indignant with the emperor for having rejected his advice and so led the fleet and army into such peril. He was disgusted with his captains, who had completely lost their coolness in the hurricane and wanted to run their vessels ashore with the certainty of wreck sooner than ride out the storm, and yet called themselves sailors. He found Charles fully aware of the necessity for a temporary retreat, till the army should be revictualled and reclothed. The camp was struck. The emperor himself watched the operation, standing at the door of his tent in a long white cassock, murmuring quietly the Christian's consolation. Thy will be done. Fiat voluntas tua. Baggage and ordnance were abandoned, the horses of the field artillery were devoured by the hungry troops, and then the march began. To retreat at all is humiliation, but to retreat as this luckless army did was agony. Deep mud clogged their weary feet. When a halt was called, they could but rest on their halberds. To lie down was to be suffocated in filth. Mountain torrents, swollen breast high, had to be crossed. The waiting men were washed away till they built a rude bridge, o crowning humiliation, out of the wreckage of their own ships. Hassan and a multitude of Turks and Arabs hung forever on their flanks. The dejected Italians, who had no stomach for this sort of work, fell often into the hands of the pursuers. The Germans, who could do nothing without their customary internal stuffing, were mere impedimenta, and only the lean Spaniard covered the retreat with something of his natural courage. At last, the dejected army reached the Bay of Temendifus, where the remains of the fleet were lying at anchor. It was resolved, in view of the approach of winter and the impossibility of sending supplies to an army in stormy weather, to re-embark. Cortez in vain protested. The Council of War agreed that it was too late in the year to attempt retaliation. Then a new difficulty arose. How was room to be found in a flotilla which had lost nearly a third of its ships for an army which was but a couple of thousand less than when it landed? Regretfully, Charles gave orders for the horses to be cast into the sea, and despite their master's entreaties, favorite charges of priceless value were slaughtered and thrown overboard. The famous breed of Spanish horses was well nigh ruined. It was but one tragedy more. On the 2nd of November, most of the troops were on board. Charles resolved to be the last to leave the strand. But the wind was getting up, the sea rising, and at last he gave the order to weigh anchor. Often is the story told in Algiers how the great emperor, who would fain hold Europe in the palm of his hand, sadly took the crown from off his head and casting it into the sea said, Go bauble. Let some more fortunate prince redeem and wear thee. He did not sail a moment too soon. A new and terrific storm burst forth. The ships were driven hither and thither. Where the tempest drove them, there they helplessly wandered, and many men died from famine and exposure. Some of the Spanish vessels were wrecked at Algiers, and their crews and troops were sent to the Bagnios. 
Charles himself and Doria arrived safely at Biugia, then a Spanish outpost, with part of the flotilla. Here the unexpected visitors soon caused a famine, and still the tempest raged. The half-starved rovers in vain tried to make head against the waves and carry the emperor back to Spain. Eighty miles out they gave in, and the ships returned disconsolately to the harbor. Twelve days and nights the storm bellowed along the treacherous coast, and not till November 23rd could the imperial fleet set sail for the coast of Spain. There was mourning in Castile that yuletide. Besides 8,000 rank and file, 300 officers of birth had fallen victims to the storm or the Moorish lance. Algiers teemed with Christian captives, and it became a common saying that a Christian slave was scarce a fair barter for an onion. So ended this famous expedition. It was begun in glory and ended in shame. The whole of Christendom, one might say, for there were English knights there, like Sir Thomas Chaloner, as well as Germans, Frenchmen, Spaniards, and Italians in the army, had gone forth to destroy a nest of pirates, and behold, by the fury of the elements and the foolishness of their own counsels, they were almost destroyed themselves. They had left behind them ships and men and stores and cannon. Worse, they had left Algiers stronger and more defiant than ever. The Algerians, for their part, never forgot the valor of the Knights of Malta, and the spot where they made their stand is still called the Grave of the Knights. High up on the hillside may be seen the Emperor's Castle, which marks the traditional place where Charles's great pavilion was pitched on the morning of the fatal 23rd of October. The climate of Africa, it is the caustic comment of Admiral Jurien de la Graviere, was evidently unsuited to the deeds of chivalry. End of chapter 11. Recording by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 12 of the story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Bennett. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J.D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. The name of Dragut has already occurred more than once in this story. It was destined to become as notorious as Barbarossa's as the century advanced. Dragut, or Torgud, was born on the Caramanian coast opposite the island of Rhodes. Unlike many of his colleagues, he seems to have been the son of Mohammedan parents, tillers of the earth. Being adventurous by name, he took service as a boy in the Turkish fleet and became a good pilot and a most excellent gunner. At last he contrived to purchase and man a galio, with which he cruised the waters of the Levant, where his intimate acquaintance with all the coasts and islands enabled him to seize and dispose of many prizes. Caradin Barbarossa soon came to hear of his exploits and welcomed him heartily when he came to pay his respects at Algiers, in so far that he gave him the conduct of various expeditions and eventually appointed him his lieutenant with a command of twelve galleys. From thenceforward, this redoubtable corsair passed not one summer without ravaging the coasts of Naples and Sicily, nor durst any Christian vessels attempt to pass between Spain and Italy, for if they offered it, he infallibly snapped them up, and when he missed any of his prey at sea, he made himself amends by making descents along the coasts, plundering villages and towns, and dragging away multitudes of inhabitants into captivity. In 1540, as we have seen, Dragut was caught by Giannettino Doria, who made him a present to his great kinsman, Andrea, on whose galley he was forced to toil in chains. Lavallee, afterwards Grand Master of Malta, who had once pulled the captive's oar on Barbarossa's ships and knew Dragut well, one day saw the ex-corsair straining on the galley bank. Signor Dragut, said he, Asanza de Garia, tis the custom of war and the prisoner, remembering his visitor's former apprenticeship, replied cheerfully, Why, Modanza de Fortuna, a change of luck. He did not lose heart, and in 1543 Barbarossa ransomed him for 3,000 crowns and made him chief of the galleys of the western corsairs. 
Imprisonment had sharpened his appetite for Christians, and he harried the Italian coasts with more than his ancient zeal. Surrounded by bold spirits and commanding a fleet of his own, Dragut had the Mediterranean in his grasp, and even ventured to seize the most dreaded of all foes, a Maltese galley, wherein he found seventy thousand ducats intended for the repair of the fortifications of Tripoli, which then belonged to the religion. As the Turkish analyst says, Torgut had become the drawn sword of Islam. Dragut's lair was at the island of Jirba, which tradition links with the lotus eaters. Perhaps because of the luxuriant fertility of the soil, the people of Jirba, despite their simple agricultural pursuits, were impatient of control and often, as of not, were independent of the neighboring kingdom of Tunis or any other state. Here, with or without their leave, Dragut took up his position, probably in the very castle which Roger Doria, when lord of the island, began to build in 1289, and from out the wide lake at the back the corsair's galleos issued to ravage the lands which were under the protection of Roger Doria's descendants. Not content with the rich spoils of Europe, Dragut took the Spanish outposts in Africa one by one. Susa, Sfax, Monastir, and finally set forth to conquer Africa. It is not uncommon in Arabic to call a country and its capital by the same name. Thus, Misr meant and still means both Egypt and Cairo, El Andalus both Spain and Cordova. Similarly, Africa meant to the Arabs the province of Carthage or Tunis and its capital, which was not at first Tunis, but successively Karawan and Medea. Throughout the later Middle Ages, the name Africa is applied by Christian writers to the latter city. Here it was that in 1390, a grand and noble enterprise came to an untimely end. The Genoese, says Freysart, bore great enmity to this town, for its corsairs frequently watched them at sea, and when strongest, fell on and plundered their ships carrying their spoils to this town of Africa, which was and is now their place of deposit and may be called their warren. It was beyond measure strong, surrounded by high walls, gates, and deep dishes. The chivalry of Christendom hearkened to the prayer of the Genoese and the people of Majorca and Sardinia and Ischia and the many islands that groaned beneath the corsairs' devastations. The Duke of Bourbon took command of an expedition at the cost of the Genoese, which included names as famous as the Count de Auvergne, the Lord de Courcy, Sir John de Vienne, the Count of Eu, and our own Henry Beaufort. And on St. John Baptist's day, with much pomp, with flying banners and the blowing of trumpets, they sailed on 300 galleys for Barbary. Arrived before Africa, not without the hindrance of a storm, they beheld the city in the form of a bow, reaching out its arms to the sea. High were its ramparts, and a colossal tower, armed with stone projectiles, guarded the harbor. Nevertheless, the knights landed in good heart. After a cup of Grecian or Malmsey wine, on the vigil of Magdalen Day, unopposed, and each great lord set up his pennon before his tent over against the fortress with the Genoese crossbows on the right. Here they remained nine weeks. The Saracens never offered battle, but harassed the enemy with their skirmishers, who fired their arrows, then dropped down behind their targets of Capdosian leather to avoid the enemy's return volley. Then, rising again, cast their javelins with deadly aim, what was to be done? The Duke of Bourbon spent his time in sitting cross-legged before his tent. The nobles and knights had plenty of excellent wine and food, but it was very hot and uncomfortable. The assault had failed. Many had died. The Genoese wanted to get their galleys back safe in port before the autumn gales came on, so they packed up their baggage and re-embarked, blowing their horns and beating their drums for very joy. This was the city which Dragut took without a blow in the spring of 1550. Medea was then in an anarchic state, ruled by a council of chiefs, each ready to betray the other, and none owing the smallest allegiance to any king, least of all the despised king of Tunis, Hamid, who had deposed and blinded his father, Hassan, Charles V's protege. One of these chiefs let Dragut and his merry men into the city by night, 
and the inhabitants woke up to find Africa in the possession of the bold corsair whose red and white ensign, displaying a blue crescent, floated from the battlements. So easy a triumph roused the emulation of Christendom. Where the Duke of Bourbon had failed, Dragut had conspicuously succeeded. Don Garcia de Toledo dreamed of outshining the corsair's glory. His father, the viceroy of Naples, the Pope, and others promised their aid, and old Andrea Doria took the command. After much delay and consultation, a large body of troops was conveyed to Medea and disembarked on June 28, 1550. Dragut, though aware of the project, was at sea, devastating the Gulf of Genoa and paying himself in advance for any loss the Christians might inflict in Africa. His nephew, Hisarius, commanded in the city. When Dragut returned, the siege had gone on for a month without result. A tremendous assault had been repulsed with heavy loss to the besiegers, who were growing disheartened. The corsair assembled a body of Moors and Turks and attempted to relieve the fortress but his ambuscade failed. Hisser's simultaneous sally was driven back, and Dragut, seeing that he could do nothing, fled to Jerba. His retreat gave fresh energy to the siege, and a change of attack discovered the weak places of the defense. A vigorous assault on the 8th of September carried the walls, a brisk street fight ensued, and the strong city of Africa was in the hands of the Christians. The Sultan, Suleiman the Great, was little pleased to see a Muslim fortress summarily stormed by the troops of his ally, the Emperor. Charles replied that he had fought against pirates, not against the Sultan's vassals. But Suleiman could not perceive the distinction and emphasized his disapproval by giving Dragut twenty galleys, which soon found their way to Christian shores. The lamentation of his victims roused Doria who had the good fortune to surprise the corsair as he was greasing his keels in the strait behind Jerba. The strait was virtually a cul-de-sac. Between the island and the great lake that lay behind it, the sea had worn a narrow channel on the northern side, through which light vessels could pass with care, but to go out of the lake by the southern side involved a voyage over what was little better than a bog, and no one ever thought of the attempt. Doria saw he had his enemy in a trap and was in no hurry to venture in among the shoals and narrows of the strait. He sent joyous messages to Europe announcing his triumph and cautiously, as was his habit, awaited events. Dragut, for his part, dared not push out against a vastly superior force. His only chance was a ruse. Accordingly, putting a bold face on the matter, he manned a small earthwork with cannon and played upon the enemy with little or no actual injury, beyond the all-important effect of making Doria hesitate still more. Meanwhile, in the night, while his little battery is perplexing the foe, all is prepared at the southern extremity of the strait. Summoning a couple of thousand field laborers, he sets them to work. Here a small canal is dug, the rollers come into play, and in a few hours his small fleet is safely transported to the open water on the south side of the island. Calling off his men from the elusive battery, the corsair is off for the archipelago. By good luck, he picks up a fine galley on the way, which was conveying news of the reinforcements coming to Doria. The old Genoese admiral never gets the message. He is rubbing his eyes in sore amazement, wondering what happened to the imprisoned fleet. Never was admiral more cruelly cheated, Never did Doria curse the nimble corsair with greater vehemence or better cause. Next year, 1551, Dragut's place was with the Ottoman navy, then commanded by Sinan Pasha. He had had enough of solitary roving and found it almost too exciting. He now preferred to hunt in couples with nearly 150 galleys and galleos, 10,000 soldiers and numerous siege guns. Sinan and Dragut sailed out of the Dardanelles, whither bound no Christian could tell. They ravaged, as usual, the Straits of Messina and then revealed the point of attack by making direct for Malta. The Knights of St. John were a perpetual thorn in the side of the Turks and even more vexatious to the Corsairs, whose vessels they and they alone dared to tackle single-handed and too often with success. Sultan and Corsair were alike eager to dislodge the Knights from the rock which they had been fortifying for twenty years just as Suleiman had dislodged them from Rhodes, which they had been fortifying for two hundred. 
In July, the Turkish fleet appeared before Marsa, wholly unexpected by the knights. The Turks landed on the tongue of promontory which separates the two great harbors and where there was as yet no Fort St. Elmo to molest them. Sinan was taken aback by the strong aspect of the fortress of St. Angelo on the further side of the harbor and almost repented of his venture. To complete his dejection, he seems to have courted failure. Instead of boldly throwing his whole force upon the small garrison and overwhelming them by sheer weight, he tried a reconnaissance and fell into an ambuscade, upon which he incontinently abandoned all thought of a siege and contented himself with laying waste the interior of Malta and taking the adjacent island of Goza. The quantity of booty he would bring back to Constantinople might perhaps avail, he thought, to keep his head on his shoulders after so conspicuous a failure, but Sinan preferred not to trust to the chance. To wipe out his defeat, he sailed straight for Tripoli, some sixty-four leagues away. Tripoli was the natural antidote for Malta, for Tripoli, too, belonged to the Knights of St. John, much against their will, inasmuch as the emperor had made their defense of this easternmost Barbary state a condition of their tenure of Malta. So far, they had been unable to put it into a proper state of defense, and with crumbling battlements and a weak garrison, they had yearly expected invasion. The hour had now come. Summoned to surrender, the commandant, Gaspar de Villiers, of the Auvergne Tongue, replied that the city had been entrusted to his charge and he would defend it to the death. He had but 400 men to hold the fort with all. 6,000 Turks disembarked, 40 cannons were landed, Sinan himself directed every movement and arranged his batteries and earthworks. A heavy cannonade produced no effect on the walls, and the Turkish admiral thought of the recent repulse at Malta, and of the stern face of his master, and his head sat uneasily upon his neck. The siege appeared to make no progress. Perhaps this venture, too, would have failed, but for the treachery of a French renegade, who escaped into the trenches and pointed out the weak places in the walls. His counsel was taken, the walls fell down, the garrison, in weariness and despair, had lain down to sleep off their troubles, and no reproaches and blows could rouse them. August 15th, Gaspar de Villiers was forced to surrender on terms, as he believed, identical with those which Suleiman granted to the Knights of Rhodes. But Sinan was no Suleiman. Moreover, he was in a furious rage with the whole order. He put the garrison, all save a few, in chains and carried them off to grace his triumph at Stambul. Thus did Tripoli fall once more into the hands of the Muslims, 41 years after its conquest by the Count Don Pedro Navarro. The misfortunes of the Christians did not end here. Year after year the Ottoman fleet appeared in Italian waters, marshaled now by Sinan, and when he died, Piali Pasha, the Croat, but always with Dragut in the van. Year by year, the coasts of Apula and Calabria yielded up more and more of their treasure, their youth, and their beauty to the Muslim ravishers. Yet worse was in store. Unable as they felt themselves to cope with the Turks at sea, the powers of southern Europe resolved to strike one more blow on land and recover Tripoli. A fleet of nearly a hundred galleys and ships gathered from Spain, Genoa, the religion, the Pope, from all quarters, with the Duke de Medina Chile at the head, assembled at Messina. Doria was too old to command, but his kinsman, Giovanni Andrea, son of his loved and lost Giannettino, led the Genoese galleys. The fates seemed adverse from the outset. Five times the expedition put to sea, five times it was driven back by contrary winds. At last, on February 10, 1560, it was fairly away from the African coast. Here fresh troubles awaited it. Long delays in crowded vessels had produced their disastrous effects. Fevers and scurvy and dysentery were working their terrible ravages among the crews, and 2,000 corpses were flung into the sea. It was impossible to lay siege to Tripoli with a diseased army, and when actually in sight of their object, the admirals gave orders to return to Jerba. A sudden descent quickly gave them the command of the beautiful island. The Arab sheikh, whose people cultivated it, 
was as ready to pay tribute to the Spaniard as to the Corsair. Medina Chele and his troops accordingly set to work undisturbed at the erection of a fortress strong enough to baffle the besieging genius even of the Turks. In two months a strong castle was built with all scientific earthworks, and the admiral prepared to carry home such troops as were not needed for its defense. Unhappily for him, he had lingered too long. He had wished to see the defenses complete and had trusted to the usual practice of the Turks not to put to sea before May was advanced. He was about to prepare for departure when news came that the Turkish fleet had been seen at Goza. Instantly, all was panic. Valiant gentlemen forgot their valor, forgot their coolness, forgot how strong a force by sea or land they mustered. One thought alone was uppermost. The Turks were upon them. Giovanni Doria hurried on board and embarked his Genoese. Medina Cele, more methodically and with something like sang Freud, personally supervised the embarkation of his men. But before they could make out for the strait, where Dragut had so narrowly escaped capture, the dread corsair himself, Occhiali and Piali Pasha, were upon them. Then ensued a scene of confusion that baffles description. Despairing of weathering the north side of Jerba, panic-stricken Christians ran their ships ashore and deserted them, never stopping even to set them on fire. The deep draught galleons stuck fast in the shallow water. On rode the Turks. Galleys and galleos to the number of 56 fell into their hands. 18,000 Christians bowed down before their scimitars. The beach on that memorable 11th of May, 1560, was a confused medley of stranded ships, helpless prisoners, Turks busy in looting men in galleys, and a hideous heap of mangled bodies. The fleet and the army, which had sailed from Messina but three months ago in such gallant array, were absolutely lost. It was a dies nefas for Christendom. Medina Cele and young Dorio made good their escape by night, but when the old Genoese admiral learnt the terrible news, the loss of the fleet he loved, the defeat of the nephew he loved yet more, his dim eyes were wet. Take me to the church, he said, and he soon received the last consolations of religion. Long as he had lived, and many as had been the vicissitudes of his great career, he had willingly been spared this last miserable experience. On November 25, 1560, he gave up the ghost. He was a great seaman, but still more passionate lover of his country, despotic in his love, but not the less a noble Genoese patriot. End of chapter 12「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」「ヴァイオレンスの歌」The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J.D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 13. Chapter 13. The Knights of Malta, 1565. When Sultan Soliman reflected on the magnanimity which he had displayed toward the Knights of Rhodes and allowing them to depart in peace in 1522, his feelings must have resembled those of Doria when he thought of that inconsiderate release of Dragu in 1543. Assuredly, the royal clemency had been ill rewarded. The knights had displayed a singular form of gratitude to the sparer of their lives. They had devoted themselves to him, indeed, but devoted themselves to his destruction. The cavaliers whom Charles V suffered to perch on the glaring white rock of Malta in 1530 proved in no long time to be a pest as virulent and all-pervading as even Rhodes had harbored. Seven galleys they owned, and never more, but the seven were royal vessels, splendidly armed and equipped, and each a match for two or three Turkish ships. Every year they cruised from Sicily to the Levant, and many a prize laden with precious store they carried off to Malta. 
the commerce of Egypt and Syria was in danger of annihilation. The Barbary corsairs, even Dragoo himself, shunned a meeting with the red galleys of the religion, or their black capitana, and the Turkish fleet, while holding undisputed sway over the Mediterranean, was not nimble enough to surprise the Maltese squadron in its rapid and calculable expeditions. Jean de la Vallette Pareso, general of the galleys, and afterwards grand master, Francis of Lorraine, grand prior of France, Romagas, prince of knights errant, scoured the seas in search of prey. They were as true pirates as ever weathered the white squall. The knights lived by plunder as much as any corsair, but they tempered their freebooting with chivalry and devotions. They were the protectors of the helpless and afflicted, and they preyed chiefly upon the enemies of the faith. Meanwhile, they built and built. Fort St. Elmo rose on the central promontory. Forts St. Michael and St. Angelo were strengthened. Bastions were skillfully planned. Flanking angles devised, ravelins and cavaliers erected, ditches deepened, parapets raised, embrasures opened, and every device of 16th century fortification as practiced by Master Evangelista, chief engineer of the order, was brought into use. For the knights knew that Suleiman lived and was mightier than ever. Their cruisers had wrought sad havoc among his subjects and the sultan would not long suffer the hornets of Rhodes to swarm at Malta. They lived in constant expectation of attack, and they spent all their strength and all their money in preparing for the day of the sultan's revenge. At last the time came. Suleiman swore in his wrath that the miscreants should no longer defy him. He had suffered them to leave Rhodes as gentlemen of honor. He would consume them in Malta as one burns a nest of wasps. At the time of the siege of 1565, the city or fortress of Malta was situated not as Valletta now stands on the west, but on the east side of the Marsa or Great Harbor. To understand even the briefest narrative of one of the most heroic deeds of war that the world has seen, the position of the forts must be understood. See the plan. On the northern coast of the rocky island, a bold promontory or rugged tongue of land, Mount Saberus, separates two deep bights or inlets. The eastern of these was called Marsa Musse, or Middleport, but was unoccupied and without defenses at the time of the siege, except at the guns of St. Elmo, the fortress at the point of the Saberus promontory commanded its mouth. The Marsa Kebir, or simply La Marsa, the great port, was the chief stronghold of the knights. Here, four projecting spits of rock formed smaller harbors on the western side. The outermost promontory, the Pointe des Fourchets, separated the Porte de la Renelle, or La Arenella, from the open sea. Cape Salvador divided the Arenella from the English harbor. The Burg, the main fortress and capital of the place, with Fort Sant Angelo at its point, shot out between the English harbor and the harbor of the galleys, and the Isle of La Sangle, joined by a sandy isthmus to the mainland and crowned by Fort St. Michael, severed the galley harbor from that of La Sangle. All round these inlets high hills dominated the ports. Behind Fort St. Elmo, the Saberus climbed steeply to a considerable height. Behind the Aranella and the English harbor rose Mount Salvador, Calcara, and further back the heights of St. Catherine. The Burg and Fort St. Michael were overtopped by the heights of St. Margaret, whilst the Conradin Plateau looked down upon the head of the Marsa and the harbor of La Sango. To modern artillery and engineering, the siege would have been easy, despite the rocky hardness of the ground, since the knights had not had time to construct those field works upon the surrounding heights which were essential to the safety of the forts. Even to the skilled but undeveloped artillery of the Turks, the destruction of Malta ought not to have been either a difficult or lengthy operation, had they begun at the right place. To those who were acquainted with the ground, 
who had heard of the siege of Rhodes and knew that the Turks were not less but more formidable in 1565 than in 1522, the issue of the struggle must have appeared inevitable when the huge Ottoman fleet hove in view on the 18th of May, 1565. 180 vessels, of which two-thirds were galleys royal, carried more than 30,000 fighting men. The pick of the Ottoman army, tried janissaries in Sapahis, horsemen from Thrace, rough warriors from the mountains of Anatolia, eager volunteers from all parts of the Sultan's dominions, Mustafa Pasha, who had grown old in the wars of his master, commanded on land, and Piali was admiral of the fleet. Dragut was to join them immediately, and the Sultan's order was that nothing should be done till he arrived. The knights had not remained ignorant of the preparations that were making against them. They sent to all Europe for help, and the Pope gave money and Spain promises. The Viceroy of Sicily would send Spanish reinforcements by the 15th of June. They worked unceasingly at their defenses, and did all that men could do to meet the advancing storm. All told, they mustered but 700 knights, and between eight and 9,000 mercenaries of various nations, but chiefly Maltese, who could only be trusted behind walls. The order was fortunate in its Grand Master, Jean de Valette, born in 1494, a knight of St. John before he was of age, and a defender of Rhodes 43 years ago, though now an old man retained to the full the courage and generalship which had made his career as commander of the galleys memorable in the annals of Mediterranean wars. He had been a captive among the Turks, and knew their languages and their modes of warfare, and his sufferings had increased his hatred of the infidel. A tall, handsome man, with an air of calm resolution, he communicated his iron nerve to all his followers. Cold and even cruel in his severity, he was yet devoutly religious and passionately devoted to his order and his faith. A true hero, but of the reasoning, merciless, bigoted sort, not the generous, reckless enthusiast who inspires by sympathy and glowing example. When he knew that the day of trial was at a hand, Jean de Valette assembled the order together and bade them first be reconciled with God and one another, and then prepare to lay down their lives for the faith they had sworn to defend. Before the altar, each knight forswore all enmities, renounced all pleasures, buried all ambitions, and joining together in the sacred fellowship of the Supper of the Lord, once more dedicated their blood to the service of the cross. At the very outset, a grave mischance befell the Turks. Dragut was a fortnight late at the rendezvous. His voice would have enforced Piali's advice to land the entire force and attack the Berg and St. Michael from the heights behind. Mustafa the Saraskier was determined to reduce the outlying fort of St. Elmo on the promontory of Saberas before attacking the main position, and accordingly landed his men at his convenience from the Marsa Muset and laid out his earthworks on the land side of St. Elmo. He had not long begun when Ochiali arrived with six galleys from Alexandria, and on June 2nd came Dragut himself with a score or more galleys of Tripoli and Bona. Dragut saw at once the mistake that had been made, but saw also that to abandon the siege of St. Elmo would too greatly elate the knights. The work must go on, and on it went with unexampled zeal. The little fort could hold but a small garrison, but the fort was a corps d'élite. De Broglio of Piedmont commanded it with sixty soldiers, and was supported by Juan de Guaras, bailiff of the Negropont, a splendid old knight, followed by sixty more of the order, and some Spaniards under Juan de la Cerda, a few hundred of men to meet thirty thousand Turks, but men of no common metal. They had not long to wait. The fire opened from twenty-one guns on the last day of May, and continued with little intermission till June twenty-third. The besiegers were confident of battering down the little fort in a week at most, but they did not know their foes. As soon as one wall crumbled before the cannonade, a new work appeared behind it. The first assault lasted three hours, and the Turks gained possession of the ravelin in front of the gate. So furious was the onset that the defenders sent to the Grand Master to tell him the position was untenable. They could not stand a second storming party. 
La Valette replied that if so, he would come and withstand it himself. St. Elmo must be held to keep the Turks back till reinforcements arrived. So of course they went on. Dragut brought up some of his largest yards and laid them like a bridge across the fosse. And a tremendous struggle raged for five terrible hours on Dragut's bridge. Again and again Mustafa marshaled his janissaries for the attack, and every time they were hurled back with deadly slaughter. As many as four thousand Turks fell in a single assault. St. Elmo was little more than a heap of ruins, but the garrison still stood undaunted among the heaps of stones, each man ready to sell his life dearly for the honor of Our Lady and St. John. The Turks at last remedied the mistake they had made at the beginning. They had left the communication between St. Elmo and the harbor unimpeded, and reinforcements had frequently been introduced into the besieged fortress from the Berg. On June 17th, the line of circumvallation was pushed to the harbor's edge, and St. Elmo was completely isolated. Yet this prudent precaution was more than outweighed by the heavy loss that accompanied its execution. For Dragut was struck down while directing the engineers, and the surgeons pronounced the wound mortal. With the cool courage of his nation, Mustafa cast a cloak over the prostrate form and stood in Dragut's place. Five days later came the final assault. On the eve of June 23rd, after the cannonade had raged all the forenoon and a hand-to-hand -hand fight had lasted till the evening, when 2,000 of the enemy and 500 of the scanty garrison had fallen, the knights and their soldiers prepared for the end. They knew the Grand Master could not save them, that nothing could avert the inevitable dawn. They took the sacrament from each other's hands and, committing their souls to God, made ready to devote their bodies in the cause of His Blessed Son, it was a forlorn and sickly remnant of the proudest chivalry the world has ever known that met the conquering Turks that June morning. Worn and haggard faces, pale with long vigils and open wounds, tottering frames that scarce could stand, some even for very weakness seated in chairs with drawn swords within the breach. But weary and sick, upright or seated, all bore themselves with unflinching courage, and every set face was read the resolve to die hard. The ghastly struggle was soon over. The weight of the Turkish column bore down everything in its furious rush. Knights and soldiers alike rolled upon the ground, every inch of which they had disputed to the last drop of their blood. Not a man escaped. Dragut heard of the fall of St. Elmo as he lay in his tent dying and said his Moslem nunc dimittis with a thankful heart. He had been struck at the soldier's post of duty. He died with a shout of victory ringing in his ears, as every general would wish to die. His figure stands apart from all the men of his age, an admiral, the equal of Barbarossa, the superior of Doria, a general fit to marshal troops against any of the great leaders of the armies of Charles V. He was content with the eager rush of his life, and asked not for sovereignty or honors. Humane to his prisoners, a gay comrade, an inspiriting commander, a seaman every inch. Dragut is the most vivid and original personage among the corsairs. St. Elmo had fallen, but St. Angelo and St. Michael stood untouched. Three hundred knights of St. John and thirteen hundred soldiers had indeed fallen in the first, but its capture had closed the lives of eight thousand Turks. If the child has cost us so dear, said Mustafa, what will the parent cost? The Turkish general sent a flag of truce to La Valette to propose terms of capitulation, but in vain. Mutual animosity had been worked to a height of indignant passion by a barbarous massacre of prisoners on both sides, each in view of the other. The Grand Master's first impulse was to hang the messenger of such foes. He thought better of it, and showed him the depth of the ditch that encircled the twin forts. Let your janissaries come and take that he said, and contemptuously dismissed him. A new siege now began. The forts on the east of La Marsa had been sorely drained to fill up the gaps in the garrison at St. Elmo, and it was fortunate that Don Juan de Cardona had been able to send a reinforcement, though only of six hundred men, under Melchior de Robles to the old town, whence they contrived to reach Fort St. Michael in safety. Even six hundred men added materially to the difficulties of the siege, for be it remembered, six hundred men behind skillfully constructed fortifications may be worth six thousand in the open. It was very hard for the besiegers to find cover. The ground was hard rock, and cutting trenches was extremely arduous work, 
and the noise of the picks directed the fire of the forts by night upon the sappers. Nevertheless, by July 5th, four batteries were playing upon St. Michael from the heights of St. Margaret and Conradin, while the guns of Fort St. Elmo opened from the other side, and soon a line of cannon on Mount Salvador dominated the English port. An attempt to bring a flotilla of gunboats into the harbor of the galleys failed, after a vigorous conflict between a party of Turkish swimmers who strove with axes to cut the chain that barred the port, and some Maltese who swam to oppose them, sword and teeth. The battle in the water ended in the flight of the Turks. Ten distinct general assaults were delivered with all the fury of Janissaries against the stronghold. First, a grand assault by sea was ordered on July 15th. Three columns simultaneously advanced by night on Fort St. Michael. One landed in the Aranella and marched to attack the eastern suburb, La Bormula. The second came down from the heights of St. Margaret and made straight for the bastion defended by de Robles. The third advanced from Conradin on the southwest and assaulted the salient angle at the extreme point of the spit of land on which the fort was built. In vain, the Turks swarmed up the scaling ladders. Company after company was hurled down a huddled mass of mangled flesh, and the ladders were cast off. Again the escalade began. The knights rolled huge blocks of masonry on the crowded throng below. When they got within arm's reach, the scimitar was no match for the long two-handed swords of the Christians. At all three points, after a splendid attack, which called forth all the finest qualities of the magnificent soldiery of Suleiman the Great, the Turks were repulsed with terrible loss. The knights lost some of their bravest swords, and each one of them fought like a lion. But their dead were few compared with the unfortunate troops of Barbary, who had cut off their retreat by dismissing their ships, and were slaughtered or drowned in the harbor by hundreds. The water was red with their blood, and mottled with standards and drums and floating robes. Of prisoners the Christians spared but two, and these they delivered over to the mob to be torn in pieces. After the assault by water came the attack by mines, but the result was no better, for the knights were no novices in the art of countermining, and the attempt to push on after the explosion ended in rushing into a trap. Mustafa, however, continued to work underground and ply his heavy artillery, with hardly a pause, upon the two extremities of the line of landward defenses, the Bastion of de Robles and the Bastion of Castile. Both were in ruins by the 27th of July, as Salih Reyes, son of Barbarossa's old comrade, satisfied himself by a reconnaissance pushed into the very breach. An assault was ordered for midday of August 2nd, when the Christians were resting after the toils of the sultry morning. Six thousand Turks advanced in absolute silence to Melchior de Robles's bastion. They had almost reached their goal when the shout of the sentry brought that gallant knight readily awakened to the breach, followed by Munatones and three Spanish arquebusiers. These five warriors held twenty-six janissaries in Sapahis in check till reinforcements came, and they killed fifteen of them. Their valor saved the fort. Four hours longer the struggle lasted, till neither party could deal another blow in the raging August sun, and the Turks at last retired with a loss of six hundred dead. Nothing daunted, the 7th of August saw them once more scaling the walls and rushing the breaches of the two bastions, this time with nearly twenty thousand men. They poured over the ravelin, swarmed up the breach, and were on the point of carrying the fort. All was nearly lost, and at that supreme moment even the aged Grand Master, whose place was to direct not to imperil his life, came down to the front of battle and used his sword and pike like a common soldier. Eight long hours they fought. Six times came fresh reserves to the support of the Turks. The Christians were exhausted and had no reserves. One rush more and the place would be carried. Just then, a body of cavalry was seen riding down from the direction of the old town. The Turks took them to be the long-expected reinforcements from Sicily. They are seen to fall upon stray parties of Turks. They must be the advance guard of Philip's army. Piali, in alarm, runs to his galleys. The Turks, who had all but carried the long-contested bastion, pause in affright, lest they be taken in rear. In vain, Mustafa... In vain the king of Algiers shows them that the horsemen are but two hundred of the old town garrison, with no army at all behind them. Panic, unreasoning and fatal as ever, seizes upon the troops. The foothold, won after eight hours of furious fighting, is surrendered to a scare. Not a Turk stays to finish the victory. The lives of their two thousand dead need not have been sacrificed. Still Mustafa did not despair. 
He knew that the main defenses of the bastions had been destroyed. A few days more, a heavy cannonade, the explosion of a series of mines, which thousands of his sappers were preparing would, he was certain, ensure the success of a final assault. The day came, August 20th, and Mustafa himself, in his coat of inlaid mail and robe of cramoisy, led his army forward, but a well-directed fire drove him into a trench, whence he emerged and not till night covered its path. When at last he got back, he found his army in camp. Another assault had been repulsed. The next day they went up again to the fatal embrasures, and this time the failure was even more signal. Repeated repulses were telling on the spirits of the men, and the veteran janissaries went to their work with unaccustomed reluctance. Nevertheless, the trenches cut in the hard rock continued to advance slowly, and the cavalier behind the ravelin was taken after a severe struggle, just taken when Lavalette's mines blew the victorious assailants into the air. On the 30th, another well-planned assault was repelled. One more effort, a last and desperate attempt, was to be made on the 7th of September. But on the 5th, the news arrived that the Spanish Army of Relief had at length, after inconceivable delays and hesitations, actually landed on the island. The worn-out Turks did not wait to reconnoiter. They had borne enough. A retreat was ordered, the siege was abandoned, the works that had cost so much labor and blood were deserted, and there was a general stampede to the galleys. It is true they landed again when they learnt that the relieving army numbered but 6,000 men, but their strength was departed from them. They tried to fight the relieving army, and then again they ran for the ships. The Spaniards cut them down like sheep, and of all that gallant armament, scarce 5,000 lived to tell the tale of those terrible three months in Malta. No more moving sight can be imagined than the meeting of the newcome brethren of the order and their comrades of St. Michael's Fort, the worn remnant of the garrison all told was scarcely six hundred strong, and hardly a man was without a wound. The Grand Master and his few surviving knights looked like phantoms from another world. So pale and grisly were they, faint from their wounds, their hair and beard unkempt, their armor stained and neglected, as men must look who had hardly slept without their weapons for more than three memorable months. As they saw these gaunt heroes, the rescuers burst into tears. Strangers clasped hands and wept together with the same overpowering emotion that mastered relievers and relieved when Havelock and Colin Campbell led the Highlanders into Lucknow. Never surely had men deserved more nobly the homage of mankind. In all history there is no record of such a siege, of such a disproportion in the forces, of such a glorious outcome. The Knights of Malta, live forever among the heroes of all time. End of chapter 13. Recording by Buddha George, Loudoun County, Virginia, www.buddhageorge.icanvoice.com. Chapter 14 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Bennett The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J.D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole The failure of the Siege of Malta was a sensible rebuff, yet it cannot be said that it seriously injured the renown of the Turks in the Mediterranean. They had been resisted on land, they had not been beaten at sea. Nor could they look back on the terrible months of the siege without some compensating feeling of consolation. They had taken St. Elmo, and its fall had aroused general jubilation in every Muslim breast. The Moors of Granada went near to rising against the Spaniards on the mere report of this triumph of the Turkish arms. Though they had failed to reduce St. Michael, the cause was to be found, at least in part, in false alarm and an unreasoning panic. To be defeated by such warriors as the Knights of St. John was not a disgrace. Like the Highlanders in the Crimean War, these men were not so much soldiers in their opponents' eyes as veritable devils. And who shall contend against the legions of the jinn? Moreover, forced as they were to abandon the siege, had they not left the island a desert, its people reduced by half, its fortifications heaps of rubbish, its brave defenders a handful of invalids? So reasoned the Turks, and prepared for another campaign. They had lost many men, 
but more were ready to take their place. Their immense fleet was uninjured, and though Dragut was no more, Akiali, as the Christians called Ali al Iluji, the renegade, the Turks dubbed him Fartus, scurvied from his complaint, was following successful in his old master's steps. Born at Castelli in Calabria about 1508, Akiali was to have been a priest, but his capture by the Turks turned him to the more exciting career of a corsair. Soon after the siege of Malta, he succeeded Barbarossa's son Hassan as Pasha or Begelberg of Algiers, and one of his first acts was to retake Tunis, all but Goleta, in the name of Sultan Salim II, who, to the unspeakable loss of the Mohammedan world, had in 1566 succeeded his great father Suleiman. In July 1570, off Alicata on the southern coast of Sicily, Akiala surrounded four galleys of the religion. They then possessed but five and took three of them, including the flagship, which St. Clement, the general of the galleys, abandoned in order to throw himself and his treasure on shore at Montechiero. One galley alone, the St. Anne, made a desperate resistance. The others surrendered. Sixty knights or serving brothers of the order were killed or made prisoners on this disastrous day and so intense was the indignation in Malta that the Grand Master had much ado to save St. Clement from being lynched by the mob and was obliged to deliver him to the secular court, which at once condemned him to death. He was strangled in his cell and his body thrown in a sack into the sea. Such a success went far to atone for Mustafa Pasha's unfortunate siege. A far more important triumph awaited the Turks in 1570 and 71. A siege and a conquest. The new sultan, like his father, saw in the island of Cyprus a standing affront to his authority in the Levant. Then, as now, Cyprus was a vital center in all maritime wars in the eastern Mediterranean, a convenient depot for troops and stores, a watchtower whence the movements of the Turkish fleet could be observed, a refuge for the numberless Christian corsairs that infested the coast of Syria. Cyprus belonged to Venice, and on the score of her protection of piracy, the Sultan found no difficulty in picking a quarrel with the Senate. War was declared, and Piali Pasha transported a large army under Lala Mustafa, not the Seraxir who commanded at Malta, to lay siege to Nicosia, the capital of the island. After 48 days, the city fell, September 9th, and became a shambles. The catastrophe might have been averted had the Christian fleet owned a single competent chief, but unhappily the relief of Cyprus was entrusted to the least trustworthy of all instruments, a coalition. Pope Pius, a man of austere piety, full of the zeal of his high office and in energy and intellect a born leader, spared no effort to support the Venetians as soon as war became inevitable. Few of the states of Europe found it convenient to respond to his appeal, but Philip of Spain sent a numerous fleet under Giovanni Andrea Doria, and the Pope himself, aided in some degree by the Italian princes, added an important contingent, which he confided to the care of the Grand Constable of Naples, Mark Antony Colonna. Giovanni Zan commanded the Venetian fleet. The whole force, when united, amounted to no less than 206 vessels, of which 11 were galleasses and nearly all the rest galleys, while the soldiers and crews numbered 48,000 men. So dire was the dread then inspired by the Turks that this vast armament dared not move till it was known that Akiali had left the neighborhood of Italy, and even then the rivalries of the different admirals tended rather to war between the contingents than an attack upon the enemy's fleet. While the Christians were wrangling, and Doria was displaying the same Fabian caution that had led his grand-uncle to lose the battle of Preveza, Piali Pasha, wholly regardless of danger, had bared his galleys almost entirely of soldiers in order to aid Lala Mustafa in the final assault on Nicosia. Had the Allied fleets attacked him on the 8th or 9th of September, it is doubtful whether a single Turkish galley could have shown fight. But Colonna and Doria wasted their time in wrangling and discussing while the foe lay powerless at their feet. 
Finally, they sailed back to Sicily for fear of bad weather. Such were the admirals who furnished the jibes of Achiali and his brother corsairs. Famagusta surrendered August 4, 1571, and despite the promise of life and liberty, the garrison was massacred and the Venetian commander, Bragadino, cruelly burnt to death. Cyprus became a Turkish possession thenceforward to this day. Meanwhile, the Turkish and Barbary fleets commanded by Ali Pasha, the successor of Piali, and Akiali ravaged Crete and other islands, and coasting up the Adriatic, worked their will upon every town or village it suited their pleasure to attack. Thousands of prisoners and stores and booty of every description rewarded their industry. At length, in September, they anchored in the Gulf of Lepanto. They had heard that the United Christian fleets were on the move, and nothing would suit the victors of Cyprus better than a round encounter with the enemy. Flushed with success, they had no fear for the issue. Many a Christian fleet had gathered its members together before then in the waters of the Adriatic. The great battle off Preveza was in the memory of many an old sailor as the galleys came to the rendezvous in the autumn of 1571. But there was an essential difference between then and now. Preveza was lost by divided councils. At Lepanto there was but one commander-in-chief. Pope Pius V had labored unceasingly at the task of uniting the Allies and smoothing away jealousies and he had succeeded in drawing the navies of southern Europe on to another year's campaign. Then, warned by what he had learned of the wranglings off Cyprus, he exerted his prerogative as vicar of God, and named as the sole commander-in-chief of the whole fleet, Don John of Austria. Son of the most illustrious monarch of the age, Don John was born to greatness. His mother was the beautiful singer Barbara Blomberg, his father was Charles V. The one gave him grace and beauty, the other the genius of command. He was but twenty-two when his half-brother Philip confided to him the difficult task of suppressing the rebellion of the Moors and the Alpuares. Where the experienced veterans of Spain had failed, the beardless general of twenty-two succeeded to admiration. And now, two years later, he was called to the command of the whole navy of southern Europe. He accepted the post with joy. He had all the hopeful confidence of youth, and he longed to fight one of the world's great battles. His enthusiasm glowed in his face. One sees it in his portraits and on the medals struck to commemorate his victory. Squadron after squadron begins to crowd the Straits of Messina. Veniero, the Venetian admiral, is already there with 48 galleys and 60 more expected when Colonna enters, in July, with 18 vessels and moors alongside. Don John has not yet arrived. He has had much ado to get his squadron ready, for no nation understands better than the Spanish the virtue of the adage, Festina Lente. At last he puts off from Barcelona and laboriously crosses the Gulf of Lyons. One may smile now at the transit, but in those days, what with the mistral and the risk of corsairs, to cross the Gulf of Lyons was a thing to be thought about. At Genoa, Don John is entertained by G. Andrea Doria and attends a fancy ball in a gay humor that becomes his youth and buoyancy with all his perils still ahead. As he proceeds, he hears how the Turks are laying waste Dalmatia, and how the allies are quarreling at Messina, but he hastens not. He knows that a galley on a long voyage has as much a fixed pace as a horse, and that flogging is of no use except for a short course. At Naples, he reverently receives the standard blessing by His Holiness himself, and on August 23rd, he joins the fleet at Messina. Time is still needed for the other ships to come up and for the commander-in-chief to mature his plans. Before they start, each captain of a galley will have a separate written order, showing him his place during the voyage and his post in any engagement, whereby the risk of confusion and hasty marshalling is almost done away. On the 16th of September, the signal is given to weigh anchor. Don John is off first in his Rial, a splendid Capitina galley of 60 oars with a poop carved with allegorical designs by Vasquez of Seville. 
After him come 285 vessels comprising six galleasses and 209 galleys, carrying 29,000 men and commanded by the most famous names of the great families of Spain, Genoa, Venice, Naples, Rome, Vincenza, Padua, Savoy, and Sicily. Don Juan de Cardona leads the van with seven galleys. Don John himself, between Mark Antonio Colonna and Venero, commands the center of 62 large galleys. G.A. Doria has 50 in the right wing, Barbarigo of Venice, 53 in the left, Don Alvaro de Bazan commands the reserve of 30 galleys, the galleasses are ranged before the lines, each with 500 arquebusiers on board. After 10 days of rowing and sailing, they reach Corfu, and the castle greets them with thunders of joy guns, for the fear of the Turk is removed. Ali Pasha, hard by in the Gulf of Lepanto, sent out scouts to ascertain the enemy's strength. A bold Barbary corsair pushed his bark unseen by night among the Christian galleys, but his report was imperfect, and till the day of conflict neither side knew the exact strength of his opponent. The Turkish fleet numbered about 208 galleys and 66 galleos, and carried 25,000 men. Constantinople furnished 95 galleys, 21 from Alexandria, 25 from Anatolia, 10 from Rhodes, 10 from Mytilene, 9 from Syria, 12 from Napoli de Romania, 13 from Negropont, and 11 from Algiers and Tripoli. The galleos were chiefly Barbary vessels, more useful for piracy than a set battle. The two fleets unexpectedly came in sight of each other at 7 o'clock on the morning of October 7th, at a point just south of the Echinades, and between Ithaca and the Gulf of Patras or Lepanto. A white sail or two on the horizon was described by Don John's lookout on the main top, then sail after sail rose above the sea line, and the enemy came into full view. Don John quickly ran up a white flag, the signal of battle, and immediately the whole fleet was busily engaged in cluing up the sails to the yards and making all snug for the conflict. The central banks were removed to make room for the soldiers, and the slaves were served with meat and wine. Old seamen, who had met the Turks again and again from their youth up, prepared grimly for revenge. Sanguine boys, who held arms and set for fight for the first time that day, looked forward eagerly to the moment of action. Even to the last, the incurable vacillation of the Allied admirals was felt. They suggested a council of war. Don John's reply was worthy of him. The time for councils is past, he said. Do not trouble yourselves about aught but fighting. Then he entered his gig and went from galley to galley, passing under each stern, crucifix in hand, encouraging the men. His calm and confident mien and the charm of his address excited universal enthusiasm, and he was met on all hands with the response, Ready, sir and the sooner the better. Then Don John unfurled the blessed standard with the figure of the Savior, and falling on his knees, commanded his cause to God. About eleven o'clock a dead calm set in. The Turks shortened sail and took to their oars. In perfect order and with matchless speed and precision they formed in line of battle, while drums and fifes announced their high spirits. The Christian fleet was slower in falling into line, some of the galleys and most of the galleasses were behind hand. Don John let drop some pious oaths and sent swift vessels to hurry them up. At last they began to get into order. Barbarigo, the left guide, hugged the coast with the left wing. Don John, with the center, kept touch with him. But where was the right guide? Giovanni Doria, infected with the tactical vanity of his family, resolved to show these landsmen how a sailor can maneuver. Conceiving that Achiali, on the Ottoman left, was trying to outflank the Christian fleet, he bore out to sea in order to turn him. In vain, Don John sent to recall him. He had gone out of reach, and the battle had to be fought without the right wing. Doria's precious maneuvering went near to losing the day. 
The Ottoman fleet was marshaled in the same order as the Christian, except that there were no galleasses. The line of battle, nearly a mile long, was divided into center and right and left wing, and behind the center was the reserve. Mohammed Shalouk, called by Europeans Shirako, commanded the right wing, opposed to Barbarigo's left. Ali Pasha opposed Don John in the center. Akiali was over against the post where Doria should have been. Between the two lines stood forth the heavy galleasses, like great breakwaters, turning aside and dividing the flowing rush of the Ottoman galleys. The fire of these huge floating castles nearly caused a panic among the Turks, but they soon pulled past them, and a general melee ensued. And the Christian left, after a deadly struggle in which both Barbarigo and Sirocco lost their lives, the Turks were repulsed, and deprived of their chief, took to the shore, but not before the Christians had lost many galleys and a host of brave men. Soon after the left had been engaged, the center came into action. Ali Pasha made straight for Don John's Rial, and his beak rammed it as far in as the fourth bank of oars. Close by were Pertev Pasha and the Capitanas of Colonna and Venero. The ships became entangled and formed one large platform of war. Twice the Spaniards of the Rial boarded the finale of Ali Pasha as far as the main mast, and twice they were driven back with terrible loss. Ali himself was preparing to leap upon Don John's galley when Colonna rammed him on the poop. Penetrating as far as the third oar and delivering a withering fire from his arquebusiers. The Christians had all the advantage of armor and firearms and fired behind bulwarks. The Turks were unprotected by curis or helmet or bulwark, and most of them had bows instead of guns. Colonna's volleys decided the fate of the finale, and Ali Pasha departed this life. An hour and a half had sufficed to disperse the Ottoman right and to overpower the flagship in chief. When the fleet saw the Christian ensign at the peak of the Turkish Capitana, they redoubled their efforts. Venero, severely wounded, still fought with the Siroxir Pertev Pasha, the Turks fled, and Pertev took to the land. In half an hour more, Don John's center was completely victorious. Then a new danger arose. Akiali, seeing that Doria was well away to sea, sharply doubled back with all the right wing and bore down upon the exhausted center. He rushed upon the Capitana of Malta and massacred every soul on board. Dragut is avenged. Juan de Cordona hastened to the rescue, and of his 500 soldiers but 50 escaped on the Fiorenza. 17 men alone remained alive and other terrible losses were incurred in the furious encounter. Upon this, the ingenious Doria perceived that he had outwitted only his own cause and at last turned back. The Marquise de Santa Cruz was already upon the enemy. Don John was after him with twenty galleys. Achiali was outnumbered and, after a brilliant effort, made off in all haste for Santa Mora, bearing with him the standard of the religion to be hung up in St. Sophia. The Battle of Lepanto is fought and won. The Turks have been utterly vanquished. Well might the good Pope cry, as the preacher cried in St. Stephen's a century later when Sobieski saved Vienna. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The Turkish fleet was almost annihilate. 190 galleys were captured, besides galleos, and 15 more burnt or sunk. Probably 20,000 men had perished, including an appalling list of high dignitaries from all parts of the empire. The Christians lost 7,500 men, including many of the most illustrious houses of Italy and Spain. Cervantes, who commanded a company of soldiers on board the Marquesa, fortunately escaped with a wound in his left arm, and to many the Battle of Lepanto is familiar only from the magical pages of Don Quixote. Seventeen Venetian commanders were dead, and among them Vincenzo Corini and the valiant, chivalrous, and venerable Prevedator Barbarigo. Sixty knights of the diminished order of St. John had given up the ghost. Twelve thousand Christian slaves were freed from the Ottoman galleys. The brilliant young conqueror did not wear his well-earned laurels long. His statue was erected at Messina, 
His victory was the subject of Tintoret and Titian. He was received with ovations wherever he went. Two years later, he recaptured Tunis. Then he was employed in the melancholy task of carrying on Alva's detestable work in Flanders. He inflicted a sanguinary defeat upon the Dutch at Gembleu, and then, struck down by fever, the young hero died on October 1, 1578, in his thirty-first year, the last of the great figures of medieval chivalry, a knight worthy to have been commemorated in the Charlemagne Gestes, and to have sat at Arthur's round table with Sir Galahad himself. End of chapter 14. Recording by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 15 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Bennett. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J.D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. The General of the Galleys, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. The age of the great corsairs may be said to have ended with the Battle of Lepanto, which sounded the knell of the naval supremacy of the Ottomans. It is true that they seem to have lost little by Don John's famous victory. Their beard was shorn, they admitted, but it soon grew again. Their fleet was speedily repaired, and the Venetians sued for peace. But they had lost something more precious to them than ships or men. Their prestige was gone. The powers of Christendom no longer dreaded to meet the invincible Turk, for they had beaten him once and would beat him again. Rarely after this did an Ottoman fleet sail proudly to work its devastating way along the coasts of Italy. Small raids there might be, but seldom a great adventure such as Barbarossa or Sinan led. Crete might be besieged for years, but the Venetians, pressed by land, nevertheless shattered the Turkish ships off the coast. Damad Ali might recover the Moria and victoriously surround the shores of Greece with his hundred sail, but he would not venture to threaten Venice, to lay siege to Nice, to harry Naples, or attack Malta. The Turks had enough to do to hold their own in the Black Sea against the encroaching forces of Russia. Deprived of the protection which the prestige of the Turks had afforded, the Barbary Corsairs degenerated into petty pirates. They continued to waylay Christian cargoes, to ravish Christian villages, and carry off multitudes of captives, but their depredations were not on the same grand scale. They robbed by stealth and never invited a contest with ships of war. If caught, they would fight, but their aim was plunder and they had no fancy for broken bones gained out of mere ambition of conquest. Akiali was the last of the great corsairs. He it was who, on his return to Constantinople after the fatal October 7, 1571, cheered the sultan with the promise of revenge, was made Captain Pasha, and sailed from the Bosphorus the following year with a fleet of 230 vessels, just as though Lepanto had never been fought and lost. He sought for the Christian fleets, but could not induce them to offer battle. His operations in 1574 were limited to the recapture of Tunis, which Don John had restored to Spain in 1573. With 250 galleys, 10 galleasses, and 30 caramuzels, and supported by the Algerine squadron under Ahmad Pasha, Akiali laid siege to the Goleta, which had owned a Spanish garrison ever since the conquest by Charles V in 1535. Cervellan defended the fort till he had but a handful of men and finally surrendered to discretion. Then Akiali disappeared from the western seas. He fought for his master in the Uxine during the Persian War and died in 1580, aged 72, with the reputation of the most powerful admiral that had ever held sway in the Golden Horn. We have not closely followed the succession of the Pashas or the Begelbergs of Algiers, because more important affairs absorbed the whole energies of the Turkish galleys, and the rulers on land had little of consequence to do. Akiali was the 17th Pasha of Algiers, but of his predecessors, after the deaths of Eurij and Karadin Barbarossa, few attained special eminence. 
Hassan, the son of Barbarossa, took part in the siege of Malta. Sali Reyes conquered Fez and Bugia, but the rest were chiefly occupied with repressing internal dissensions, fighting with their neighbors, and organizing small practical expeditions. After Akiali had been called to Stamboul as Captain Pasha in 1572, when he had been Pasha of Algiers for four years, nine governors succeeded one another in 24 years. At first they were generally renegades, Ramadan the Sardinian, Hassan the Venetian, Jafar the Hungarian, and Memi the Albanian followed one another, and with the exception of the Venetian, proved to be wise, just, and clement rulers. Then the too usual practice was adopted of allotting the province to the highest bidder, and rich but incompetent or rascally Turks bought the reversion of the Pashalik. The reign of the renegades was over, the Turks kept the government in their own hands, and the role of the ex-Christian adventurers was confined to the minor but more enterprising duties of a corsair reis or the general of the galleys. The pashas, and afterwards the days, with occasional exceptions, gave up commanding piratical expeditions, and the interest of the history now turns upon the captains of galleys. Piracy without and bloodshed and anarchy within form the staple of the records. Tunis, Tripoli, and Algiers showed very similar symptoms. Tripoli was the least powerful and therefore the least injurious. Algiers dominated the western Mediterranean and to a considerable extent the Atlantic. Tunis, less venturesome but still formidable, infested the eastern Mediterranean and made the passage of Malta and the Adriatic its special hunting grounds. At Tunis, thirty days, appointed by the sublime port, succeeded one another from 1590 to 1705, giving each an average reign of less than four years. Most of them were deposed, many murdered, and one is related on credible authority to have been torn to pieces and devoured by the enraged populace. In 1705, the soldierly, following the example of Algiers, elected their own governor and called him Bey, and the port was obliged to acquiesce. Eleven Bays followed one another up to the French protectorate. The external history of these three centuries is made up of lawless piracy and the levying of blackmail from most of the trading powers of Europe, accompanied by acts of insufferable insolence towards the foreign representatives, all of which was accepted submissively by kings and governments, insomuch that William III treated a flagrant corsair, Ali Reyes, who had become Dey, with the courtesy due to a monarch, and signed himself his loving friend. The earliest English treaty with Tunis was dated 1662. Many more followed, and all were about equally inefficacious. Civil anarchy, quarrels with France, and wars with Algiers generally stopped by order of the helpless port fill up the details of this uninteresting canvas. Precisely the same picture is afforded by the modern annals of Algiers. Take the days at the beginning of the 18th century. Hassan Chawash was deposed in 1700 and succeeded by the Aga of the Sepahis, Mustafa, nicknamed Bogatillos or Whiskerandos, who, though something of a coward, engaged in two successful campaigns against Tunis and one with Morocco, until he had the misfortune to find the bowstring round his throat in 1706. Hussein Koja followed, and Iran fell during his one year's reign, after which he was banished to the mountains and died. Bektas Koja, the next day, was murdered on his judgment seat in the third year of his reign. A fifth day, Ibrahim Deli, or the fool, made himself so hated by his unconscionable licentiousness that he was assassinated and his mutilated body exposed in the street within a few months. And Ali, who succeeded in 1710 by murdering some 3,000 Turks, contrived to reign eight years and by some mistake died in his bed. The Kingdom of Morocco is not strictly a Barbary state, and its history does not belong to this volume. Nevertheless, the operations of the Morocco pirates outside the Straits of Gibraltar so closely resemble those of the Algerine corsairs within that a few words about them will not be out of place. At one time, Tetwan, 
within the straits, in spite of its exposed haven, was a famous place for rovers, but its prosperity was destroyed by Philip II in 1564. Ceuta was always semi-European, half Genoese, then Portuguese, and finally Spanish. Tangiers, as the dowry of Charles II's queen, Catherine of Portugal, was for some time English territory. Spanish forts at Penan de Velez de la Gomera and Alhusimus and Portuguese garrisons repressed piracy in their vicinity, and in later times, Saleh was perhaps the only port in Morocco that sent forth buccaneers. Reefs of rocks and drifts of sand render the west coast unsuitable for anchorage, and the roads are unsafe when the wind is in the southwest. Consequently, the piracy of Saleh, though notorious and dreaded by merchantmen, was on a small scale. Large vessels could not enter the harbor, and 200-ton ships had to be lightened before they could pass the bar. The cruisers of Saleh were therefore built very light and small, with which they did not dare to attack considerable and well-armed ships. Indeed, Captain Delgarno and his 20-gun frigate so terrified the Saleh rovers that they never ventured forth while he was about, and mothers used to quiet naughty children by saying that Delgarno was coming for them, just as Napoleon and Malbrook were used as bugbears in England and France. There was not a single full-sized galley at Saleh in 1634, and accounts a hundred years later agree that the Salé rovers had but insignificant vessels, and very few of them, while their docks were practically disused, in spite of abundance of timber. In the latter part of the 18th century, there seems to have been an increase in the depredations of the Salé pirates, which probably earned them their exaggerated reputation. At that time, they had vessels of 30 and 36 guns, but unwieldy and badly built, with which they captured provincial ships and did considerable mischief, till the Chevalier Acton in 1773, with a single Tuscan frigate, destroyed three out of their five ships. About 1788, the whole Morocco navy consisted of six or eight frigates of 200 tons, armed with 14 to 18 six-pounders and some galleys. The rovers of Saleh formed at one time a sort of republic of pirates, paying the emperor a tithe of prize money and slaves in return for non-interference. But gradually the government absorbed most of the profits and the trade declined, till the emperors, in return for rich presents, concluded treaties with the chief maritime powers and to a large extent suppressed piracy. Turning from the monotonous records of internal barbarism, the more adventurous side of Algerine history claims a brief notice. Among the captains who continued to make the name of Corsair terrible to Christian ears, Murad Race holds the foremost place, indeed. He belongs to the order of great Corsairs. There were several of the name, and this Murad was distinguished as the Great Murad. He was an Arnot, or Albanian, who was captured by an Algerine pirate at the age of twelve and early showed a turn for adventure. When his patron was engaged at the Siege of Malta in 1565, young Murad gave him the slip and went on a private cruise of his own, in which he contrived to split his gallio upon a rock. Undeterred by this misadventure, as soon as he got back to Algiers, he set out in a brigantine of fifteen banks and speedily brought back three Spanish prizes and 140 Christians. He was with Akiali when the eminent rover seized St. Clement's galleys and was with difficulty restrained from anticipating his admiral in boarding the St. Anne. He soon gained the reputation of a corsair of the first water and a person who, for our sins, did more harm to the Christians than any other. In 1578, while cruising about the Calabrian coast with eight galleos in search of prey, he sighted the Capitana of Sicily and a consort with the Duke of Tierra Nuova and his retinue on board. After a hot pursuit, the consort was caught at sea. The flagship ran on shore. The Duke and all the ship's company deserted her, and the beautiful vessel was safely brought to Algiers Harbor. In 1585, Murad ventured out into the Atlantic out of sight of land, which no Algerine had ever dared to do before, and picking up a reinforcement of small brigantines at Saleh, descended at daybreak upon Lanzarote, one of the Canary Islands. 
sacked the town without opposition, and carried off the governor's family and 300 captives. This done, he unblushingly ran up a flag of truce and permitted the count and the chief families to come on board and buy back their relations. In 1589, after picking up a stray trader or two, he fell in with La Serena, a galley of Malta, which had a Turkish prize in tow. Far from shirking a conflict with so formidable an antagonist, Murad gave hot pursuit with his single galleo, and coming up with the Serena, boarded and mastered her in half an hour. Then, after stopping to arrest the misdoings of a Majorcan pirate who was poaching on his own private manor, the corsair carried his prizes into Algiers, where he was honorably mounted on the Pasha's own horse and escorted in triumph to the palace by a guard of Janissaries. In 1594, when he had attained the dignity of General of the Algerine Galleys, Murad, with four galleos, encountered two Tuscan galleys off Tripoli. Lowering the masts of two of his galleos so that they should escape observation, he towed them behind the other two, and when the Tuscans had drawn near in full expectation of a couple of prizes, he loosed the vessels astern, and with all four bore down upon the enemy. Both galleys were taken, and the Florentine knights and soldiers were chained to the oars in place of the Turks who had lately sat there. No more typical example of the later sort of pirate can be cited than Al Pichinin, general of the galleys and galleons of Algiers in the middle of the 17th century. This notable slaver, without Barbarossa's ambition or nobility, possessed much of his daring and seamanship. In 1638, Emboldened by the successes of the Sultan Murad IV against the Persians, Ali put to sea and, picking up some Tunisian galleys at Bizerta, set sail with a squadron of sixteen for the east coast of Italy. He sacked the district of Nicotra in Apilia, carrying off great spoils and many captives, not sparing even nuns, and then scoured the Adriatic, took a ship in sight of Cotero, and picked up every stray vessel that could be found. Upon this, a strong Venetian squadron under Marino Capello sallied forth and compelled the corsairs to seek shelter under the guns of the Turkish fortress of Valona in Albania. In spite of the peace then subsisting between Venice and the port, Capello attacked, and the fortress naturally defended the refugees. The corsairs were obliged to land, and then Capello, carried away by his zeal and in contravention of his orders, sent in his galleos and, after a sharp struggle, towed away the whole Barbary squadron, leaving Ali and his unlucky followers amazed upon the beach. For this bold stroke, Capello was severely reprimanded by the Senate, and the port was consoled for the breach of treaty by a dozer of 500,000 ducats. But meanwhile, the better part of the Algerine galley fleet had ceased to exist, and owners and captains were bankrupt. It was small consolation that in the same summer an expedition to the north, piloted by a renegade from Iceland, brought back 800 of his unfortunate countrymen to exchange the cold of their native land for the Bagnios of Algiers. In 1641, however, the Corsairs had recovered from their losses, and Ali Pichinin could boast a fleet of at least 65 vessels, as we have it on the authority of Emmanuel Aranda, who was his slave at the time. The wealth and power of the general of the galleys were then at their zenith. 600 slaves were nightly locked up in his prison, which afterwards was known as the Khan of Ali Pichinin, and in Morgan's time was noted for its grapevines which covered the walls and fringed the windows with luscious fruit up to the top story. The son of a renegade himself, he liked not that his followers should turn Turk upon his hands, which was but picking his pocket of so much money to give a disciple of Mohammed, for whom he was remarked to have no extraordinary veneration. He had actually cudgeled a Frenchman out of the name Mustafa, which he had assumed with a Turkish dress, into that of John, which he would fain have renounced. His farms and garden houses were also under the direction of his own Christians. I have heard much discourse of an entertainment he once made at his garden for all the chief armadors and corsairs at which the pasha was also a guest, but found his own victuals as fearing some foul play, 
nothing of which is ill taken among the Turks. All was dressed at town and in the general's own kitchen, and passed along from hand to hand by his slaves up to the garden house, above two miles distant, where as much of the victuals as got safe thither arrived smoking hot, as they tell the story. A good part, however, disappeared on the road, since, in Corsair's phrase, the Christian slaves wore hooks on their fingers, and the guests went night to be starved. Ali's plan for feeding his slaves was characteristic. He gave them no loaves as others did, but told them they were indeed a sorry set of scoundrels, unworthy of the name of slaves, if, during the two or three hours of liberty they enjoyed before sunset, they could not find enough to keep them for a day. His bagnios used to be regular auction rooms for stolen goods, and were besieged by indignant victims who were reproached for their carelessness and made to repurchase their own valuables. In fine, Ali Pachinin has the honor of having trained up the cleanest set of thieves that were anywhere to be met with. Once a slave found a costly ring of the general's and restored to him without price, for which unseasonable piece of honesty Ali gave him half a ducat and called him a fool for his pains. The ring was worth his ransom. Another time, a slave bargained to sell to an iron master the general's anchor from out of his own galley. When discovered, he was commended for his enterprising spirit and told he was fit to be a slave since he knew how to gain his living. The slave dealer had a genius for wheedling the truth out of captives. He was so civil and sympathizing when a new prize was caught, so ready with his count and my lord to plain gentlemen and his your eminence to simple clergymen that they soon confided in him, revealed their rank, and had their ransom fixed. But, to do him justice, he kept his word, and once promised the release was certain, my word is my word, he would say. He was a man of very free views in religion. Once he asked a Genoese priest to tell him candidly what would become of him, frankly, said Father Angelo, I am persuaded that the devil will have you, and the response was cheerfully accepted. Another time it was a devout Muslim sheikh who begged Ali to give him a Christian slave to kill, as he did not feel that he had offered any sufficiently pleasing sacrifice to the Prophet Muhammad. Ali unchained the stroke oar of his galley, a muscular Spaniard, and armed him at all points and sent him to be killed by the holy man. The Christian, shrieked the good sheikh, running as hard as he could, looks as if he rather wanted to kill me than be killed himself. So is it, said Ali, that you are to merit the Prophet's favor. Thus it is that Christians are to be sacrificed. Mohammed was a brave, generous man, and never thought it any service done him to slaughter those who were not able to defend themselves. Go, get yourself better instructed in the meaning of the Koran. He was a thorough corsair, with the rough coat of honor, as well as the unprincipled rascality of the sea rover. End of chapter 15. Recording by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 16 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Theoden Humphrey. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J.D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 16 Galleys and Galley Slaves. 16th century. The corsairs, says Hado, are among those who support themselves by continual sea robberies, and, admitting that among their numbers some of them are natural Turks, Moors, etc., yet the main body of them are renegados from every part of Christendom, all who are extremely well acquainted with the Christian coasts. It is a singular fact that the majority of these plunderers of Christians were themselves born in the faith. In the long list of Algerine viceroys, we meet with many a European. Barbarossa himself was born in Lesbos, probably of a Greek mother. His successor was a Sardinian. Soon afterwards, a Corsican became Pasha of Algiers. Then another Sardinian. Ochiali was a Calabrian. Ramadan came from Sardinia and was succeeded by a Venetian, who in turn gave place to a Hungarian who made room for an Albanian. 
In 1588, the 35 galleys, or galliots, of Algiers were commanded by 11 Turks and 24 renegades, including nations of France, Venice, Genoa, Sicily, Naples, Spain, Greece, Calabria, Corsica, Albania, and Hungary, and a Jew. In short, up to nearly the close of the 16th century, but much more rarely afterwards, the chiefs of the corsairs and the governors were commonly drawn from Christian lands. Some of them volunteered, and to the outlaws of Europe the command of a Barbary galley was perhaps the only congenial resort. But most of them were captives seized as children and torn from their homes in some of the corsairs' annual raids upon Corsica and Sardinia and the Italian or Dalmatian coasts. Most of such prisoners were condemned to menial and other labor, unless ransomed. But the bolder and handsomer boys were often picked out by the penetrating eye of the Reyes, and once chosen, the young captive's career was established. While the Christians with their galleys are at repose, sounding their trumpets in the harbors, and very much at their ease regaling themselves, passing the day and night in banqueting, cards, and dice, the corsairs, at pleasure, are traversing the east and west seas, without the least fear or apprehension, as free and absolute sovereigns thereof. Nay, they roam them up and down no otherwise than do such as go in chase of hares for their diversion. They here snap up a ship laden with gold and silver from India, and there another richly fraught from Flanders. Now they make prize of a vessel from England, then of another from Portugal. Here they board and lead away one from Venice, then one from Sicily, and a little further on they swoop down upon others from Naples, Livorno, or Genoa, all of them abundantly crammed with great and wonderful riches, and at other times carrying with them as guides renegados, of which there are in Algiers vast numbers of all Christian nations, nay, the generality of the corsairs are no other than renegados, and all of them exceedingly well acquainted with the coasts of Christendom, and even within the land. They very deliberately, even at noonday, or indeed just when they please, leap ashore and walk on without the least dread and advance into the country ten, twelve, or fifteen leagues or more. And the poor Christians, thinking themselves secure, are surprised unawares. Many towns, villages, and farms sacked, and infinite numbers of souls, men, women, children, and infants at the breast, dragged away into a wretched captivity. With these miserable, ruined people, loaded with their own valuable substance, they retreat leisurely, with eyes full of laughter and content to their vessels. In this manner, as is too well known, they have utterly ruined and destroyed Sardinia, Corsica, Sicily, Calabria, the neighborhoods of Naples, Rome, and Genoa, all the Balearic Islands, and the whole coast of Spain, in which last, more particularly, they feast it as they think fit, on account of the Moriscos who inhabit there, who, being all more zealous Mohammedans than are the very Moors born in Barbary, they receive and caress the corsairs, and give them notice of whatever they desire to be informed of insomuch that before these corsairs have been absent from their abodes much longer than perhaps twenty or thirty days, they return home rich, with their vessels crowded with captives and ready to sink with wealth, in one instant and with scarce any trouble, reaping the fruits of all that the avaricious Mexican and greedy Peruvian have been digging from the bowels of the earth with such toil and sweat." and the thirsty merchant with such manifest perils has for so long been scraping together, and has been so many thousand leagues to fetch away, either from the east or west, with inexpressible danger and fatigue. Thus they have crammed most of the houses, the magazines, and all the shops of this den of thieves, 
with gold, silver, pearls, amber, spices, drugs, silks, cloths, velvets, etc., whereby they have rendered this city the most opulent in the world, insomuch that the Turks call it, not without reason, their India, their Mexico, their Peru. Footnote, Hado, quoted by Morgan, 593 to 594. End footnote. One has some trouble in realizing the sort of navigation employed by corsairs. We must disabuse our minds of all ideas of tall masts straining under a weight of canvas, sail above sail. The corsairs' vessels were long, narrow rowboats, carrying indeed a sail or two, but depending for safety and movement mainly upon the oars. The boats were called galleys, galliots, brigantines, galeotas ligeras o vergatines, or frigatas, etc., according to their size. A galliot is a small galley, while a brigantine may be called a quarter galley. The number of men to each oar varies, too, according to the vessel's size. A galley may have as many as four to six men working side by side to each oar, a galliot but two or three, and a brigantine one. But in so small a craft as the last, each man must be a fighter as well as an oarsman, whereas the larger vessels of the corsairs were rowed entirely by Christian slaves. The galley is the type of all these vessels, and those who are curious about the minutest details of building and equipping galleys need only consult Master Joseph Furtenbach's Architectura Navalis, Das ist von dem Schiffgebau auf dem Meer und Seekusten zu gebrauchen, printed in the town of Ulm in the Holy Roman Empire by Jonam Sauern in 1629. Anyone could construct a galley from the numerous plans and elevations and sections and finished views, some of which are here reproduced, in this interesting and precise work. Footnote. Hardly less valuable is Admiral Jurien de la Gravière's Le Dernier Jour de la Marine à Rame, Paris, 1885. It contains an admirable account of the French galley system, the mode of recruiting, discipline, and general management, a description of the different classes of vessels, and their manner of navigation, while a learned appendix of over 100 pages describes the details of galley building, finishing, fitting, and rigging, and everything that the student need wish to learn. The chapters 9 and 10 on Navigation à la Rame and Navigation à la Voile are particularly worth reading by those who would understand 16th and 17th century seamanship. End footnote. Furtenbach is an enthusiastic admirer of a ship's beauties, and he had seen all varieties, for his trade took him to Venice, where he had a galleas. Footnote. A galleas was originally a large, heavy galley, three-masted and fitted with a rudder since its bulk compelled it to trust to sails as well as oars. It was a sort of transition ship between the galley and the galleon, and as time went on, it became more and more of a sailing ship. It had high bulwarks with loopholes for muskets, and there was at least a partial cover for the crew. The Portuguese galleys in the Spanish Armada mounted each 110 soldiers and 222 galley slaves, but the Neapolitan galleasses carried 700 men, of whom 130 were sailors, 270 soldiers, and 300 slaves of the oar. Jurien de la Gravière, Le Dernier Jour de la Marine à Rame, 65-67. End footnote. And he had doubtless viewed many a corsair fleet, since he could remember the Battle of Lepanto and the death of Occhiali. His zeal runs clean away with him when he describes a stolo, or great flagship, Capitania Galea, of Malta in her pomp and dignity and lordliness, as she rides the seas to the rhythmical beat of her many oars, or easies with every blade suspended motionless above the waves, like the wings of a poised falcon. A galley such as this is a princely, nay, a royal and imperial vassello de remo, and much the most suitable, he adds, for the uses of peace and of war in the Mediterranean Sea. A galley may be 180 or 190 spans long. Fürtenbach measures a ship by palmi, which varied from 9 to 10 inches in different places in Italy, 
say 150 feet, the length of an old 74 frigate, but with hardly a fifth of its cubit contents, and its greatest beam is 25 spans broad. The one engraved on page 37 is evidently an admiral's galley of the Knights of Malta. She carries two masts, the albero maestro, or mainmast, and the trinchetto, or foremast, each with a great latin sail. The Genoese and Venetians set the models of these vessels, and the Italian terms were generally used in all European navigation till the northern nations took the lead in sailing ships. These sails are often clued up, however, for the mariner of the 16th century was ill-practiced in the art of tacking, and very fearful of losing sight of land for long, so that unless he had a wind fair astern, he preferred to trust to his oars. A short deck at the prow and poop serve the one to carry the fighting men and trumpeters and yardsmen, and to provide cover for the four guns, the other to accommodate the knights and gentlemen, and especially the admiral or captain, who sits at the stern under a red damask canopy, embroidered with gold, surveying the crew, surrounded by the chivalry of the religion, whose white cross waves on the taffety standard over their head, and shines upon various pennants and burgees aloft. Behind, overlooking the roof of the poop, stands the pilot, who steers the ship by the tiller in his hand. Between the two decks, in the ship's waist, is the propelling power, 54 benches or banks, 27 aside, supporting each four or five slaves, whose whole business in life is to tug at the 54 oars. This flagship is a Christian vessel, so the rowers are either Turkish and Moorish captives or Christian convicts. If it were a corsair, the rowers would all be Christian prisoners. In earlier days, the galleys were rowed by freemen, and so late as 1500, the Moors of Algiers pulled their own brigantines to the attack of Spanish villages. But their boats were light, and a single man could pull the oar. Two or three were needed for a galliot, and as many sometimes as six for each oar of a large galley. It was impossible to induce freemen to toil at the oar, sweating close together for hour after hour, not sitting, but leaping on the bench, in order to throw their whole weight on the oar. Think of six men chained to a bench, naked as when they were born, one foot on the stretcher, the other on the bench in front, holding an immensely heavy oar, 15 feet long, bending forwards to the stern with arms at full reach to clear the backs of the rowers in front, who bend likewise, and then, having got forward, shoving up the oar's end to let the blade catch the water, then throwing their bodies back onto the groaning bench. A galley oar sometimes pulls thus for 10, 12, or even 20 hours, without a moment's rest. The boatswain or other sailor, in such a stress, puts a piece of bread steeped in wine in the wretched rower's mouth to stop fainting, and then the captain shouts the order to redouble the lash. If a slave falls exhausted upon his oar, which often chances, he is flogged till he is taken for dead, and then pitched unceremoniously into the sea. Footnote, so says Jean Martel de Bergerac, a galley slave about 1701, quoted by Admiral Gérien de la Gravière, Dernier Jour de la Marine à Rame, 13. End footnote. Those who have not seen a galley at sea, especially in chasing or being chased, cannot well conceive the shock such a spectacle must give to a heart capable of the least tincture of commiseration. To behold ranks and files of half-naked, half-starved, half-tanned, meager wretches, chained to a plank, from whence they remove not for months together, commonly half a year, urged on, even beyond human strength, with cruel and repeated blows on their bare flesh, to an incessant continuation of the most violent of all exercises, and this for whole days and nights successively, which often happens in a furious chase, when one party, like vultures, 
is hurried on almost as eagerly after their prey as is the weaker party hurried away in hopes of preserving life and liberty. Footnote, Morgan 517. End footnote. Sometimes a galley slave worked as long as 20 years, sometimes for all his miserable life, at this fearful calling. The poor creatures were chained so close together in their narrow bench, a sharp cut was the characteristic of the galley, that they could not sleep at full length. Sometimes seven men, on French galleys too in the last century, had to live and sleep in a space ten feet by four. The whole ship was a sea of hopeless faces. And between the two lines of rowers ran the bridge, and on it stood two bosuns, comiti, armed with long whips, which they laid onto the bare backs of the rowers with merciless severity. Furtenbach gives a picture of the two bosuns in grimly humorous verse, how they stand be clad, be laced, be trimmed, with many knots bespick, embroidered, padded, tied, all feathers and all flap, curly and cued, equipped, curious of hood and cap. And how they ever stolidly smite the crew with a bastinado, or give them a backward prod in the naked flesh as they ply, with the point that pricks like a goad, when powder and shot is the cry, in order to send the Turks to Davy's wet locker. As John of Austria nipped them and riddled them with ball, as soon as his eyes fell on them and ducked or slaughtered them all. And how the boatswain's dreaded whistle shrieked through the ship. For they hearkened to such a blast through all the swish and sweat, through rattle and rumpus and raps, and the kicks and cuffs that they get, through the chatter and tread and the rudder's wash and the dismal clank of the shameful chain which forever binds the slave to the bank. To this may be added Captain Pantero Pantera's description of the boatswain's demeanor. He should appear kindly towards the crew, assist it, pet it, but without undue familiarity, be, in short, its guardian, and in some sort its father, remembering that, when all's said, tis human flesh, and human flesh in direst misery. This terrible living grave of a galley, let us remember, is depicted from Christian models. A hundred and fifty years ago, such scenes might be witnessed on many a European vessel. The corsairs of Algiers only served their enemies as they served them. Their galley slaves were no worse treated, to say the least, than were Doria's or the King of France's own. Rank and delicate nurture were respected on neither side. A gallant corsair like Dragut had to drag his chain and pull his insatiable oar like any convict at the treadmill and a future Grand Master of Malta might chance to take his seat on the rowing bench beside commonest scoundrel of Naples. No one seemed to observe the horrible brutality of the service, where each man, let him be never so refined, was compelled to endure the filth and vermin of his neighbor, who might be half a savage, and was bound to become wholly one. And when Madame de Grignan wrote an account of a visit to a galley, her friend, Madame de Sévigny, replied that she would much like to see this sort of hell, and the men groaning day and night under the weight of their chains. Autre-temps, autre Furtenbach tells us much more about the galley, and how it was rigged out with brilliant cloths on the bulwarks on fete days how the biscuit was made to last six or eight months, each slave getting 28 ounces thrice a week, and a spoonful of some mess of rice or bones or green stuff. 
of the trouble of keeping the water cans under the benches full and fairly fresh. The full complement of a large galley included, he says, besides about 270 rowers, and the captain, chaplain, doctor, scrivener, boatswains, and master or pilot. Ten or fifteen gentlemen adventurers, friends of the captain, sharing his mess and berthed in the poop. Twelve helmsmen, timonieri, six foretop ABs, ten warders for the captives, twelve ordinary seamen, four gunners, a carpenter, smith, cooper, and a couple of cooks, together with fifty or sixty soldiers, so that the whole equipage of a fighting galley must have reached a total of about four hundred men. Footnote. In 1630, a French galley's company consisted of 250 forsats and 116 officers, soldiers, and sailors. End footnote. What is true of a European galley is also generally applicable to a Barbary galliot, except that the latter was generally smaller and lighter, and had commonly but one mast, and no castle on the prow. Footnote. Dan Histra de Barbary. 268 to 271. See the cut of Tunisian galliots on page 183. End footnote. The Algerines preferred fighting on galliots of 18 to 24 banks of oars, as more manageable than larger ships. The crew of about 200 men was very densely packed, and about 100 soldiers armed with muskets, bows, and scimitars occupied the poop. Hado has described the general system of the corsairs as he knew it at the close of the 16th century, and his account, here summarized, holds good for earlier and somewhat later periods. These vessels are perpetually building or repairing at Algiers. The builders are all Christians, who have a monthly pay from the treasury of six, eight, or ten quarter dollars, with a daily allowance of three loaves of the same bread with the Turkish soldiery, who have four. Some of the upper rank of these masters have six and even eight of these loaves, nor has any of their workmen, as carpenters, caulkers, coopers, oar makers, smiths, etc., fewer than three. The bailic, or common magazine, never wants slaves of all useful callings, nor is it probable that they should ever have a scarcity of such while they are continually bringing in incredible numbers of Christians of all nations. The captains, too, have their private artificer slaves, whom they buy for high prices and take with them on the cruise, and hire them out to help the Baelic workmen when ashore. The number of vessels possessed at any one time by the Algerines appears to have never been large. Barbarossa and Dragut were content with small squadrons. Occhiali had but 15 Algerine galleys at the Ponto. Hado says that at the close of the 16th century, 1581, the Algerines possessed 36 galliots or galleys, made up of three of 24 banks, one of 23, 11 of 22, 8 of 20, 1 of 19, 10 of 18, and 2 of 15, and these were, all but 14, commanded by renegades. They had besides a certain number of brigantines of 14 banks, chiefly belonging to Moors at Cherchel. This agrees substantially with Father Dan's account, 1634, who says that there were, in 1588, 35 galleys or brigantines, he means galliots, of which all but 11 were commanded by renegades. Hado gives the list, footnote, topographia 18, end footnote, of the 35 captains, from which the following names are selected, Jafar the Pasha, Hungarian, Memi, Albanian, Murad, French, Deli Memi, Greek, Murad Reyes, Albanian, Feru Reyes, Genoese, Murad Maltrapio, and Yusuf, Spaniards, Memi Reyes and Memi Gancho, Venetians, Murad the Less, Greek, Memi the Corsican, Memi the Calabrian, Montez the Sicilian, and so forth, most of whom commanded galleys of 22 to 24 banks. Footnote, Dan, 270-271. End footnote. It was a pretty sight to see the launching of a galley. After the long months of labor, after felling the oak and pine in the forests of Cherchel, 
and carrying the fashion planks on camels, mules, or their own shoulders some thirty miles to the seashore, or perhaps breaking up some unwieldy prize vessel taken from the Spaniards or Venetians. After all the sawing and fitting and caulking and painting, then at last comes the day of rejoicing for the Christian slaves who alone have done the work. For no Mussulman would offer to put a finger to the building of a vessel, saving a few Morisco ore makers and caulkers. Then the armadores, or owners of the new galliot, as soon as it is finished, come down with presents of money and clothes and hang them upon the mast and rigging, to the value of two hundred or three hundred ducats, to be divided among their slaves, whose only pay till that day has been the daily loaves. Then again, on the day of launching, after the vessel has been keeled over, and the bottom carefully greased from stem to stern, more presents from owners and captains to the workmen, to say nothing of a hearty dinner, and a great straining and shoving of brawny arms and bare backs, a shout of Allahu Akbar, God is most great, as the sheep is slaughtered over the vessel's prow, a symbol, they said, of the Christian blood to be shed. And the galliot glides into the water, prepared for her career of devastation, built by Christians and manned by Christians, commanded probably by a quondam Christian, she sallies forth to prey upon Christendom. The rowers, if possible, were all Christian slaves, belonging to the owners, but when these were not numerous enough, either slaves or Arabs and Moors were hired at ten ducats the trip, prize or no prize. If he was able, the captain, Reyes, would build and furnish out his own vessel, entirely at his own cost, in hope of greater profit. But often he had not the means, and then he would call in the aid of one or more armadores. These were often speculative shopkeepers, who invested in a part share of a galliot on the chance of a prize, and who often discovered that ruin lay in so hazardous a lottery. The complement of soldiers, whether volunteers, levants, consisting of Turks, renegades, or kurogler, kulogler, i.e. creoles, natives, Turks born on the soil, or if these cannot be had, ordinary Moors or Ottoman Janissaries, varied with the vessel's size, but generally was calculated at two to each oar, because there was just room for two men to sit beside each bank of rowers. They were not paid unless they took a prize, nor were they supplied with anything more than biscuit, vinegar, and oil. Everything else, even their blankets, they found themselves. The soldiers were under the command of their own Aga, who was entirely independent of Reyes and formed an efficient check upon that officer's conduct. Vinegar and water, with a few drops of oil on the surface, formed the chief drink of the galley slaves and their food was moistened biscuit or rusk, and an occasional mess of gruel, burgol. Nor was this given out when hard rowing was needed, for oars moved slackly on a full stomach. It was usual to consult an auguration book and a marabut, or saint, before deciding on a fortunate day for putting to sea, and these saints expected a share of the prize money. Fridays and Sundays were the favorite days for sailing, a gun is fired in honor of their tutelary patron. God speed us, shout the crew. God send you a prize, reply the crowd on the shore. And the galliot swiftly glides away on its destructive path. The Algerines, says Hado, generally speaking, are out upon the crews winter and summer, the whole year round. And so devoid of dread, they roam these eastern and western seas, laughing all the while at the Christian galleys, which lie trumpeting, gaming, and banqueting in the ports of Christendom, neither more nor less than if they went a-hunting hares and rabbits, killing here one and there another. Nay, far from being under apprehension, they are certain of their game, since the galliots are so extremely light and nimble, and in such excellent order, as they always are. Footnote. The corsairs prided themselves on the ship-shape appearance of their vessels. Everything was stowed away with marvelous neatness and economy of space and speed. 
even the anchor was lowered into the hold, lest it should interfere with the dressing of the oars. The weapons were never hung, but securely lashed, and when chasing an enemy, no movement of any kind was permitted to the crew and soldiers, save when necessary to the progress and defense of the ship. These corsairs, in fact, understood the conditions of a rowing race to perfection. End footnote. Whereas, on the contrary, the Christian galleys are so heavy, so embarrassed, and in such bad order and confusion that it is utterly in vain to think of giving them chase, or of preventing them from going and coming, and doing just as they themselves please. This is the occasion that, when at any time the Christian galleys chase them, their custom is, by way of game and sneer, to point to their fresh tallowed poops as they glide along like fishes before them, all one as if they showed them their backs to salute. And as in the cruising art, by continual practice, they are so very expert, and withal, for our sins, so daring, presumptuous, and fortunate. In a few days from their leaving Algiers, they return laden with infinite wealth and captives, and are able to make three or four voyages in a year, and even more if they are inclined to exert themselves. Those who have been cruising westward when they have taken a prize, conduct it to sell at Tetuan, al Araish, etc., in the kingdom of Fez, as do those who have been eastward in the states of Tunis and Tripoli, where, refurnishing themselves with provisions, etc., they instantly set out again, and again return with cargoes of Christians and their effects. If it sometimes happens more particularly in winter that they have roamed about for any considerable time without lighting on any booty, they retire to some one of these seven places, viz. if they had been in the west, their retreats were Tetuan, al Araish, or Yusal. Those who came from the Spanish coasts went to the island Formentara, and such as had been eastward retired to the island San Pedro near Sardinia, the mouths of Bonifacio in Corsica, or the islands Lipari and Strombolo, near Sicily and Calabria. And there, what with the conveniency of those commodious ports and harbors, and the fine springs and fountains of water, with the plenty of wood for fuel they meet with, added to the careless negligence of the Christian galleys, who scarce think it their business to seek for them, they there, very much at their ease, regale themselves with stretched out legs waiting to intercept the paces of christian ships which come there and deliver themselves into their clutches footnote hado 17 end footnote father dan describes their mode of attack as perfectly ferocious Flying a foreign flag, they lure the unsuspecting victim within striking distance, and then the gunners, generally renegades, ply the shot with unabated rapidity, while the sailors and boatswains chain the slaves that they may not take part in the struggle. The fighting men stand ready, their arms bared, muskets primed, and scimitars flashing, waiting for the order to board. Their war cry was appalling, and the fury of the onslaught was such as to strike panic into the stoutest heart. When a prize was taken, the booty was divided with scrupulous honesty between the owners and the captors, with a certain proportion, varying from a fifth to an eighth, reserved for the Balik, or government, who also claimed the hulks. Of the remainder, half went to the owners and reyes, the other half to the crew and soldiers. The principal officers took each three shares, the gunners and helmsmen two, and the soldiers and swabbers one. The Christian slaves received from one and one half to three shares apiece. A scrivener saw to the accuracy of the division. If the prize was a very large one, the captors usually towed it into Algiers at once, but small vessels were generally sent home under a lieutenant and a jury crew of Moors. There is no mistaking the aspect of a corsair who has secured a prize, 
for he fires gun after gun as he draws near the port, utterly regardless of powder. The moment he is in the roads, the Liman Reyes, or port admiral, goes on board and takes his report to the pasha. Then the galliot enters the port, and all the oars are dropped into the water and towed ashore so that no Christian captives may make off with the ship in the absence of the captain and troops. Ashore, all is bustle and delighted confusion. The dullness of trade, which is the normal condition of Algiers between the arrivals of prizes, is forgotten in the joy of renewed wealth. The erstwhile shabby now go strutting about, pranked out in gay raiment. The commerce of the barrooms is brisk, and everyone thinks only of enjoying himself. Algiers is on fit. End of Galleys and Galley Slaves. Section 17 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 17 The Triumph of Sales. 17th Century. At the beginning of the 17th century, a notable change came over the tactics of the corsairs. They built fewer galleys and began to construct square-sailed ships. In Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli, the dockyards teemed with workmen busily engaged in learning the new build, and the honor, if such it be, of having taught them rests apparently between England and Flanders. Simon Dancer, the English rover, taught the Algerines the fashion of round ships in 1606, and an Englishman seems to have rendered the same kind of office to the people of Tunis, aided by a Greek renegade, Mamie Reis where, moreover, another English pirate, Captain Wurr, was found in congenial company at the Galetta by Monsieur de Breve, the French ambassador. The causes of the change were twofold. First, Christian slaves were not always to be caught, and to hire rowers for the galleys was a ruinous expense. And secondly, the special service for which the smaller galliots and brigantines were particularly destined, the descents upon the Spanish coasts, was to some degree obstructed by the final expulsion of the last of the Moors from Andalusia in 1610. That stroke deprived the corsairs of the ready guides and sympathizers who had so often helped them to successful raids, and larger vessels and more fighting men were needed if such descents were to be continued. Moreover, the Barbary rovers were ambitious to contend with their old enemies for gold and treasure on the Spanish main itself. The science of navigation was fast developing. They felt themselves as equal to venturing upon long cruises as any European nation. Now a long cruise is impossible in a galley, where you have some hundreds of rowers to feed, and where each pound of biscuit adds to the labor of motion. But sails have no mouths, and can carry along a great weight of provisions without getting tired like human arms. So sails triumphed over oars. The day of the galley was practically over, and the epoch of the ship had dawned. 
As early as 1616, Sir Francis Cottington reported to the Duke of Buckingham that the sailing force of Algiers was exciting general alarm in Spain. The strength and boldness of the Barbary pirates is now grown to that height, both in the ocean and the Mediterranean seas, as I have never known anything to have wrought a greater sadness and distraction in this court than the daily advice thereof. Their whole fleet consists of forty sail of tall ships, of between two and four hundred tons apiece. Their admiral, flagship, of five hundred they are divided into two squadrons, the one of eighteen sail remaining before Malaga in sight of the city, the other about the Cape of St. Maria, which is between Lisbon and Seville. That squadron within the straits entered the road of Mostil, a town by Malaga, where with their ordinance they beat down part of the castle, and had doubtless taken the town, but that from Granada there came soldiers to succor it. Yet they took there diverse ships, and among them three or four from the west part of England. Two big English ships they drove ashore, not past four leagues from Malaga, and after they got on shore also, and burnt them. And to this day they remain before Malaga, intercepting all ships that pass that way, and absolutely prohibiting all trade into those parts of Spain. The other squadron was doing the same thing outside the straits, and the Spanish fleet was both too small in number and too cumbrous in build to attack them successfully. Yet, if this year they return safely to Algiers, especially if they should take any of the fleet, it is much to be feared that the King of Spain's forces by sea will not be sufficient to restrain them hereafter. So much sweetness they find in making prize of all Christians whatsoever. This dispatch shows that the corsairs had speedily mastered the new manner of navigation, as might have been expected of a nation of sailors. They had long been acquainted with the great galleas of Spain and Venice, a sort of compromise between the road galley and the sailing galleon, for it was too heavy to depend wholly on its oars, which by way of distinction were rowed under cover, and its great Latin sails were generally its motive power. The galleys themselves, moreover, had sails, though not square sails, and the seaman who can sail a ship on Latin sails soon learns the management of the square rig. The engravings on pages 5, 11, 165, 197, and 227 sufficiently show the type of vessel that now again came into vogue, and which was known as a galleon, nave, Polaca, Tartana, Barcone, Caravel, Caramuzel, etc., according to its size and country. The Turkish Caramuzel, or Tartan, says Furtenbach, stands high out of the water, is strong and swift, and mounts eighteen or twenty guns, and as many as sixty well-armed pirates. It is a dangerous vessel to attack. From its commanding height, its guns can pour down so furious a fire upon a Christian craft that the only alternative to surrender is positive extirpation. 
If the enemy tries to sneak out of range below the level of fire, the Turks drop grenades from the upper decks and set the ship on fire, and even if the Christians succeeded in boarding, they find themselves in a trap. For though the ship's waste is indeed cleared of the enemy, the hurricane decks at the poop and prow command the boarding party, and through loopholes in the bulwarks, as good a cover as a trench, a hail of grape pours from the guns, and seizing their opportunity, the Turks rush furiously through the doors and take their opponents, simultaneously in face and rear. And then comes a busy time for scimitar and pike. Or, when you are alongside, if you see the Caramuzel's mainsail being furled, and something moving in the iron cage on the gabia or main top, know that a petard will soon be dropped in your midst from the main peak and probably a heavy stone or bomb from the opposite end of the long latin yard where it serves the double purpose of missile and counterpoise now is the time to keep your distance unless you would have a hole in your ship's bottom the corsairs indeed are very wily in attack and defence acquainted with many sorts of projectiles, even submarine torpedoes, which a diver will attach to the enemy's keel. They know how to serve their stern chasers with amazing accuracy and rapidity. With their newly built galleons, the raids of the corsairs became more extensive they were no longer bounded by the Straits of Gibraltar, or a little outside. They pushed their successes north and south. In 1617, they passed the Straits with eight well-armed vessels and bore down upon Madeira, where they landed 800 Turks. The scenes that followed were of the usual character. The whole island was laid waste, the churches pillaged, the people abused and enslaved. Twelve hundred men, women, and children were brought back to Algiers, with much firing of guns and other signals of joy, in which the whole city joined. In 1627, Morad, a German renegade, took three Algerine ships as far north as Denmark and Iceland, whence he carried off four hundred, some say eight hundred, captives. And not to be outdone, his namesake, Murad Reis, a Fleming, in 1631 ravaged the English coasts, and passing over to Ireland, descended upon Baltimore, sacked the town, and bore away 237 prisoners, men, women, and children, even from the cradle. It was a piteous sight to see them exposed for sale at Algiers, cries the good father Dan. For then they parted the wife from the husband and the father from the child. Then, say I, they sell the husband here and the wife there, tearing from her arms the daughter whom she cannot hope to see ever again. Many bystanders burst into tears as they saw the grief and despair of these poor Irish. As before, but with better confidence, they pursue their favorite course in the Levant and cruise across the Egyptian trade route, where are to be caught ships laden with the products of Cairo and Sana and Bombay, and lay to at the back of Cyprus to snare the Syrian and Persian goods that sail from Scandaroon, 
and so home with a pleasant raid along the Italian coasts, touching, perhaps, at an island or two to pick up slaves and booty. And thus, to the mole of Algiers and to the welcome of their mates, and this, in spite of all the big ships of Christendom, qu'il ne cesse de troubler, sans que tant de puissants galères et tant de bons navires, que plusieurs princes chrétiens tiennent dans leur havre, leur donnent la chasse, si ce ne sont les vaisseaux de Malte ou de Ligorne. And since 1618, when the Janissaries first elected their own pasha and practically ignored the authority of the port, the traditional fellowship with France, the Sultan's ally, had fallen through, and French vessels now formed part of the Corsair's quarry. Between 1628 and 1634, eighty French ships were captured, worth, according to the Reis's valuation, 4,752,000 livres, together with 1,331 slaves. The King of France must have regretted even the days when Barbarossa wintered at Toulon. So great was the plague of the sea rovers, and apparently so hopeless the attempt to put them down. End of chapter 17「the Redemption of the Captives, 17th and 18th Centuries When galleys went out of fashion and round ships took their place, it may be supposed that the captivity of Christian slaves diminished. In reality, however, the number of slaves employed on the galleys was small compared with those who worked on shore. If the Spanish historian be correct in his statement that at the close of the 16th century the Algerines possessed but 36 galleys and galliots, the brigantines were not rowed by slaves, with a total of 1,200 oars, even allowing three men to an oar, which is excessive for some of the corsairs' like galliots, the number of slaves is but 3,600. But in 1634, Father Dan found 25,000 Christian slaves in the city of Algiers and roundabout, without counting 8,000 renegades, and so far was the fleet from being diminished, except that there were few galleys that the priest reckoned no less than seventy sailing cruisers, from large thirty-five and forty-gun ships, to ordinary galleons and palakas, and on August 7th he himself saw twenty-eight of the best of them sail away in quest of Norman and English ships, which usually came to Spain at that season to take in wine, oil, and spices. He adds that Tunis had then but fourteen palakas, Salet thirty very swift caravels, drawing little water on account of the harbor bar, and Tripoli but seven or eight, owing to the vigilance of the Knights of Malta. Altogether, the whole Barbary fleet numbered 120 sailing ships, besides about 25 galleys and brigantines. Father Dan draws a miserable picture of the captive's life ashore. Nothing, of course, could equal the torment of the galley slaves, but the wretchedness of the shore slaves was bad enough. When they were landed, they were driven to the Bessistan, or slave market where they were put up to auction like the cattle which were also sold there, walked up and down by the auctioneer to show off their paces, and beaten if they were lazy or weary or seemed to sham. The purchasers were often speculators who intended to sell again, bought for the rise, in fact, and Christians are cheap today, was a business quotation, just as though they had been stocks and shares. The prettiest women were generally shipped to Constantinople for the sultan's choice, the rest were heavily chained and cast into vile dungeons in private houses till their work was allotted them, or into the large prisons or banos, of which there were then six in Algiers, 
each containing a number of cells in which fifteen or sixteen slaves were confined. Every rank and quality of both sexes might be seen in these wretched dens, gentle and simple, priest and laic, merchant and artisan, lady and peasant girl, some hopeful of ransom, others despairing ever to be free again. The old and feeble were set to sell water, laden with chains, they led a donkey about the streets and doled out water from the skin upon his back. And an evil day it was when the poor captive did not bring home to his master the stipulated sum. Others took the bread to the bakehouse and fetched it back in haste, for the Moors love hot loaves. Some cleaned the house, since Mohammed ends detest dirt, whitened the walls, washed the clothes, and minded the children. Others took the fruit to market, tended the cattle, or labored in the fields, sometimes sharing the yoke of the plow with a beast of burden. Worst of all was the sore labor of quarrying stone for building, and carrying it down from the mountains to the shore. Doubtless, Father Dan made the worst of the misery he saw. It was not to the interest of the owners to injure their slaves, who might be ransomed or resold, and at any rate, were more valuable in health than in weakness and disease. The worst part of captivity was not the physical toil and blows, but the mental care, the despair of release, the carking ache of proud hearts set to slave for taskmasters. Cruelty there certainly was as even so staunch an apologist for the Moors as Joseph Morgan admits, but it can hardly have been the rule, and the report of another French priest who visited Algiers and other parts of Barbary in 1719 does not bear out Dan's statements, nor is there any reason to believe that the captives were worse treated in 1634 than in 1719. The latter report, with some of Morgan's comments, may be summarized thus. The slaves at Algiers are not indeed so unhappy as those in the hands of the mountain moors. The policy of those in power, the interests of individuals, and the more sociable disposition of the townspeople make their lot in general less rigorous. Still they are slaves, hated for their religion, overtaxed with work, and liable to apostasy. They are of two sorts, Baelic or government slaves, and those belonging to private persons. When a corsair has taken a prize, and has ascertained by the application of the bastinado, the rank or occupation and proficiency of the various captives, he brings them before the governor to be strictly examined as to their place in the captured vessel, whether passengers or equipage. If the former, they are claimed by their consuls, who attend the examination, and as a rule they are set free. But if they served on board the ship for pay, they are enslaved, drawn up in a row, one in eight is chosen by the day for his own share, and he naturally selects the best workmen, and the surgeons and the ship's masters, who are at once sent to the government banyo. The rest are to be divided equally between the owners and the equipage, and are taken to the basistan and marched up and down by the dalals or auctioneers, to the time of their merits and calling, till the highest bid is reached. This is, however, a merely formal advance, for their final sale must take place at the day's palace, whether the captives and their would-be purchasers now resort. The second auction always realizes a much higher sum than the first, but the owners and equipage are only permitted to share the former price, while by a beautifully simple process, the whole difference between the first and second sales goes absolutely to the government. The government slaves wear an iron ring on one ankle and are locked up at night in the banyos, while by day, they do all the heavy work of the city, as cleaning, carrying, and quarrying stone. Their rations are three loaves a day. Some have been seen to toil in chains. They have nevertheless their privileges. They have no work to do on Fridays, and they are at free liberty to play work or steal for themselves every day for about three hours before sunset, and Morgan adds that they do steal with the coolest impunity, and often sell the stolen goods back to the owners, who dare not complain. Sometimes the day sends them to sea, when they are allowed to retain part of the spoil, and others are permitted to keep taverns for renegades and the general riffraff, both of Turks and Christians, to carouse in. Sometimes they may save enough to repurchase their freedom, but it often happened that a slave remained a slave by preference, sooner than return to Europe and be beggared, and many of them were certainly better off in slavery at Algiers, where they got a blow for a crime than in Europe, where their ill deeds would have brought them to the wheel, or at least the halter. There were undoubtedly instances, however, of unmitigated barbarity in the treatment of prisoners. For example, the redemptionists relate the sufferings of four knights of Malta, 
three of them French gentlemen, and one from Lucca, who were taken captive at the siege of Oran in 1706 and taken to Algiers. Here they were thrust into the government prison along with other prisoners and slaves, to the number of 2,000. Faint with the stench, they were removed to the Cassaba or castle, where they remained two years. News was then brought that the galleys of Malta had captured the Capitana or flagship of Algiers, with 650 Turks and Moors aboard. Besides Christian slaves, to say nothing of killed and wounded, whereupon furiously incensed, the day sent the imprisoned knights to the castle dungeon and loaded them with chains weighing 120 pounds. And there they remained, cramped with the irons, in a putrid cavern swarming with rats and other vermin. They could hear the people passing in the street without, and they clanked their chains, if so they might be heard, but none answered. At last their condition came to the ears of the French consul, who threatened like penalties to Turkish prisoners in Malta unless the knights were removed, and the day on this lightened their chains by half and put them in a better room. There these unhappy gentlemen remained for eight long years more, save only at the great festivals of the church when they were set free to join in the religious rites at the French consulate, and once they formed a strange and sad feature in the wedding festivities of the consul, when they assumed their perukes and court dresses for the nonce only to exchange them again for the badge of servitude when the joyful moment of liberty was over. Their treatment grew worse as time wore on. They were made even to drag trucks of stone, these knights of an heroic order, and hopeless of obtaining so large a sum as nearly forty thousand dollars, which was demanded for their ransom. They managed to file their change and escape to the shore. But there, to their dismay, the ship they expected was not to be seen, and they took refuge with a marabout or saint. Much to his credit, this worthy Muslim used his vast spiritual influence for their protection, and the day spared their lives. At last, by the joint efforts of their friends and the redemptionists, these poor gentlemen were ransomed and restored to their own country. Among those who endured captivity in Algiers was one whom genius has placed among the greatest men of all time. In 1575, Cervantes was returning from Naples, after serving for six years in the regiment of Figueroa and losing the use of his left arm at Lepanto to revisit his own country, when his ship El Sol was attacked by several corsair galleys commanded by Arnaud Memmi, and after a desperate resistance, in which Cervantes took a prominent part, was forced to strike her colors. Cervantes thus became the captive of a renegade Greek, one Deli Memi, a corsair reis, who, finding upon him letters of recommendation from persons of the highest consequence, Don John of Austria among them, concluded that he was a prisoner of rank, for whom a heavy ransom might be asked. Accordingly, the future author of Don Quixote was loaded with chains and harshly treated, to make him the more anxious to be ransomed. The ransom, however, was slow in coming, and meanwhile, the captive made several daring, ingenious, but unsuccessful attempts to escape, with the natural consequences or stricter watch and greater severities. At last, in the second year of his captivity, he was able to let his friends know of his condition, whereupon his father strained every resource to send a sufficient sum to release Miguel and his brother Rodrigo, who was in the like plight. The brother was set free, but Cervantes himself was considered too valuable for the price. With the help of his liberated brother, he once more concerted a plan of escape. In a cavern six miles from Algiers, where he had a friend, he concealed by degrees forty or fifty fugitives, chiefly Spanish gentlemen, and contrived to supply them with food for six months, without arousing suspicion. It was arranged that a Spanish ship should be sent by his brother to take off the dwellers in the cave, whom Cervantes now joined. The ship arrived, communications were already opened, when some fishermen gave the alarm. The vessel was obliged to put to sea, and meanwhile the treachery of one of the captives had revealed the whole plot to Hassan Pasha, the viceroy, who immediately sent a party of soldiers to the cavern. Cervantes, with his natural chivalry, at once came to the front and took the whole blame upon himself. Surprised at this magnanimity, the viceroy, who is described in Don Quixote as the homicide of all humankind, sent for him, and found him as good as his word. No threats of torture or death could extort from him a syllable which could implicate any one of his fellow captives. His undaunted manner evidently overawed the viceroy, for instead of chastising, he purchased Cervantes from his master for five hundred gold crowns. Nothing could deter this valiant spirit from his designs upon freedom. Attempt after attempt had failed, and still he tried again. 
once he was very near liberty when a Dominican monk betrayed him. Even then, he might have escaped if he would have consented to desert his companions on the plot. But he was Cervantes. He was within an ace of execution, thanks to his own chivalry, and was kept for five months in the Moor's Bagno, under strict watch, though without blows. No one ever struck him during the whole of his captivity, though he often stood in expectation of impalement or some such horrible death. At last in 1580, just as he was being taken off, laden with chains to Constantinople, whither Hassan Pasha had been recalled, Father Juan Gil effected his ransom for about 100 pounds of English money at the time, and Miguel de Cervantes, after five years of captivity, was once more free. As has been well said, if Don Quixote and all else of his had never been written, the proofs we have here of his greatness of soul, constancy, and cheerfulness, under the severest of trials which a man could endure, would be sufficient to ensure him lasting fame. Slavery in private houses, shops, and farms was tolerable or intolerable according to the character and disposition of the master and of the slaves. Some were treated as members of the family, save in their liberty, as is the natural inclination of Muslims towards the slaves of their own religion. Others were cursed and beaten, justly or unjustly, and lived a dog's life. Those who were supposed to be able to pay a good ransom were for a time especially ill-treated, in the hope of compelling them to send for their money. Escape was rare, the risk was too great, and the chances too small. Thousands of Christian slaves meant tens of thousands of Christian sympathizers, bereaved parents and sisters, sorrowing children and friends, and it is easy to imagine what efforts were made to procure the release of their unhappy relatives in captivity. At first it was extremely difficult to open negotiations with the corsairs, but when nation after nation appointed consuls to watch over their interests at Algiers and Tunis, there was a recognized medium of negotiation of which the relations took advantage. As will presently be seen, the office of consul in those days carried with it little of the power or dignity that becomes it now, and the efforts of the consul were often abortive. There were others than consuls, however, to help in the good work. The freeing of captives is a Christian duty, and at the close of the twelfth century, Jean de Matha, impressed with the unhappy fate of the many Christians who languished in the lands of the infidels, founded the order of the Holy Trinity and redemption of captives. The convent of S. Matheran in Paris was immediately bestowed upon the order. Another was built at Rome, on the Coelian Hill, another called Serfroy near Mo, and others in many countries, even as far as the Indies. Pope Innocent III warmly supported the pious design, and wrote a Latin letter recommending the Redemptionists to the protection of the Emperor of Morocco. It was addressed, Illustri Mira Mamolin, Regi Miraca Tenorum. Matha's first voyage, 1199, brought back 186 captives, and in succeeding generations some 20,000 slaves were rescued by the Good Fathers, who clad in their white robes, with the blue and red cross on the breast, three colors symbolical of the three persons, fearlessly confronted the corsairs and bartered for the captive's ransom. Father Pierre Dan and his colleagues of the Order of the Redemption set out from Marseille in 1634 in the suite of Sanson le Pege, premier herald of France, and conversant in the Turkish tongue, to arrange for the exchange of captives. Some Turks confined in the galleys at Marseille were to be released in return for the freeing of the 342 Frenchmen who were in captivity in Algiers. The good father's views upon the origin of the corsairs were very pronounced. He held that they were descended from Ham, the traitor, and were inheritors of the curse of the patriarch Noah. Further, that they were the cruelest of all the unnatural monsters that Africa has bred, the most barbarous of mankind, pests of the human race, tyrants over the general liberty, and the wholesale murderers of innocent blood. He did not stop to examine into the condition of the galley slaves in the ports of his own France, or to inquire whether the word corsair applied to Muslims alone. On July 15, 1634, Sanson and the priests arrived at Algiers. A full divan was being held, and the pasha received them courteously despite their obstinate refusal to dip the French flag to his crescent. They were forced in deference to the universal custom at Algiers to surrender their rudder and oars, not so much to prevent their own unauthorized departure as to remove the temptation of Christian captives making their escape in the vessel. Orders were given that every respect was to be paid to the envoy's party on pain of decapitation. Rooms were prepared for them in the house of the agent who represented the coral fisheries of the neighboring Bastion de France, and here Father Dan made an altar, 
celebrated mass, and heard confession of the captives. Two days after their arrival, a new pasha appeared from Constantinople. He was met by two state galleys and saluted by the 1,500 guns in the forts and the 40 galleys in the harbor. The aga of the Janissaries and the secretary of state, with a large suite of officers, drummers, and fifes, received him on his landing with a deafening noise. The new pasha, who was robed in white, then mounted a splendid barb, richly caparisoned with precious stones and silk embroidery, and rode to the palace, whence he sent the French envoy a present of an ox, six sheep, twenty-four fowls, forty-eight hot loaves, and six dozen wax candles, to which the sieur la page responded with gold and silver watches, scarlet cloth, and rich brocades. Despite these civilities, the negotiations languished, and finally, after three months of fruitless endeavors, the mission left this accursed town in such haste that they never even looked to see if the wind would serve them, and consequently soon found themselves driven by a Greek Levant, or east wind, to Majorca, then across to Bejea, which was no longer a place of importance or of piracy, since the Algerines had concentrated all their galleys at their chief port, and then sighted Bona, which showed traces of the invasion of 1607, when six Florentine galleys, commanded by French gentlemen, had seized the fort, made mincemeat of the unfortunate garrison, and carried off 1,800 men, women, and children to Leghorn. At last, with much toil, they reached La Calle, the port of the Bastion de France, a fine castle built by the merchants of Marseille in 1561 for the protection of the valuable coral fisheries, and containing two handsome courts of solid masonry, and a population of 400 French people. Sanson Napoleon had been governor here, but he was killed in an expedition to Tabarca. Le Page accordingly appointed a lieutenant, and then the mission returned to Marseille without results. The fathers, however, soon afterwards sailed for Tunis, whence they brought back forty-two French captives, with whom they made a solemn procession, escorted by all the clergy of Marseille, and sang a triumphant te deum, the captives marching joyfully beside them, each with an illustrative chain over his shoulder. This is but one example of a long course of determined efforts of the Redemptionists, to say nothing of the Franciscans and Dominicans, to rescue their unhappy countrymen. In 1719, Father Comelan and others brought away 98 Frenchmen, and similar expeditions were constantly being made. The zeal of the order was perhaps narrow. We read that when they offered to pay 3,000 pieces for three French captives, and the day voluntarily threw in a fourth without increasing the price, they refused the addition because he was a Lutheran. Nevertheless, they worked much good among the Catholic prisoners, established hospitals and chapels in various parts of the Barbary coast, and many a time suffered the penalty of their courage at the hands of a merciless day, who would sometimes put them to a cruel death in order to satisfy his vengeance for some reverse sustained by his troops or ships from the forces of France. Catholic, and especially French captives at least, had cause to be grateful to the fathers of the redemption. Those of the northern nations fared worse. They had no powerful widespread church organization to help them. Their rulers took little thought of their misery, and their tears and petitions went unregarded for many a long year. End of chapter 18. Recording by Beth Blakely. Chapter 19 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Blakely, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Gerald Kelly and Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 19 The Abasement of Europe, 16th to 18th Centuries. It is not too much to say that the history of the foreign relations of Algiers and Tunis is one long indictment not of one, but of all the maritime powers of Europe, on the charge of cowardice and dishonor. There was some excuse for dismay at the powerful armaments and invincible seamanship of Barbarossa, or the fateful ferocity of Dragut, but that all the maritime powers should have cowered and cringed as they did before the miserable braggarts who succeeded the heroic age of corsairs and should have suffered their trade to be harassed, their lives menaced, and their honor stained by a series of insolent savages, whose entire fleet and army could not stand for a day 
before any properly general force of a single European power seems absolutely incredible, and yet it is literally true. Policy and preoccupation had of course much to say to this state of things. Policy induced the French to be the friends of Algiers until Spain lost her menacing supremacy, and even later, Louis XIV is said to have remarked, If there were no Algiers, I would make one. Policy led the Dutch to ally themselves with the Algerines early in the 17th century, because it suited them to see the lesser trading states preyed upon. Policy sometimes betrayed England into suffering the indignities of subsidizing a nest of thieves, that the thieving might be directed against her enemies. Preoccupation in other struggles, our own civil war, the Dutch war, the great Napoleonic war, may explain the indifference to insult or patience under a front which had to be displayed during certain periods. But there were long successions of years when no such apology can be offered, when no cause whatever can be assigned for the pusillanimity of the governments of Europe, but sheer cowardice, the definite terror of a barbarous power, which was still believed to possess all the boundless resources and all the unquenchable courage which had marked its early days. Tunis, as much as Algiers, was the object of the servile dread of Europe. The custom of offering presents, which were really bribes, only died out fifty years ago, and there are people who can still remember the time when consuls general were made to creep into the bay's presence under a wooden bar. One day the bay ordered the French consul to kiss his hand. The consul refused, was threatened with instant death, and kissed it. 1740. When in 1762 an English ambassador came in a king's ship to announce the accession of George III, the bay made the same order, but this time it was compromised by some of the officers kissing his hand instead of their chief. Austria was forced to sue for a treaty and had to pay an annual tribute, 1784. The Danes sent a fleet to beg leave to hoist their flag over their consulate in Tunis. The bay asked 15,000 sequins for the privilege, and the admiral sailed away in despair. After the Venetians had actually defeated the Tunisians several times in the war of 1784-92, to Venice paid the bay Hamuda 40,000 sequins and splendid presents for the Treaty of Peace. About the same time, Spain spent 100,000 piastres for the sake of immunity from piracy, and in 1799, the United States bought a commercial treaty for $50,000 down, 8,000 for secret service, 28 cannon, 10,000 balls, and quantities of powder, cordage, and jewels. Holland, Sweden, Denmark, Spain, and the United States were tributaries of the bay. Yet we have it on the authority of the Redemptionist Fathers, who are not likely to underestimate their adversaries, that in 1719 the Algerines, who among all the Barbary maritime powers are much the strongest, had but 25 galleons of 18 to 60 guns, besides caravels and brigantines, and it appears they were badly off for timber, especially for masts, and for iron, cordage, pitch, and sails. It is surprising to see in what good condition they keep their ships, since their country affords not wherewithal to do it. When they can get new timber, brought from Bujaya, sufficient to make a ship's bottom parts, they finish the remainder with the ruins of prize vessels, which they perfectly well know how to employ to most advantage, and thus find the secret of making very neat new ships and excellent sailors out of old ones. Still twenty-five small frigates were hardly a big enough bugbear to terrify all Europe, let them patch them never so neatly. Nevertheless, in 1712, the Dutch purchased the forbearance of these twenty-five ships by ten twenty-four-pounders mounted, twenty-five large masts, five cables, four hundred and fifty barrels of powder, two thousand five hundred great shot, fifty chests of gun barrels, swords, etc., and five thousand dollars. Being thus handsomely armed, the Algerines naturally broke the treaty in three years' time, and the Dutch paid even more for a second truce. So flourished the system of the weak levying blackmail upon the strong. The period of Europe's abasement began when the Barbary corsairs were recognized as civilized states to be treated with on equal terms. That is to say, when consuls, ambassadors, and royal letters began to arrive at Tunis or Algiers. This period began soon after Doria's disastrous campaign at Gerba when the Battle of Lepanto had destroyed the prestige of the Ottoman navy, but increased, if possible, the terror of the ruthless corsairs. 
No really serious attempt was made to put down the scourge of the Mediterranean between 1560 and Lord Exmouth's victory in 1816. For nearly all that time, the British nation and most of the other maritime states were represented at Algiers and Tunis by consular agents. Master John Tipton was the first Englishman to become consul anywhere, and he was consul at Algiers, first appointed by the newly formed Turkey Company about 1580, and in 1585 officially named consul of the British nation by Mr. Harebone, the ambassador of England at Sublime Port. The records of the long succession of consuls and agents and consuls general that followed him are a title roll of shame. The state of things, at almost any point in this span of 230 years, may be described in few words. A consul striving to propitiate a sudden, ignorant, common soldier called a day, a Christian king or government submitting to every affront put upon his representative, recalling him after moral insult, and sending a more obsequious substitute with presents and fraternal messages. And now and then a king's ship, carrying an officer of the king's navy, or an ambassador of the king's council, irresolutely loitering about the bay of Algiers trying to mollify a surly despot, or perhaps to experiment in a little meaningless bluster, at which the day laughs in his sleeve, or even openly, for he knows he has only to persevere in his demands, and every government in Europe will give in. Consuls may pull down their flags and threaten war, admirals may come and look stern, and even make a show of a broadside or two. But the day's Christian brother of St. James or the Tuileries, or their ministers for them, have settled that Algiers cannot be attacked. So loud may he laugh at consul and man of war. To attempt to trace in detail the relations of the pashas, days, and bays of the three Barbary states and the sharifs of Morocco with the various European powers would be a task at once difficult and wearisome. Those with England will be quite sufficient for the purpose, and here, in regard to Algiers, we have the advantage of following the researches of the agent and the consul general there, Sir R. Lambert Playfair, who in his Scourge of Christendom has set forth the principal incidents of British relations with the day in great detail, and has authenticated his statements by references to official documents of unimpeachable veracity. The facts which he brings to light in a volume of over 300 pages can here, of course, be but slightly touched upon, but the reader may turn to his interesting narrative for such more particular information as space excludes from these pages. The general results arrived at from a study of Sir Lambert Playfair's researches are painful to English self-respect. It is possible that our consuls were not always wisely chosen, and it was a vital defect in our early consular system that our agents were allowed to trade. Mercantile interests, especially in a coarser state, are likely to clash with the duties of a consul. Some consuls, moreover, were clearly unfitted for their posts. Of one it is recorded that he drank to excess. Another is described as a litigious limb of the law, who values himself upon having practiced his talents in that happy occupation with success, against every man that business or occasion gave him dealings with. A third is represented as sitting on his bed with his sword and a brace of pistols at his side, calling for a clergyman to give him the sacraments that he may die contented. Still, in the long list of consuls, the majority were honorable, upright men, devoted to their country and anxious to uphold her interests and rights. How were they rewarded? If their own government resented a single act of the ferocious monster they called the day, who was any common janissary chosen by his comrades, the consul went in fear of his life, nay sometimes was positively murdered. If he was a strong-minded, courageous man, and refused to stoop to the degradation which was expected of him at the day's palace, he could not reckon on support at home. He might be recalled, or his judgment reversed, or he might even pull down the consular flag, only to see it run up again by a more temporizing successor, appointed by a government which had already endorsed his own resistance. He might generously become surety for thousands of pounds of ransom for English captives, and never receive back a penny from home. Whatever happened, the consul was held responsible by the Algerines, and on the arrival of adverse news, a threatening crowd would surround his house. Sometimes the consul and every Englishman in Algiers would be seized and thrown into prison, and their effects ransacked and never a chance of restitution. Many were utterly ruined by the extortions of the day and governors. Heavy bribes, called the customary presents, had to be distributed on the arrival of each fresh consul and it is easy to understand that the day took care that they did not hold the office too long. 
The government presents were never rich enough, and the unlucky consul had to make up the deficit out of his own pocket. The day would contemptuously hand over a magnificently jeweled watch to his head cook in the presence of the donor, and no consul was received at the palace until the customary presents were received. The presence of a remonstrating admiral in the bay was a new source of danger, for the consul would probably be thrown into prison, and his family turned homeless into the streets, while his dragoman received a thousand stripes of the bastinado. When the French shelled Algiers in 1683, the vicar apostolic, Jean de Vacher, who was acting as consul, and had worked untiringly among the poor captives for thirty-six years, was by order of Mezzamorto, with many of his countrymen, blown from the cannon's mouth, and the same thing happened to his successor in 1688, when forty-eight other Frenchmen suffered the same barbarous death. The most humiliating etiquette was observed in the day's court. The consul must remove his shoes and sword, and reverently kissed the rascal's hand, the Han. Archibald Campbell Fraser in 1767 was the first consul who flatly refused to pay this unparalleled act of homage, and he was told in a few years that the day had no occasion for him and he might go, as if he were the day's servant. Dear friend of this our kingdom, wrote the potentate to H. M. George III of England, I gave him my orders, and he was insolent. Mr. Fraser went, but was sent back to be reinstated by a squadron of His Majesty's ships. Admiral Sir Peter Dennis sailed into Algiers Bay, and having ascertained that the day would not consent to receive Mr. Fraser again, sailed out again. His Majesty's government expressed themselves as completely satisfied with the Admiral's action, and resolved to leave the day to his reflections. Finally, in the very next year, King George accepts his friend of Algiers' excuses, and appoints a new consul, specially charged, to conduct himself in a manner agreeable to you. The nation paid a pension of six hundred pounds a year to Mr. Fraser as indemnity for its government's poltroonery. Every fresh instance of submission naturally swelled the overweening insolence of the days. A consul had a Maltese cook, the day objected to the Maltese, and took the man by force from the consul's house and sent him away in irons. If the consul objected, he might go too. When Captain Hope of HMS Romulus arrived at Algiers, he received no salute. The consul was ordered to go aboard, leaving his very linen behind him, and frigate and consul were ordered out of the harbor. Consul Falcon, so late as 1803, was arrested on a trumped-up charge and forcibly expelled from the city. Truly, Consul Cartwright might describe the consular office of Algiers as the next step to the infernal regions. In 1808, merely because the usual tribute was late, the Danish consul was seized and heavily ironed, made to sleep in the common prison, and set to labor with the slaves. The whole consular body rose as one man and obtained his release, but his wife died from the shock. A French consul about the same time died from similar treatment. Were all these consuls maltreated for mere obstinacy about trifles? The records of piracy will answer that question. So early as 1582, when England was at peace with the port, as she continued to be for 220 years, gentlemen of good birth began to find a voyage in the Mediterranean a perilous adventure. Two Scottish lairds, the masters of Morton and Oliphant, remained for years prisoners at Algiers. Sir Thomas Rowe, proceeding to his post as ambassador at Constantinople, said that unless checked the Algerine pirates will brave even the armies of kings at sea and endanger the coasts, which would have been no new thing, and reported that their last cruise had brought in 49 British vessels, and that there would soon be 1,000 English slaves in Algiers. The pirates were even boasting that they would go to England and fetch men out of their beds, as it was their habit to do in Spain, and indeed it was but a few years later that they sacked Baltimore and County Cork, and literally carried out their threat. The Gorsairs' galleons might be sighted at any moment off Plymouth Hoe or Hartland Point, and the worthy merchants of Bristol, commercial princes in their way, dared not send their richly laden bottoms to sea for fear of a brush with the enemy. The Reverend Devereux Spratt was captured off Eugle, as he was crossing only from Cork to Bristol, and so distressed was the good man at the miserable condition of many of the slaves at Algiers, that when he was ransomed he yielded to their entreaties and stayed a year or two longer to comfort them with his holy offices. It was ministrations such as his that were most needed by the captives. Of bodily ill-treatment they had little to complain, but alienation from their country, the loss of home and friends, the terrible fate too often of wife and children, 
These were the instruments of despair and disbelief in God's providence, and for such as were thus tormented the clergyman was a minister of consolation. In the sad circle of the captives, marriages and baptisms nevertheless took place, and some are recorded in the parish register of Castmel, Lancashire, as having been performed in Argier by Mr. Spratt. Matters went from bad to worse. Four hundred British ships were taken in three or four years before 1622. Petitions went up to the Houses of Parliament from the ruined merchants of the great ports of England. Imploring letters came in from poor Consul Frizzell, who continued to plead for succor for twenty years and then disappeared ruined and unaided. Touching petitions reached England from poor captives themselves, English seamen and captains or plain merchants bringing home their wealth, now suddenly arrested and stripped of all they possessed. Piteous letters from out the very banyos themselves, full of tears and entreaties for help. In the fourth decade of the seventeenth century, there were three thousand husbands and fathers and brothers in Algerine prisons, and it was no wonder that the wives and daughters thronged the approaches to the House of Commons and besieged the members with their prayers and sobs. Every now and then a paltry sum was doled out by government for ransom of slaves, whose capture was due to official supineness, and we find the House of Lords subscribing nearly three thousand pounds for the same object. In the first quarter of the 17th century, 240 British slaves were redeemed for 1,200 pounds, and the Algerines, who looked upon the whole matter in a business-like spirit, not only were willing to give every facility for their purchase, but even sent a special envoy to the Court of St. James to forward the negotiations. Towards the middle of the century, a good many more were rescued by Edmund Casson, as agent for the government. Alice Hayes of Edinburgh was ransomed for 1,100 double pesatas, two francs each, Sarah Ripley of London for 800, a Dundee woman for only 200, others for as much as 1,390, while men generally fetched about 500. Sometimes, but very rarely, the captives made their own escape. The story is told by purchase of four English youths who were left on board a prize, the Jacob of Bristol, to help a dozen Turkish captors to navigate her, and who threw the captain overboard, killed three more, drove the rest under hatches, and sold them for a round sum in the harbor of San Lucar by Cadiz. Even more exciting were the adventures of William Oakley, who in 1639 was taken on board the Mary bound for the West Indies, when but six days from the Isle of Wight, his master Amour gave him partial liberty and allowed him to keep a wine shop in consideration of a monthly payment of two dollars. And in the cellar of his shop, the slave secretly constructed a light canoe of canvas, while the staves of empty wine pipes furnished the oars. These he and his comrades smuggled down to the beach, and five of them embarked in the crazy craft, which bore them safely to Majorca. The hardest part was the farewell to two more who were to have accompanied them, but were found to overweight the little boat. Several other narratives of successful escapes may be read in the volume of voyages published by the Redemptionist Fathers, and translated by Joseph Morgan. One at least is worth quoting. A good number of different nations, but mostly Majorcans, conspired to get away by night with a rowboat, i.e. brigantine, ready for the cruise. They were in all about seventy. Having appointed a place of rendezvous at dead of night, they got down through a sewer into the port. But the dogs, which are there very numerous, ran barking at them. Some they killed with clubs and stones. At this noise, those who were on guard, as well as ashore in the ships, bawled out with all their might, Christians! Christians! They then assembled and ran towards the noise, and forty of the slaves having entered the frigata, or rowboat, and being stronger than those who guarded her, they threw them all into the sea, and it being their business to hasten out of the port, embarrassed with cables of the many ships which then quite filled it, and as they were desirous of taking the shortest cut, they took the resolution of leaping all into the water, hoisting up the boat on their shoulders, and wading with it till clear of all those cables. Spite of the efforts to prevent their design, they made out to sea, and soon reached Majorca. On hearing this, the day cried out, I believe these dogs of Christians will come one day or other and take us out of our houses. Ransom and escapes were more than made up by fresh captures. In 1655, indeed, Admiral Blake, after trying to bring the Tunisians to terms, ran into the harbor of Porta Farina on the 3rd of April, where the fleet of the bay, consisting of nine vessels, was anchored close in under the gun of the forts and earthworks and under a heavy fire he burnt every one of them. Then proceeding to Algiers, found the city in such consternation that he liberated the whole body of British slaves, English, Scots, Irish, and Channel Islanders, for a trifling sum. 
Nevertheless, four years later, the Earl of Inchiquin, notorious as Morrow of the Burnings, from his manner of making war and his son, Lord O'Brien, were caught off the Tagus while engaged in one of those foreign services in which royalists were apt to enlist during the troubles at home, and it took the Earl seven or eight months' captivity and seventy-five hundred crowns to obtain his release. In the following century, the remnant of the brave Iberian regiment, on its way from Italy, was surrounded and overcome to the number of about eighty, and was treated with peculiar barbarity. It was no rare thing to see British ships, once even a sloop of war, brought captive into Algiers Harbor, on some pretext of their papers being out of form, and the number of slaves continued to increase in spite of the philanthropic efforts of some of the wealthy merchants like William Botell, who devoted themselves to the humane attempt. Very often it was the captain's own fault that he was taken. Frequently he was serving on a vessel of a power then at war with Algiers. The system of passes for the Mediterranean opened the way to a good deal of knavery. Ships sailed under false colors, or being themselves at war with Algiers, carried passes purchased from her allies. The Algerines were shy of contracting too many alliances, lest there should be no nation to prey upon, and we read of a solemn debate in the divan to decide which nation should be broken with, inasmuch as the slave masters were becoming bankrupt from the pacific relations of the state. This was when the cupidity of the day had led them to accept a heavy bribe from Sweden in return for his protection, and the corsairs rushed excitedly to the palace declaring that they had already too many allies. Neither in the ocean nor narrow sea can we find scarce any who are not French, English, or Dutch. Nothing remains for us to do but either to sell our ships for fuel and return to our primitive camel driving, or to break with one of these nations. Thus there was generally one favored nation, or perhaps two, to whom the Algerines accorded the special favor of safe conducts over the Mediterranean, and it was the object of all other traders to borrow or buy these free passes from their happy possessors. The Algerines were not unnaturally incensed at finding themselves cheated by means of their own passes. As for the Flemings, complained the Corsairs, they are a good people enough, never deny us anything, nor are they worse than their word, like the French. But they certainly play foul tricks upon us, in selling their passes to other infidels. For ever since we made peace with them, we rarely light on either Swede, Dane, Hamburger, etc. All have Dutch complexions, all Dutch passes, all call each other Hans, Hans, and all say, Ja, yeah, Ja! Yeah. Many of these counterfeit allies carried English seamen, and such not being under their own colors, were liable to be detained in slavery. So numerous was this class of captives, that although in 1694 it was reported that no Englishman captured under the British flag remained in slavery in Algiers, there was ample application soon afterwards for Betton's beneficial bequest of over £2,100 for the purpose of ransoming British captives. Expedition after expedition was sent to argue, to remonstrate, to threaten, with literally no result. Ambassador after ambassador came and went, and made useless treaties, and still the Algerines maintained the preposterous right to search British vessels at sea, and take from them foreigners and goods. Sir Robert Mansell first arrived in 1620 with 18 ships and 500 guns, manned by 2,600 men, and accomplished nothing. As soon as they turned their backs, the pirates took 40 British ships. Sir Thomas Rowe made a treaty, which turned out to be waste paper. Blake frightened the corsairs for the moment. The Earl of Winchelsea, in 1660, admitted the right of search. Lord Sandwich, in the following year, cannonaded Algiers without result from a safe distance. Four times Sir Thomas Allen brought his squadron into the bay, and four times sailed he out, having gained half his purpose and twice his desert of insult. These men, cried Aliaga, talk as if they were drunk, and would force us to restore their subjects whether they will or no. Bid them be gone. The only satisfactory event to be reported after fifty years of fruitless expeditions is Sir E. Sprague's attack on the Algerine fleet, beached under the guns of Bugea. Like Blake, he sent in a fire ship and burnt the whole squadron, whereupon the Janissaries rose in consternation, murdered their aga, and carrying his head to the palace, insisted on peace with England. It was very temporary display of force. Five years later, Sir John Narborough, instead of bombarding, was meekly paying 60,000 pieces of eight to the Algerines for slaves and presents. In 1681, Admiral Herbert, afterwards Lord Torrington, executed various amicable cruises against the Algerines. In 1684, Sir W. Somme, with difficulty, extorted a salute of 21 guns to his Britannic Majesty's flag. 
and so the weary tale of irresolution and weakness went on. Admiral Keppel's expedition in 1749 is chiefly memorable for the presence of Sir Joshua Reynolds as a guest on board the flagship, and it is possible that two sketches reproduced by Sir Lambert Playfair are from his pencil. The drawings were the only fruit of the cruise. James Bruce, the African traveler, as agent or consul general in 1763, put a little backbone into the communications, but he soon went on his travels, and then the old fruitless course of humble remonstrances and idle demonstrations went on again. Whenever more serious attempts were made, the preparations were totally inadequate. Spain, Portugal, Naples, and Malta sent a combined fleet in 1784 to punish the Algerines, but the vessels were all small and such as the corsairs could tackle, and so feeble and desultory was the attack, after a fortnight's fooling, the whole fleet sailed away. End of chapter 19 Recording by Beth Blakely Chapter 20 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Gerald Kelly in Stanley Lane Pool. Chapter 20 The United States and Tripoli, 1803 through 1805. These dark days of abasement were pierced by one ray of sunlight. The United States refused the tribute demanded by the Barbary rovers. From its very birth, the new nation had, in common with all other maritime countries, accepted as a necessary evil a practice it was now full time to abolish. As early as 1785, the Day of Algiers found in American commerce a fresh field for his plowing. And of all his traders, none proved so welcome as that which boasted of its shipping yet carried not an ounce of shot to defend it. Hesitating protests and negotiations were essayed in vain, until at last public opinion was so aroused by the sufferings of the captives as to demand of Congress the immediate construction of a fleet. Ill news travels apace, and the rumors of these preparations echoed so promptly among the white walls of Algiers that the day hastened to conclude a treaty. And so, long before the frigates were launched, immunity was purchased by the payment of a heavy tribute like all cowardly compromises this one shaped itself into a two-edged sword and soon every rover from mogador to the gates of the bosphorus were clamoring for bakshis in eighteen hundred yusuf the pasha of tripoli threatened to slip his falcons upon the western quarry unless presents similar to those given by england france and spain were immediately sent him he complained that the American government had bribed his neighbors, the cutthroats of Tunis, at a higher price, and he saw no reason why, like his cousin of Algiers, he should not receive a frigate as hush money. His answer to a letter of the president, containing honeyed professions of friendship, was amusing. We would ask, he said, that these your expressions be followed by deeds, and not by empty words. You will therefore endeavor to satisfy us by a good manner of proceeding. But if only flattering words are meant without performance, every one will act as he finds convenient. We beg a speedy answer without neglect of time, as a delay upon your part cannot but be prejudicial to your interests. The Bay of Tunis made demands no less arrogant. He declared that Denmark, Spain, Sicily, and Sweden had made concessions to him, and then he announced it would be impossible to keep peace longer unless the president sent him without delay ten thousand stand of arms and forty cannons of different caliber and all these last he added with a fine hibernicism must be twenty-four pounders algiers hinted that her money was in arrears and morocco intimated that her delay in arranging terms was due simply to the full consideration which she was giving to a matter so important whatever other faults yusuf of tripoli may have had he was in this matter as good as his word, and the six months' notice having been fruitless, he proclaimed war on May 14, 1801, by chopping down the flagstaff of the American consulate. But the government of the United States was weary of the old traditions followed by Christendom in its dealings with these swashbucklers, 
they had by this time afloat a small but effective squadron and were very proud of the successes it had gained in the quasi war with france just ended they were tired also of a policy which was utterly at odds with their boast that all men were born free and equal and the nation was roused with the shibboleth that there were millions for defence but not one cent for tribute when the excitement had cooled however it seemed as if there was as usual to be more in the promise than in the performance for though a force existed sufficient for vigorous and decisive action nothing was accomplished during two years and more of the three squadrons sent out the first under dale was hampered by the narrow restrictions of the president's orders due to constitutional scruples as to the propriety of taking hostile measures before congress had declared war and the second was unfortunate in its commander though individual deeds reflected the greatest credit upon many of the subordinate officers in eighteen o three the third squadron assembled at gibraltar under the broad pennant of commodore edward Prable, and then at last came the time for vigorous measures the flag officer's objective point was tripoli but hardly were his ships gathered for concerted action when the philadelphia thirty-six guns captured off the coast of spain the mejboa an armed cruiser which belonged to morocco and had in company as prize the boston brig celia of course it was of the highest importance to discover upon what authority the capture had been made but the moorish commander lied loyally and swore that he had taken the celia in anticipation of a war which he was sure had been declared because of the serious misunderstanding existing when he was last in port between his emperor and the american consul this story was too improbable to be believed and captain bainbridge of the philadelphia threatened to hang as a common pirate the mendacious reis ibrahim lubarez unless he showed his commission when the rover saw this menace did not issue in idleness he confessed he had been mistaken and that he had been ordered by the governor of tangiers to capture american vessels this made the matter one which required decisive action and so the prize was towed to gibraltar and preble sailed for tangiers to demand satisfaction there was the usual interchange of paper bullets and of salutes but in the end the aggressive commodore prevailed the emperor expressed his regret for the hostile acts and disowned them he punished the marauders released all vessels previously captured agreed to ratify the treaty made by his father in seventeen eighty six and added that his friendship for america should last forever this affair being settled preble detailed the philadelphia and vixen for the blockade of tripoli and then as the season was too advanced for further operations began preparations for the repairs and equipment needed for the next season the work assigned to the philadelphia and vixen was rigorous for the coast fretted with shoals reefs and unknown currents and harassed by sudden squalls strong gales and bad holding grounds demanded unceasing watchfulness and rendered very difficult the securing of proper food and ship stores from the distance of the supplying base bad as this was in the beginning it became worse when in october the vixen sailed eastward in search of a tripolitan cruiser which was said to have slipped past the line at night for then the whole duty mainly inshore chasing fell to the deep draught frigate it was while thus employed that she came to misfortune as cooper writes in his history of the united states navy towards the last of october the wind which had been strong from the westward for some time previously drove the philadelphia a considerable distance to the eastward of the town and on monday october the thirty first as she was running down to her station again with a fair breeze about nine in the morning a vessel was seen inshore and to windward standing for tripoli sail was made to cut her off believing himself to be within long gunshot a little before eleven and seeing no other chance of overtaking the stranger in the short distance that remained captain bainbridge opened fire in the hope of cutting something away for near an hour longer the chase and the fire were continued the lead which was kept constantly going giving from seven to ten fathoms and the ship hauling up and keeping away as the water shoulder deepened at half past eleven tripoli then being in plain sight distant a little more than a league satisfied that he could neither overtake the chase nor force her ashore 
captain bainbridge ordered the helm of port to haul directly over the land into deep water the next cast of the lead when this order was executed gave but eight fathoms and this was immediately followed by casts that gave seven and six and a half at this moment the wind was nearly abeam and the ship had eight knots way upon her when the cry of half six was heard the helm was put hard down and the yards were ordered to be braced sharp up while the ship was coming up fast to the wind and before she lost her way she struck a reef forwards and shot on it until she lifted between five and six feet every effort was made to get her off but in vain the noise of the cannonading brought out nine gunboats and then as if by magic swarms of wreckers slipped by the inner edge of the shore stole from some rocky inlet or rushed from mole and galley and keeping beyond range like vultures near a battlefield awaited the surrender of the ship a gallant fight was made with a few guns left mounted but at last the enemy took up a position on the ship's weather quarter where her strong heel to port forbade the bearing of a single piece the gunboats continues the historian were growing bolder every minute and night was at hand captain bainbridge after consulting again with his officers felt it to be an imperious duty to haul down his flag to save the lives of his people before this was done the magazines were drowned holes were bored in the ship's bottom the pumps were choked and everything was performed that it was thought would make sure the final loss of the vessel about five o'clock the colors were lowered the ship was looted the officers and men were robbed half stripped in some cases and that night the crew was imprisoned in a foul tripolitan den within a week the rovers aided by favorable winds and unusual tides not only got the philadelphia afloat but as the scuttling had been hastily done towed her into port and weighed all the guns and anchors that lay in shallow water on the reef the ship was immediately repaired the guns were remounted and the gallant but unfortunate bainbridge had the final misery of seeing his old command safely moored off the town and about a quarter of a mile from the pasha's castle preble heard of this catastrophe from an english frigate to which he spoke off sardinia on his way to tripoli the blow was a severe one for the ship represented over one-third of his fighting force and the great number of captives gave the enemy a material and sentimental strength which he would be sure to use piteously in all future negotiations but the energetic sailor was only stimulated by the disaster to greater exertions and plans were immediately made for the destruction of the captured ship fortunately there was no lack of material and in selecting the leaders it became an embarrassment to decide between the claims of the volunteers finally the choice fell upon lieutenant stephen decatur he was at this time twenty-four years of age and had by his marked qualities so distinguished himself as to have been appointed to the command of the enterprise to great prudence self-control and judgment he united the dash daring and readiness of resources which have always characterized the famous sailors of the world and in the victory which made his name renowned in naval annals he displayed these qualities in such a high degree as to deserve the greatest credit for what he achieved as well as for what under great temptation he declined to do after taking on board a load of combustibles the intrepid sailed from syracuse for tripoli upon the third of february eighteen o four the catch itself had a varied history for she was originally a french gun vessel which had been captured by the english in egypt and presented to tripoli and which finally was seized by decatur while running for constantinople with a present of female slaves for the grand vizier the brig siren lieutenant charles stuart commanding convoyed the expedition and had orders to cover the retreat and if feasible to assist the attack with its boats in affairs of this kind personal comfort is always the least consideration but had not the weather been pleasant the hardships endured might seriously have affected the success of the enterprise the five commission officers were crowded in the small cabin the midshipmen and pilot on one side and the seamen upon the other were stowed like herrings upon a platform laid across water casks whose surface they completely covered when they slept and at so small a distance below the spar deck that their heads would reach it when seated to these inconveniences were added the want of any room for exercise on deck the attacks of innumerable 
vermin which their predecessors the slaves had left behind them and as the salted meat put on board had spoiled the lack of anything but biscuits to eat and water to drink after a voyage of six days the town was sighted but strong winds had rendered the entrances dangerous and the heavy gale which came with night drove the americans so far to the eastward before it abated that they found themselves fairly embayed in the gulf of sidra on the afternoon of the sixteenth tripoli was once more made out and as the wind was light the weather pleasant and the sea smooth decatur determined to attack that night by arrangement the siren kept almost out of sight during the day and her appearance was so changed as to lull all suspicion of her true character the lightness of the wind allowed the ketch to maintain the appearance of an anxious desire to reach the harbour before night without bringing her too near to require any other change than the use of drags in this case buckets towed astern which could not be seen from the city the crew was kept below except six or eight persons at a time so that inquiry might not be awakened by unusual numbers and such men remained on deck as were dressed like maltese when the philadelphia was sighted no doubt was left of the hazardous nature of the attack for she lay a mile within the entrance riding to the wind and abreast of the town her foremast which was cut away while on the reef had not yet been replaced her main and mizzen masts were housed and her lower yards were on the gunwales the lower standing rigging however was set up and her battery was loaded and shotted she lay within short range of the guns on the castle on the molehead and in the new fort and close aboard rode three tripolitan cruisers and twenty gunboats and galleys to meet and overcome this force decatur had a few small guns and seventy men but these were hearts of oak tried in many a desperate undertaking and burning now to redeem their country's honour as the intrepid drew in with the land they saw that the boiling surf of the western passage would force them to select the northern entrance which twisted and turned between the rocks and the shoals it was now nearly ten o'clock and as the ketch drifted in before the light easternly breeze she seemed a modest traitor bent upon barter and laden with anything but the hopes of a nation the night was beautiful a young moon sailed in the sky the lights from wall and tower and town and from the ships lazily rocking at the anchorages filled the water with a thousand points of fire the gentle breeze wafted the little craft past reefs and rocks into the harbour noiselessly save for the creaking of the yards the complainings of the block the wimple of wavelets at the bow and the gurgle of eddies at the pintles and under the plashing counter on deck forward only a few figures were silhouetted against the background of white wall and grey sky and aft decatur and the pilot stood conning the ship as it stole slowly for the frigate's bow owing to the ketchest native rig and to the glib tripolitanese of the sicilian pilot no suspicion was excited in the philadelphia's watch by the answer to their hail that she had lost her anchors in a gale and would like to run a line to the warship and to ride by it through the night so completely were the tripolitans deceived that they lowered a boat and sent it with a hawser while at the same time some of the intrepid's crew leisurely ran a fast to the frigate's forechains as these returned they met the enemy's boat took its rope and passed it into their own vessel slowly but firmly it was hauled upon by the men on board lying on their backs and slowly and surely the intrepid was warped alongside but at the critical moment the ruse was discovered and up from the enemy's decks went the wolf-like howl of americanos americanos the cry roused the soldiers in the forts and batteries and the chorus these awakened startled the pasha from his sleep and thrilled with joy the captive americans behind their prison walls in another moment the intrepid had swung broadside on and quickly passed lashings held the two ships locked in a deadly embrace then decatur's cry of board rang out and with a quick rush and the discharge of only a single gun the decks were gained the surprise was as perfect as the assault was rapid and the tripolitan crew panic-stricken huddled like rats at bay awaiting the final dash decatur had early gathered his men aft stood a moment for them to gain a sight of the enemy and then with the watchword philadelphia rushed upon the rovers 
no defence was made for swarming to leeward they tumbled in mad affright overboard over the bows through gun ports by aid of trailing halyards and stranded rigging out of the channels pell-mell by every loophole they went and then such as could swam like water rats for the friendly shelter of the neighbouring war galleys one by one the decks and holds were cleared and in ten minutes decatur had possession of the ship without a man killed and only one slightly wounded in the position selected so carefully beforehand the appointed divisions assembled and piled up and fired the combustibles each party acted by itself and as it was ready and so rapid were all their movements that those assigned to the afterholds had scarcely reached the cockpit and stern storerooms before the fires were lighted over their heads indeed when the officer entrusted with his duty had completed his task he found the after hatches so filled with smoke from the fire in the wardroom and steerage that he was obliged to escape to the deck by the forward ladders satisfied that the work was thoroughly done the americans leaped upon the intrepid stack cut with swords and axes the housers lashing them to the philadelphia manned the sweeps and just as the flames were scorching their own yards and bulwarks swung clear then came the struggle for escape and this last scene can best be told perhaps in the words of one of the participants commodore charles morris who gave on that night when he was the first to board the philadelphia the earliest proof of the great qualities which afterward made him one of the first sailors of his time up to this time he wrote the ships and batteries of the enemy had remained silent but they were now prepared to act and when the crew of the ketch gave three cheers in exultation of their success they received the return of a general discharge from the enemy the confusion of the moment probably prevented much care in their direction and though under the fire of nearly a hundred pieces for half an hour the only shot which struck the ketch was one through the top-gallant sail we were in greater danger from the philadelphia whose broadsides commanded the passage by which we were retreating and whose guns were loaded and discharged as they became heated we escaped these also and while urging the ketch onwards with sweeps the crew were commenting upon the beauty of the spray thrown up by the shot between us and the brilliant light of the ship rather than calculating any danger that might be apprehended from the contact the appearance of the ship was indeed magnificent the flames in the interior illuminated her ports and ascending her rigging and masts formed columns of fire which meeting the tops were reflected into beautiful capitals whilst the occasional discharge of her guns gave an idea of some directing spirit within her the walls of the city and its batteries and the masts and rigging of cruisers at anchor brilliantly illuminated and animated by the discharge of artillery form worthy adjuncts and an appropriate background to the picture fanned by a light breeze our exertions soon carried us beyond the range of their shot and at the entrance of the harbour we met the boats of the siren which had been intended to cooperate with us and whose crew rejoiced at our success whilst they grieved at not having been able to partake in it the success of this enterprise added much to the reputation of the navy both at home and abroad great credit was given and was justly due to commodore preble who directed and first designed it and to lieutenant decatur who volunteered to execute it and to whose coolness self-possession resources and intrepidity its success was in an eminent degree due commodore preble in the meantime hurried his preparations for more serious work and on july twenty fifth arrived off tripoli with a squadron consisting of the frigate constitution three brigs three schooners six gunboats and two bomb vessels opposed to him were arrayed over a hundred guns mounted on shore batteries nineteen gunboats one ten-gun brig two schooners mounting eight guns each and twelve galleys between august third and september third five attacks were made and though the town was never reduced substantial damage was inflicted and the subsequent satisfactory peace rendered possible preble was relieved by baron in september not because of any loss of confidence in his ability but from exigencies of the service which forbade the government sending out an officer junior to him in the relief squadron which reinforced his own upon his return to the united states he was presented with a gold medal and the thanks of congress were tendered him 
his officers and men for gallant and faithful services the blockade was maintained vigorously and in eighteen o five an attack was made upon the tripolitan town of derna by a combined land and naval force the former being under command of consul general eaton who had been a captain in the american army and of lieutenant o'banion of the marines the enemy made a spirited though disorganized defense but the shells of the warships drove him from point to point and finally their principal work was carried by the force under o'banion and midshipman mann eaton was eager to press forward but he was denied reinforcements and military stores and much of his advantage was lost all further operations were however discontinued in june eighteen o five when after the usual intrigues delays and prevarications a treaty was signed by the pasha which provided that no further tribute should be exacted and the american vessel should be for ever free of his rovers satisfactory as was this conclusion the uncomfortable fact remains that tribute entered into the settlement after all the prisoners had been exchanged man for man the tripolitan government demanded and the united states paid the handsome sum of sixty thousand dollars to close the contract this treaty however awakened the conscience of europe and from the day it was signed the power of the barbary corsairs began to wane the older countries saw their duty more clearly and ceased to legalize robbery on the high seas to america the success gave an immediate position which could not easily have been gained in any other way and apart from its moral results the contest with tripoli was the most potent factor in consolidating the navy of the united states End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of the story of the barbary corsairs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by greg giordano the story of the barbary corsairs by j d gerald kelly and stanley lane pool chapter twenty one the battle of algiers eighteen sixteen nelson was in the mediterranean at the beginning of the nineteenth century as every one knows but the suppression of the barbary corsairs formed no part of his instructions twice indeed he sent a ship of war to inquire into the complaints of the consuls but without effect and then on the glorious twenty first of october eighteen o five the great admiral fell in the supreme hour of victory collingwood made no attempt to deal with the algerian difficulty beyond sending a civilian agent and a present of a watch which the day consigned to his cook the british victories appear to have impressed the pirate's mind but slightly and in eighteen twelve we find mr a court lord Hatesbury, condescending to negotiate terms between the corsairs and our allies the portuguese by which the latter obtained immunity from molestation and the release of their countrymen by the payment altogether of over a million of dollars and an annual tribute of twenty four thousand dollars to the united states of america belongs the honor of having first set an example of spirited resistance to the pretensions of the corsairs so long as they had been at war with great britain the states were unable to protect their commerce in the mediterranean and they were forced to fall in with the prevailing custom and make peace with the robbers on the basis of a bribe over a million of spanish dollars and a large annual tribute in money and naval stores but as soon as the treaty of ghent set them free in eighteen fifteen they sent a squadron to algiers bearing mr william shaller as american consul and captains bainbridge and stephen decatur as his assessors in the impending negotiations the result was that after only two days a treaty was concluded on june thirtieth eighteen fifteen by which all money payment was abolished all captives and property were restored and the united states were placed on the footing of the most favored nation 
the arguments of the americans appear to have been more eloquent than british broadsides shamed by this unexpected success the english government at length sent lord exmouth formerly sir edward pellew to obtain favorable terms for some of the minor mediterranean powers and to place the ionian islands as british dependencies on the same footing as england yet he was evidently not authorized to proceed to extreme measures or demand unconditional surrender of existing pretensions he arranged terms for naples which still included tribute and presents sardinia escaped for a sum down the ionians were admitted on the english footing then lord exmouth went on to tunis and tripoli and obtained from the two bays the promise of the total abolition of christian slavery his proceedings at tunis were marked by much firmness and rewarded with commensurate success he arrived on the twelfth of april eighteen sixteen shortly after a tunisian corsair and devastating one of the sardinian islands had roused the indignation of europe lord exmouth demanded nothing less than the total abolition of christian slavery Quote, it happened that at this very time caroline princess of wales was enjoying the splendid hospitality of mahmoud bey in his city palace neither party seemed inclined to yield and matters assumed a very threatening aspect the mediation of the royal guest was invoked in vain lord exmouth was inexorable the princess sent the greater part of her baggage to the goletta the british merchants hastened to embark on board the vessels of the squadron the men of war were prepared for action and the bey did his best to collect all available reinforcements the excitement in tunis was immense and a pacific solution was considered almost impossible on the sixteenth lord exmouth accompanied by mr consul general oglander and his staff proceeded to the bardo palace the flagstaff of the british agency was previously lowered to indicate a resolution to resort to an appeal to arms in case of failure and the princess of wales expected every hour to be arrested as a hostage the antecedents of the bay were not precisely calculated to assuage her alarm but mahmoud sent one of his officers to assure her that come what might he should never dream of violating the muslim laws of hospitality while the messenger was still with her lord exmouth entered the room and announced a satisfactory termination of his mission on the following morning the bay signed a treaty whereby the name of the regency he abolished christian slavery throughout his dominions among the reasons which induced the bay to yield to the pressure used by lord exmouth was the detention of the sultan's envoy bearing the imperial firman and robe of investiture at syracuse the neapolitan government would not allow him to depart until the news of the successful result of the british mission had arrived and mahmoud felt it impossible to forego the official recognition of his suzerain End quote. the wife of george the fourth was extremely angry at being interrupted in a delightful course of entertainments and picnics among the ruins of carthage and the orange groves whither she repaired in the bay's coach and six escorted by sixty memluks the tunisians were of course indignant at the bay's surrender nor did piracy cease on account of the treaty holland indeed repudiated the blackmail in eighteen nineteen but sweden still paid a species of tribute in the form of one hundred and twenty-five cannons in eighteen twenty seven having gained his point at tunis and tripoli a most unexpected triumph lord exmouth came back to algiers and endeavored to negotiate the same concessions there coolly taking up his position within short range of the batteries his proposals were indignantly rejected and he was personally insulted two of his officers were dragged from their horses by the mob and marched through the streets with their hands tied behind their backs the consul mr macdonnell was put under guard and his wife and other ladies of his family were ignominiously driven into the town from the country house lord exmouth had no instructions for such an emergency he arranged that ambassadors should be sent from algiers to london and constantinople to discuss his proposal and then regretfully sailed for england he had hardly returned when news arrived of extensive massacres of italians living under british protection at bona and oran by order of the day 
an order actually issued while the British Admiral was at Algiers. Lord Exmouth was immediately instructed to finish his work. On the 25th of July, in the same year, his flagship, Queen Charlotte, 108, led a squadron of 18 men of war of from 10 to 104 guns, and including three 74s, out of Portsmouth Harbor. At Gibraltar, the Dutch Admiral, Baron von Kappelen, begged to be allowed to join in the attack with six vessels, chiefly 36s, and when the time came he fought his ships admirably. On the 27th of August, they arrived in the roads of Algiers. The Prometheus had been sent ahead to bring off the consul MacDonald and his family. Captain Dashwood succeeded in bringing Mrs. and Miss MacDonald on board, but a second boat was less fortunate. The consul's baby took the opportunity of crying, just as it was being carried in a basket past the sentinel by the ship's surgeon, who believed he had quieted it. The whole party were taken before the day, who, however, released all but the boat's crew, and, as a solitary instance of humanity, sent the baby on board. The consul general himself remained a prisoner. No reply being vouchsafed to his flag of truce, Lord Exmouth bore up the attack, and the Queen Charlotte dropped anchor at the entrance of the mole, some fifty yards off, and was lashed to a mast, which was made fast to the shore. A shot from the mole instantly answered from the flagship, opened the battle. Quote, then commenced the fire, wrote the admiral, as animated and well supported as I believe was ever witnessed, from a quarter before three till nine, without intermission, and which did not cease altogether till half past eleven p.m. The ships immediately following me were admirably and coolly taking up their stations with a precision even beyond my most sanguine hope and never did the British flag receive, on any occasion, more zealous and honorable support. The battle was fairly at issue between a handful of Britons and the noble cause of Christianity, and a horde of fanatics assembled around their city, and enclosed within its fortifications, to obey the dictates of their despot. The cause of God and humanity prevailed, and so devoted was every creature in the fleet that even British women served the same guns with their husbands, and, during a contest of many hours, never shrank from danger, but animated all around them. End quote. Some of the men of war, especially the impregnable, Rear Admiral Milne, were hard beset, but about ten o'clock at night the main batteries were silenced, and in a state of ruin, and, quote, all the ships in the port, with the exception of the outer frigates, which had been boarded, were in flames, which extended rapidly over the whole arsenal, storehouses, and gunboats, exhibiting a spectacle of awful grandeur and interest no pen can describe. End quote. At one o'clock everything in the marine seemed on fire. Two ships wrapped in flames drifted out of the port. Heavy thunder, lightning, and rain increased the lurid effect of the scene. Next morning, says Mr. Shaler, Quote, the combined fleets are at anchor in the bay, apparently little damaged. Every part of the town appeared to have suffered. The marine batteries are in ruins, and may be occupied without any effort. Lord Exmouth holds the fate of Algiers in his hands. End quote. Instead, however, of demolishing the last vestige of the fortifications, and exacting pledges for future good behavior, the Admiral concluded a treaty by which prisoners of war in future should be exchanged and not enslaved, and the whole of the slaves in Algiers, to the number of 1,642, chiefly Italian, only 18 English, were at once set at liberty, and the day was made to refund the money, amounting to nearly $400, which he had that year extorted from the Italian states. Finally, he was made to publicly apologize to the unfortunate MacDonald, who had been confined during the siege half-naked in a cell for condemned murderers, loaded with chains, fastened to the wall, exposed to the heavy rain, and momentarily expecting his doom. He was now reinstated, and publicly thanked by the admiral. It was indeed satisfactory to have at last administered some salutary discipline to the insolent robbers of Algiers. But it had been well if the lesson had been final. Their fleet was certainly gone, they had but two vessels left. Their fortifications were severely damaged. 
these were soon repaired. No doubt it was no small advantage to have demonstrated that their batteries could be turned and silenced, but it would have been better to have taken care that they should never mount another gun. Even the moral effect of the victory seems to have been short-lived, for when, in 1819, in pursuance of certain resolutions expressed at the Congress of Aix-la-Chapelle, 1818, the French and English admirals delivered identical notes to the new day, that potentate replied, after his manner, by throwing up earthworks. As a matter of fact, the same course of insolence and violence continued after the Battle of Algiers as before. Free European girls were carried off by the day. The British consulate was forced open. Even the women's room searched. Mr. Macdonald was still victimized. And the diplomacy at a little fancy firing of Sir Harry Neal in 1824 failed to produce the least effect. Mr. Macdonald had to be recalled, and the day as usual had his own way. Nothing but downright conquest could stop the plague, and that final measure was reserved for another nation than the English. Footnote. Lord Exmouth's Dispatch, August 26, 1816. See also the American Consul Shaler's Report to his Government, September 13th, quoted by Playfair, 269-72. to The bombardment destroyed a large part of Mr. Shaler's house, and shells were perpetually whizzing by his ears. His report is full of the graphic details, and he was always a true friend of the unlucky Macdonnell. It is stated that the fleet fired 118 tons of powder, 50,000 shot, nearly 1,000 shells, etc. The English lost 128 killed and 690 wounded. The admiral was wounded in three places, his telescope broken in his hand, and his coat cut to strips. Nor was the day less forward at the post of danger. End footnote. End of chapter 21. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 22 of the Story of the Barbary Corsairs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French in Africa, 1830 to 1881. The successes of the English and American fleets had produced their effects not so much in arresting the course of piracy as in encouraging the European states to defy the pirates. The coup de grace was administered by France, the Via Visa, the natural opponent of the Algerian corsairs, and perhaps the chief sufferer of their attacks. A dispute in April 1827 between the French Council and the Day in which the former forgot the decencies of diplomatic language, and the latter lost his temper and struck the offender with the handle of his fan, led to an ineffectual blockade of Algiers by a French squadron for two years, during which the Algerians aggravated the breach by several acts of barbarity displayed towards French prisoners. Matters grew into a crisis. In August 1829, the day dismissed a French envoy and fired upon his ship as he was retiring under a flag of truce, and it became evident that war on a decisive scale was now inevitable. Accordingly, on May the 26th, 1830, a large fleet sailed out of Toulon. Admiral Dubillon commanded and the land forces on board numbered 37,000 foot, besides cavalry and artillery. Delayed by stress of weather, the fleet was not sighted off Algiers till June the 13th, when it anchored in the bay of City Farage, and there landed next day, with little obsession, and began to throw up entrenchments. A force of Arabs and Kabyles was severely defeated on the 19th, with the loss of their camp and provisions, and the French slowly pushed their way towards the city, beating back the Algerians as they advanced. The defenders fought game to the last, 
but the odds were overwhelming, and the only wonder is that so overpowering a force of besiegers, both by sea and land, should have evinced so much caution and diffidence of their own immense superiority. On July the fourth, the actual bombardment of the city began. The fort de Yompa was taken. After the Algerians had blown up the powder magazine, and the day asked for terms of surrender, safety of person and property for himself and for the inhabitants of the city was promised by the French commander, and on this condition the enemy occupied Algiers on the following day, July the fifth. A week later, the day, with his family and attendants and belongings. Sailed for Naples in a French frigate, and Algiers had seen the last of its Mohammedan rulers. Here, so far as Algiers is concerned, the story of the Corsairs properly ends. But a glance at the events which have occurred during the French occupation may usefully supplement what has already been recorded. The conquest had been marked by a moderation and humanity which did infinite honor to the French arms. It would have been well if a similar policy had distinguished the subsequent proceedings. It is not necessary to dwell upon the assurance given by France to Great Britain that the occupation was only temporary. Upon the later announcement of permanent annexation, or upon England's acquiescence in the perfidy, upon the French engaging never to push their conquests further to the east or west of Algiers, an engagement curiously illustrated by the recent occupation of Tunis. But if the grandissement of France in North Africa is matter for regret. Indefinitely more to be deplored is the manner in which the possession of the interior of the country has been affected. It is not too much to say that from the moment when the French, having merely taken the city of Algiers, began the work of subducing the tribes of the interior in 1830. To the day when they at last set up civil instead of military government, after the lessons of the Franco-German War in 1870, the history of Algeria is one long record of stupidly brutal camp rule, repudiation of sacred engagements, inhuman massacres of unoffending natives of both sexes and all ages. Violence without judgment and severity without reason. One French general after another was sent out to bring the rebellious Arabs and Kabyles into subjection, only to display his own incompetence for the inhuman task and to return buffered and brutalized by the disgraceful work he thought himself bound to carry out. There is no more humanitarian record in the annals of annexation than this miserable conquest of Algiers. It is the old story of trying to govern what the conquerors called niggers without attempting to understand the people first. Temper, justice, insight, and conciliation would have done more in four years. The martial intolerance and drawn tyranny accomplished in forty. In all these years of miserable guerrilla warfare, in which such were no commanders as Bijon, Belisier, Conrobert, Sandano, Mike Mahon, and many more, learned the first demoralizing lessons in warfare. The only people who excite our interest and admiration are the Arab tribes. That they were unwise in resisting the inevitable is indisputable, but it is no less certain that they resisted with splendid valor and indomitable perseverance. Again and again, they defeated the superior forces of France in the open field, wrested strong cities from the enemy, and even threatened to extinguish the authority of the alien in Algiers forever.
for all which the invaders had only to think themselves, had General Clausel, the first military governor of Algiers, been a wise man, the people might have accepted by degrees the sovereignty of France. But the violence of his measures and his ignorance of the very world conciliation raised up such tremendous obsession, engendered such terrible reprisals, and set the two parties so hopelessly against each other that nothing less than a prolonged struggle could be expected. The hero of this sanguinary conflict was Abdel Kadir. A man who united in his person and character all the virtues of the old Arabs with many of the best resorts of civilization, descended from a saintly family, himself learned and devout, a Hajji or Meccan pilgrim, frank, generous, hospitable, and withal a splendid horseman, redoubtable in battle and fight with the patriotic enthusiasm which belongs to a born leader of men, Abd al-Kadir became the recognized chief of the Arab insurgents. The day of Algiers had foreseen danger in the yours, who was forced to fly to Egypt in fear of his life. When he returned, a young man of twenty-four, he found his country in the hands of the French, and his people driven into desperation. His former fame and his father's name were talismans to draw the impetuous tribes towards him, and he soon had so large a following that the French deemed it prudent for the moment to recognize him as a mere of Mascara, his native place of which he had already been chosen king by general accumulation. Here he prepared for the coming struggle, and when the French discovered a pretext for attacking him in 1835, they were utterly rooted on the river Mascar. The fortunes of war vacillated in the following year, till in May 1837, Abd al-Kadir triumphantly defeated a French army in the plain of the Matija. A fresh expedition of twenty thousand met with no better success, for Arabs and Berbers were hard to trap. And Abd al-Kadir, whose strategy evoked the admiration of the Duke of Wellington, was for a time able to buffer all the marshals of France. The whole country, save a few fortified posts, was now under his sway. And the French, at last, perceived that they had to deal with the pressing danger. They sent out eighty thousand men under Marshal Bijot, and the success of this officer's method of sweeping the country with movable columns was soon apparent. Town after town fell, tribe after tribe made terms. Even Abd al Kadir's capital, Tacitant, was destroyed. Mascara was subdued, and the heroic chief, still repudiating defeat, retreated to Morocco. Twice he led fresh armies into his own land. In 1843 and 1844, the one succumbed to the Duke de Amal, the other to Bijou. Belisier covered himself with peculiar glory by smoking five hundred men, women, and children to death in a cave. At last, seeing the hopelessness of further efforts and the misery they brought upon his people, Abd al Kadir accepted the terms and surrendered to the Doctor Omar on condition of being allowed to retire to Alexandria or Naples. It is needless to add that, in accordance with Algerian precedent, the terms of surrender were subsequently repudiated, though not by the royal duke, and the noble Arab was consigned for five years to a French prison. Louis Napoleon eventually allowed him to depart to Brusa, and he finally died at Damascus in 1883. Not, however, before he had rendered single service to his former enemies, 
by protecting the Christians during the massacres of 1860. Though Abdel Kadir had gone, peace did not settle upon Algeria. Again and again, the tribes revolted, only to feel once more the merciless severity of their military rulers. French colonists did not readily adapt the new field for immigration. It seemed as though the best thing would be to withdraw from a bootless, expensive, and troublesome venture. Louis Napoleon, however, when he visited Algiers in 1865, contrived somewhat to reassure the Kabyles, while he guaranteed their undisturbed possession of their territories. And until his fall, there was peace. But the day of weakness for France was the opportunity for Algiers, and another serious revolt broke out. And Jean Joyeux had enough to do to hold them in check. The result of this last attempt, and the change of government in France, was the appointment of civil instead of military governors. And since then, Algiers. Has on the whole remained tranquil, though it takes an army of fifty thousand men to keep it so. There are at least no more Algerian corsairs. It remains to refer to the affairs of Tunis. If there was provocation for the French occupation of Algiers in eighteen thirty, there was none for that of Tunis in eighteen eighty one. It was a pure piece of aggression. Stimulated by the rival efforts of Italy, and encouraged by the timidity of the English Foreign Office, then under the guidance of Lord Granville, a series of diplomatic grievances based upon no valid grounds was set up by the ingenious representative of France in the Regency, M. Theodore Rosten, since deservedly exposed. And the resistance of the unfortunate Bey Muhammad is sadik to demands which were in themselves preposterous, and which obviously menaced his semi-independence as a viceroy of the Ottoman Empire, received no support from any of the powers, save Turkey, who was then depressed in influence and resources by the adversities of the Russian invasion. The result was natural. A strong power, unchecked by inefficient rivals, pursued her stasi policy of aggression against a very weak but not dishonest state, and finally seized upon the ridiculous pretext of some disturbances among the tribes bordering on Algeria to invade the territory of the Bey. In vain, Muhammad is sadik assured. M. Rosten, that order had been restored among the tribes. In vain he appealed to all the powers, and above all to England. Lord Granville believed the French government when it solemnly assured him that the operations about to commence on the borderland between Algeria and Tunis were meant solely to put an end to the constant inroads. Of the frontier clans into Algerian territory, and that the independence of the bay and the integrity of his territory were in no way threatened. It was Algiers over again, but with even more serious consequences to English influence, indeed to all but French influence in the Mediterranean. Perfide Abin wholly confided in Perfide Galia. And it was too late to protest against the flagrant breach of faith when the French army had taken Cave and Tabaka, when the tricolour was floating over Bazita, and when General Briard, with every circumstance of insolent brutality, had forced the Treaty of Cassia as Said upon the luckless bay under the muzzles of the guns of the Republic. It is difficult to believe that the feeling of the English statesmen of the day is expressed in the words "Haek Ali Malimis Jawabi." The Bey had been captured. He and since his death, Sadi Ali Bey have continued to be the figureheads of the French protectorate. 
but his people were not so easily subdued, and the southern provinces of Tunis broke into open revolt, and for a time there ensued a period of hopeless anarchy, which the French authorities made no effort to control. At last, they bestirred themselves and to some purpose. Sfax was mercilessly bombarded and sacked. Houses are blown up with the inhabitants inside them, and a positive reign of terror was inaugurated, in which mutual reprisals, massacres, and executions heightened the horrors of war. The whole country outside the fortified posts became the theater of bloodshed, robbery, and anarchy. It was the history of Algiers in battle. Things have slowly improved since then, especially since M. Rostand's recall. Doubtless, in time, Tunis will be as subdued and as docile as Algiers. And meanwhile, France is developing the resources of the land and opening out one of the finest harbors in existence. Yet, M. Henry de Rockefeller did not. Perhaps exaggerate when he wrote, "We compared the Tunisian expedition to an ordinary fraud. We are mistaken. The Tunis business is a robbery aggravated by murder. The Algerian business was of a similar character. Qui commence bien finit bien." Assumes Admiral Jerian de la Guerriera in his chapter entitled "Galia Victrix." If the history of France in Africa ends in bringing the southern borderlands of the Mediterranean, the old haunts of the Barbary corsairs within the pale of civilization, it may some day be possible to bury the unhappy past, and inscribe upon the tombstone the optimistic motto: "Finis coronat a pass." End of chapter twenty-two. End of the story of the Barbary Corsairs by J. D. Jared Cayley and Stanley Lampole.